Section 19 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 13. Amid Warsaw Contrasts. Part 1. During the early summer I entered Poland twice, once from Russia, from Bielostok and Grudno, and once from the Austrian frontier. Both occasions memorable, because each in its own way was typical of the condition of Poland. Bielostok was still dripping with Jewish blood spilled by the treacherous authorities. Just outside of the town the railroad crosses a narrow stream. In a field bordering the stream a large contingent of soldiers were encamped giving it the appearance of the outskirts of an army. The bridge was guarded not by sentinels merely, but by a guard of fighting strength. Near the railroad station, on sidings, were several military trains, freight vans converted into barracks. A company of one hundred men held the station, as if the remaining panic-stricken Jews were in danger of rising up and storming the troops of the emperor. But Russia needs to maintain this show of force. From this point, clear across the strip of territory called Poland, troops were ever in evidence. My other entree was from Austria, a little later, during a panic of the Warsaw Jews. A Russian religious holiday was approaching. Sundays and church days have long been notorious massacre days in Russia, and the Jews dreaded them as a plague. The celebration of the day of Peter and Paul was to be signalized by a massacre of Warsaw Jews, current gossip said. The report spread and gained in credence. The day before the holiday, 40,000 Jews fled the city. I crossed the frontier at Granica at midnight, was tumbled from a train into a broad customs inspection room where every traveler's baggage was closely overhauled and all arms, tobacco, and forbidden literature confiscated. Then on to Warsaw, where the spirit of unrest seemed to have possessed not only Jews, but every human being. Not that life is any the less gay in the Polish capital, for here the music of song and dance is always in the air, but the nerves of the populace are on edge, quivering. I stepped out of a shop one day, just as a stalwart soldier was passing by. He caught sight of a small camera under my arm and jumped, startled, as a woman by a mouse. Orsovians warned me not to go about the streets alone, even in broad daylight. So many casualties were daily reported. The ever-present Cossack with his terrible Nagizhka, that barbarous lash whip tipped with lead, was on every hand. Hospitals were crowded with injured and progromed. Prisons were crowded, fortresses were full, and the police were guarded by soldiers. There were daily cases of mob violence. On every hand, evidence of military law, and on every hand, evidence of internal chaos. If the Caucasus offers the most intricate and difficult problem of administration in all the Russian Empire, Poland presents a situation almost as troubled and quite as hopeless of immediate adjustment. Poland, from border to border, seethes with unrest and bitter hatred. There, more than nearly anywhere else in Europe, is a situation approaching the chaotic. Russia appreciates how desperate is her hold on Poland, and as a safety measure, martial law is maintained universally and continuously. Martial law is a means for legitimizing utter lawlessness on the part of the military and police authorities, excusing the indiscriminate use of bayonets and bullets. The example thus ingloriously set by the officials is all too quickly followed by the people who have thrown to the four winds all respect for law and discipline and restraint, and the battle is waged on a a fight-as-fight-can basis. Bloodshed, riot, assassination, robbery, and crimes unlisted are part of each day's work. Ever since Bloody Sunday in January 1905, not one night of peace has visited this wretched country that for so many decades was the source of contention of half of Europe's greatest powers. Just as the slaughter of Father Gapon's working men in St. Petersburg was also the signal to all Russia to rise, So Poland also responded to that signal at that time. With firm, deliberate intention, she then entered upon a period of sanguinary revolution which rages as fiercely today as it has at any time since that fatal Sunday. 
Russia, appreciating the universality of this aggressive attitude, put an army of nearly 300,000 men into the country. Approximately 200,000 of these were soldiers, and 100,000 administrative officials, all Russians, bitterly hating the Poles, who in their turn hold dislike for official Russians, second only in keenness to the dislike for the Russians, whom they also fear. On the other hand, between the labor parties of each country is a strong friendship, for, in official Russia, the working men of Poland, as well as the rank and file of Russia itself, appreciate a common enemy. Not only from hereditary wrongs does Poland suffer, but from present oppression. The iron yoke of Russia presses heavily, and everyone in Poland is in desperate rebellion, including the children, who refuse to go to school until the Polish language is substituted for the Russian, and the university students, who are shut out of their university because of the tyranny and cowardice of a government that only sees revolution in education. Small wonder, then, that over half the population of Poland can neither read nor write, and that the proportion of schools is decreasing rather than increasing. The attitude of Russia towards Poland is that of suppression, not of rational administration. Of what interest is it to Russia if Polish children do not go to school? The salaries of teachers, at least, are saved. Warsaw has 60,000 schoolless children, growing up in darkness, nurtured only by a blind hatred of the people whose flags float over their city. The amount of money spent on education in Poland amounts to 12 cents per child, as compared to $2.30 per child in Berlin. Poland's population is approximately 10 million. Nearly two-thirds are agriculturalists. More than one-half of this number have either no land at all of their own, or next to none, at best an insufficient amount to afford them a livelihood. Industry has been demoralized and disorganized to such an extent that wages have remained stationary for a decade, while the cost of living has doubled, and this in the face of an increasing population. The Poles are so fiercely nationalistic. The people of Finland have been submerged as much as the people of Poland have been, but with a very different effect. The population of Finland is rapidly decreasing. All of her young men are going abroad, to England, to America. Not so in Poland. In spite of an emigration to America of nearly 50,000 in one year, Poland's population is on the increase. Poland's young men stay to fight, to starve, to suffer inquisitorial tortures in Russian prisons. One striking example of the warfare waged in Poland against the Russian administration was the campaign of extermination inaugurated against the police of Warsaw while I was in the city. 34 officers and 140 policemen were killed within a few weeks, all in broad daylight on the public streets. 27 were shot within three days. In the proletariat suburb of Wola, there were originally 37 policemen. 27 of these were shot to death and 10 seriously wounded. The most extraordinary part of this unusual campaign is that not one culprit was caught. In America, the police would long ago have taken shelter from such deadly attacks. It is only natural that panic should possess the remaining members of the police force in Poland's olden capital. Some did escape, but most found themselves in a veritable trap from which they could not escape. Without a passport, no traveler may find a place to rest his head at night in Russia, much less a refugee policeman. Without a passport, the frontier looms a great place, impassable Chinese wall. A single man might escape by stealth in the night, but even policemen sometimes have scruples about deserting their wives and families. And so these unwilling martyrs continue their nerve-wracking but senseless patrol of Warsaw streets. Senseless because troops possessed each avenue and alley. According to the most reliable estimates, there were at least 75,000 troops quartered in the city at that time. In justice to the military, it should be said that they did their utmost for the long-suffering police, for each and every policeman who was then left had a military guard of three infantrymen. One of the grim humors of the revolution was to see an ordinary policeman going to his post of duty with two soldiers following at ten paces to the rear, with loaded rifles and fixed bayonets. Then, when he took up his position of duty in the center of two intersecting streets, two soldiers remained at one corner and a third at an opposite corner. For this inglorious service, the Russian government generously paid these luckless men six dollars a month. This reign of terror directed against the police department was by no means the only evidence of turmoil and unrest in Warsaw. On every hand, there were indications of a terrible blight. Beggardom here was at its worst, not beggardom as we know it, 
but infinitely worse. Public charities, private philanthropies, day nurseries, diet kitchens, and settlements are not known in Poland. The streets were literally lined with the lame, the halt, the blind, the sick, the starving. I was accosted by twenty-odd during the course of a short walk from Boulevard Café to my hotel one night. Once I came upon a woman who had sunk to the pavement from weariness or hunger. She pressed a rude bundle under her shawl. Dwornik, janitor, was sternly, though not unkindly, bidding her rise up and move on. Her dress was in rags. Her feet were bare. The old gray shawl round her shoulders was the only trace of comfort. A passerby extended a hand and helped her to her feet. She staggered on, and we saw that the bundle she held was a very young baby, and as electric light fell upon her face, we realized her youth. Seventeen, perhaps, or eighteen at most. This at past eleven o'clock. At that moment, from the café on the corner, came up the lively strains of the Bell of New York. Up and down the boulevard, as far as the eye could reach, were women, girls of thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, girls not beyond their teens yet, old in features, mature women, oldish, faded women, 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 and endless, ceaseless procession. It swells at twilight and diminishes toward dawn, but ends never. But these are not like the beggar woman, yet. Pure statistical tables arranged like a page from a census report of the sights and scenes of one night in Warsaw would appear absolutely incredible to unfamiliar eyes. It is almost melodramatic in its seeming unreality. For in spite of the squalor and the misery and the scenes, both revolting and pitiful, there is a fascination about Warsaw, a laughing, careless air that is ever-present. Sunshine and shadow chase each other over Warsaw streets, and sunshine and shadow have entered into the temperament of the people. This duality is characteristic of both. On first acquaintance, Warsaw seems not unlike Paris, a smiling city of long avenues and pleasant streets and shaded boulevards, brightened at night by brilliant cafes. The warm summer nights are nonetheless delightful because martial law prevails. Music is everywhere. These fiery, temperamental people, how they play the very abandon and nonchalance of the Warsovians, is in itself an added charm. There is no repudiating the situation. The streets swarm with soldiers recently returned from an ignominious war, in which they never had an interest, released to starve upon the streets. War is not the root evil, but the war was largely responsible for the situation here, so far as the beggary is concerned." With so large a proportion of the able-bodied men of the country called away on unproductive campaigns of destruction, the women and children were forced to fight the wolf themselves. Warsaw's traffic in prostitutes is as extensive as it is worldwide. The total population of the city is 750,000. The number of professional prostitutes carrying yellow passports, i.e. passports issued by the authorities to prostitutes, in the city is between 50 and 60,000. It is asserted on reliable authority that there are regularly organized companies dealing in young girls, who supply not only Europe but distant places like South American capitals. Piccadilly and Regent Street in London, which so frequently horrify Americans, are as nothing compared to Warsaw's boulevards. More than this, business was at a standstill, and industry disorganized and deteriorating. Strike following strike in the trades necessity supports. One week, the bakers were trying to get enough of the bread of their own baking to fill the mouths of their children. Another week, the men of some other trade. But ever and always, somewhere the hopeless, heartbreaking struggle was on. Violence is an instinct with the Poles. A few of the bakers stuck to their ovens. The result was that the early nights of the week were characterized by riots, usually suppressed by a volley from Cossack's rifles. The day I arrived in Warsaw, there were 25 reported clashes between the authorities and the people. The following day, there were 30. For weeks before, the hospital ambulances had been called out on an average of 30 times a day for casualties resulting from lawlessness, either on the part of the people or of the authorities, for no one is guiltless here. The wounded from a recent Jewish massacre were in a hospital on the outskirts of the city. Driving to visit the place, I inquired at my hotel how much I should pay a cab driver to take me there. "'Must you go, sir?' said the hotel porter. "'Do not go, sir, if it is possible to avoid doing so.' "'Why?' I asked in surprise. "'It is a dangerous road.' "'But at ten o'clock in the morning?' 
A man was killed there yesterday afternoon in daylight. Many have been shot there recently. The hospital was located three quarters of an hour's drive from the center of the city, in a district which somewhat suggested the Bowery, but more closely resembling Commercial Road and Whitechapel. On the day I met cavalry patrol after patrol, Cossacks and dragoons, all rode in open order, that is to say, two abreast in the center of the road, then one at either side of the road, and so on. This was the current precaution against bombs. Rifles were unslung and held at right angle, ready for instant action. The advance guard of an army scouting the battleground for the enemy would take no greater precautions. A few days before, there had been a fusillade directly in front of the hospital. No one knew exactly what started it, but members of two political parties had been dueling in the open street. The matter was reported to the military headquarters and a special troop of Cossacks detailed to the scene. They arrived one hour after the incident, but having been sent out to do something and not knowing what else to do, they fired several volleys at the hospital, breaking a few windows but fortunately doing no other damage. What with the injured from Warsaw riots and the wounded from the massacre, this hospital, except for the women and children who lay there, punctured by bullets and slashed by swords and bayonets, was not unlike an army hospital. I found a child of four years whose leg had been broken by a soldier's rifle. According to a young girl who's very bright and intelligent, she and the youngster of four and a young boy were standing together on a doorstep of their home. A company of soldiers were coming up the street on their mission of murder and horrors unmentionable, when one of them deliberately fired at the trio. The bullet struck the boy first, killing him, then the child's leg, breaking it, and glancing upward, lodging in the girl's stomach. To say that these were dangerous persons to the Russian government is the absolute extreme of absurdity. End of chapter 13, part 1. Recording by Zena. Section 20 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Zena. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 13, Part 2. Even the children have a spirit of revolt. One day, every school in Warsaw was pupilless. The children had struck. Being Polish children, they objected to doing their lessons in Russian. But the Russian government forbade the use of any other tongue. So the children left the schools en masse. Parents were powerless to coerce attendance. The Russian government could not turn the military upon schoolboys and girls, and so it compromised. Permission was granted for the use of Polish in private schools whereupon the children entered private schools. Today, in Warsaw, the private schools are taxed to their utmost capacity, while empty benches and deserted playgrounds are found in the public schools. When a general strike is declared in Russia, Warsaw responds with a bound. So perfect is the organization that every railroad, postal, or telegraph strike that is declared in Russia is most effectually carried out in Poland. When the Warsovians declare a program, they carry it out. As witness, the destruction of the police force. They destroy the rank and file, and incidentally pick off the top as well. The chief of police was blown up as a matter of course. The Poles are inherently violent. The same spirit which makes them capable of great artistic achievements makes them demoniacal when goaded beyond endurance. Today, Warsaw prisons are full. Politicals even crowd the fortresses and one hears awful stories on every hand and from every conceivable source of the torturing of prisoners. One method of extracting information said to be commonly resorted to is to suspend prisoners by their wrists and beat them alternately back and front until their stomachs turn. Another is pulling out their hair and their teeth, starvation, giving them food but no drink, preventing their sleeping. All these things I have heard from reliable people. More terrible tortures I refrain from staining this page with, even by mentioning. Never morning wears to evening, but blood is spilled in Warsaw. Never a lull between twilight and dawn, but some hellish thought finds expression indeed. The clatter of cavalry patrols rings over the stony streets every hour of the twenty-four. 
The swish of the cruel Nagashka in the hands of the relentless Cossacks attends each trifling disturbance. Sentinels finger their rifles at intervals only of yards. Rifles, bayonets, pointed, always ready. And yet, Warsaw is fair to see, with its public buildings, small parks, dashes of fresh green here and there, even flowers, richly blooming beds that scent the warm air and seem to bring a breath of the open into the town. Flower girls, too, children with daisies and roses and pinks, a boutonniere from Azur, a bright nosegay from a lady. Quite a feature of the city, indeed, and always the music. The violin, the cello, the piano, the weird and intense music of Poland alternating with the flippant, laughing melodies that America sends abroad. Typically Warsovian, all this. The beautiful, the careless, the jaunty, ever to the fore. And underneath, the dire, the grim, the intense. Like an animal that fixes its teeth in the death grip in the throat of its antagonist, so the Poles of Warsaw have set their teeth toward the heart of Russian despotism. There will be no letting go, no truce, one or the other will go under. Without a single great leader, Russia watches too closely for one to rise. Without definite ideals, wild, passionate, desperate, the Poles naturally do not all work through the same channels. They split into factions and parties, each striving for Russia's overthrow or Poland's advancement, but each in its own way. Consequently, party clashes engender bitterness and hatred within. The parties of Poland are as numerous as the tongues heard at Babel, not all equally strong, but several there are of large influence, each pledged to one definite object, and if all were ultimately to succeed, the result would be the regeneration of Poland, through extinction were it not for their saving policy of uniting in time of great crises, magnanimously putting aside party differences for the salvation of the whole people. Yet their methods for the time are party methods, and the situation in all its strange phases is only explained through an analysis of the more important parties and influential political organization. The Jewish Socialist Bund is the most widely known and perhaps the most powerful of these organizations, though not numerically the largest, nor is the Bund a strictly Polish organization. It extends into the Baltic provinces, and through these parts to South Russia, which are included in the Jewish Pale. But in Poland is its center, and in Poland is it most active. It is the fighting organization of the Jews. It aims to combat Jewish persecution in every way, politically, pacifically, terroristically, and from behind barricades when opportunity offers. This is a striking development, for traditionally the Jews are not a fighting people. Accustomed to centuries of persecution, they have learned to meekly bow to the blows showered upon their heads, or to flee. It is only during the more recent years of the Russian Revolution that the Jews have produced active rebels in formidable numbers. The Russian terrorists now number many Jews, and the Bund counts thousands of members, hundreds of whom are ready to perform terrorist acts when occasion demands. So powerfully menacing has this organization become that Austria and Germany both fear of it spreading across the frontier and of leaguing the young Jewish men and women of those countries into active Jewish defense organization. If this does happen, Austria and Germany may blame the blind, vicious government of Russia, none other. Fifty years ago, a series of so-called temporary laws were enacted in Russia applicable to Jews. Laws destined to arouse the very spirit of revolt which has culminated in the Bund. The Nationalist Party is numerically the strongest in Poland. First, because it was in opposition to the Duma. It appreciates that Poland's plight has no connection with Russia's internal difficulties. So the Nationalist Party opposed the first Duma on principle, simply because it was Russian. This was the clerical party, the Jesuitical party, for Poland continues to be Roman Catholic. The nationalists seek to establish the Polish language throughout the country and to gain a Polish administration. Being under clerical influences, the nationalist party is anti-Semitic. Then follow two middle-class bourgeoisie parties, each of considerable strength, the National Democratic Party and the Progressive Democratic Party. The National Democrats are opportunists. The present regime to them is intolerable. Any kind of a change they hope will improve the situation a party of despair, without ideals, but with some energy to continue fighting, for anything. 
The progressive Democrats, on the other hand, represent the intelligentsia. They challenge comparison with the liberals of France and the free thinkers of Germany. Distinctly a radical, if not a revolutionary group, they work for the autonomy of Poland under a Russian federation. They have some thought for the economic progress of the country and are not unfriendly to the Jews. They want free schools and universal suffrage. The public schools in Poland under Russia, as if not heavily enough saddled with impositions and restrictions, are heavily taxed. A Polish child to attend a public school must study in a language not his mother tongue, must learn from a teacher who is a foreigner, to him, and who is utterly unsympathetic. And for these and adjunct privileges, the Russian government exacts from each child 50 rubles, $25, per year. There are all degrees of socialists in Poland. If all of the socialist parties in Poland were to combine, there would be formed a party of such overwhelming strength that it would sweep all the others along with it. But socialism without factions would not be recognized by its best friends. The Bund is socialistic and entirely Jewish. The Christian socialists are socialists but anti-Semitic. This latter organization is made up of a more or less dilettante element, kid-gloved radicals, tailor-made revolutionists. To offset the Christian socialists are the realists. Formerly, this was the great reactionary party, but of late it has become the party of the landed proprietors. Not a formidable organization, yet the one monarchical conservative voice crying in the wilderness of radicalism. The labor movement in Poland, while a long way in advance of Russia, is yet leagues behind Europe. Still, the Labor Party nucleus are a grim lot, and they have it within their power to more completely paralyze all Poland for a limited time than any other party or organization. There are more than 300,000 factory or mine workers in Poland, and as they have learned from their repeated experiences, the general strike is a most effective weapon. When not a factory wheel turns, when the mines are left to flood, when the railroad lines are exposed to rust and the telegraph and telephone wire stretch useless across the miles of unhappy country, every human being in Poland feels the strain and stress. Europe takes fright and St. Petersburg cowers in panic. Three times has this taken place, and each time with a similar result. So much for the Labour Party and its method of result. There remains one large party. This is the party whose efforts are above all others propagandistic. The Polish Party Socialist, the PPS as it is commonly called. If heredity counts in the abstract realm of politics, this party should be THE Socialist Party of Poland. It is the direct descendant of the first socialist organization established in Poland in 1875. Now, as then, socialism progresses by stealth. To admit that one holds socialistic opinions is to commit oneself to prison. In its earliest beginnings, it was purely intellectual, but in the 80s, it spread to the proletariat. Marxist doctrines were the regularly accepted gospel of these socialists. With the growth of nihilism in Russia, Polish socialism came to absorb something of the policy of violence, and even the terrorism it still maintains. The PPS, as it exists today, was definitely organized 13 years ago. Twelve years ago, it undertook the printing and circulating of a newspaper. At the outset, this paper appeared only occasionally. But as its circle of readers extended, it was published more regularly. Now it is a daily. This record represents one of the most remarkable underground achievements in Russia, for the police have never been able to discover it or to suppress it, though to be found with a copy of it on one's person means arrest. In spite of this, it is one of the easiest papers to procure in Warsaw. Boys sell it stealthily on the streets. I asked a hotel porter where I could get a copy, and he promptly took one from his inside pocket and gave it to me. During the past year, several hundred people have been arrested for no other offense than reading this paper. It is a Robotnik, laborer. The Polish Party Socialist, besides promulgating and propagating German socialist doctrines, works for the decentralization of the Russian Empire, a United States of Russia, with state control and autonomy for Poland. The prime differences between this party and the Social Democrats, the powerful Russian proletariat organization, is that the latter demand an out-and-out -out republic modeled on France. And against all of these parties is Russia struggling in her frantic effort to hold Poland subject. It is commonly supposed that the conquest of the Caucasus, which has been going on for a generation, was without a parallel in the Russian Empire. But in Poland, the situation is equally grim. Poland carries Russia's yoke because coerced by merciless force. 
but never for a day is the fight regarded as finished. The idea of revolution is more universally understood in Poland than in Russia. The Russian peasants want land and liberty. The Russian proletariat want a reorganized industrial life. The Poles want freedom from Russian oppression, freedom to worship God in their own way. Today, there are several hundred thousand legally illegitimate children in Poland because the parents were united according to the rights of the Roman Catholic Church, instead of by the Greek Church, as stipulated by intolerant Russia. They want freedom to choose teachers for their young who are of their own blood and who speak their own tongue. They want freedom to select their own administrative officials and to make their own laws. And for all these things, they are actively and openly fighting. They do not expect to win them by a single coup. They are resigned to a prolonged fight. The people of Poland remember that the French Revolution lasted 20 years, and the Austrian uprising of 48 almost equally as long. They understand that the progress of revolutions is like unto the onward roll of the sea, a succession of waves. The sea of revolution has washed completely over Poland, and now the waves are mounting higher and higher. There are moments of quiet and apparent retreat, but these are growing fewer and briefer. In the grimness of the people is a dire significance that Russia has already recognized. Just now is the reign of chaos. So far as one can see, Poland is in the grip of an old middle-class conception of anarchy, anarchy stripped of all its philosophy and idealism, stark, black, fearful. Yet the great underlying dynamic of this terrible unrest is a great hope. End of chapter 13, part 2. Recording by Zena. Section 21 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia, by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 14. Among the Mujiks. The future of Russia lies in the Mujik. With an agrarian population aggregating 80% of the total population, the balance of power must ultimately rest with the majority. Since the war with Japan, the world has begun to see the Russian peasant in a new light. No longer the ignorant, slothful creature he has been depicted, but a thinking man of strong frame, promising rare development in the future if individual advancement can be encouraged under a wise, sane, and humane administration. The Russian peasant is the best raw material in Europe from an industrial point of view, an American manufacturer in Russia once said to me. He is powerfully built, naturally imitative, and adaptable. Long before the Mongols invaded Russia, Russia held republican traditions. The states which now make up the Russian Empire were formerly ruled by princes and dignitaries elected by the people, and indeed, Michael Romanov, the first of the present reigning house, was chosen Tsar without opposition of arms or other force, so that even Nicholas II is where he is today because of a republican custom which raised his forebears to the throne. The Russian church is not Russian. It calls itself Greek Orthodox. It is an importation from Byzantium just as the bureaucracy is an importation from Germany. The Russian peasant has submitted to these foreign impositions because they were foisted upon him, but in village life there has been presented the spirit of pure democracy and republicanism. Therefore it is true that the Russian people do take kindly to reform, and herein lies the probability of the Russian peasant ultimately leading the world in social and economic reforms. When the power which must eventually be yielded to the peasantry has finally been wrested from autocracy and bureaucracy, the pendulum of the social revolution will swing wide, paralleling, if not surpassing, the French Revolution, and affecting the entire world. The peasants were the weightiest group in the Duma. The constitutional democrats did more talking, and in their academic way were the shapers of the first Duma but the peasants swung the votes. The government at first leaned on the peasants because of their supposed superstitious loyalty to the emperor, 
their little father the constitutional democrats knew however that this was a thing of the past and at once began to proselytize among the men in homespun the socialists and extreme radicals among the social democrats and labor deputies entered upon no end of negotiations to seal a compact with the peasants and with perhaps better success but the supposed gullible guileless ingenuous mujik showed himself as canny as a scot he listened to everything that anybody wished to say to him but when the moment came for exchanging pledges the long shaggy head of the rustic would deliberately but firmly wag we want land and liberty that was the answer one heard a score of times each day in the duma lobby other matters were of secondary interest to him the mujik used to be terribly serious about two things in life god and the czar this is no longer the case the czar sanctioned the calling together of the duma the peasants believed in it then and in him the duma meant to them a place where representatives of all the people could come together to formulate requests and to explain in detail to the emperor the ills of his majesty's people in the remote country districts previous to the first duma millions believed that this would suffice thousands of people in america hold a similar view in regard to the czar namely that he is well-meaning but kept from knowledge of actual conditions through the machinations of his ministers counsellors and minions of the court there was great rejoicing among the peasants when the first duma framed a response to the throne speech and many of them telegraphed most optimistic messages to their home villages the czar would hear their prayers and grant their requests they thought alas the pain of disillusionment that awaited them like a thunderbolt from a clear sky came the government's answer every single request rejected and refused i was in the duma that afternoon amid the strained stillness of the great hall the prime minister read the address only once did m gorimikin pause to swallow a drop of water as he raised the glass to his lips it seemed as if every one of the eight or nine hundred people in the room coughed nervously as men do who sit under great strain but in a breath the intense quiet returned when the reading was ended a pin drop would still have been audible then while the constitutional democratic leaders were answering the ministry in fiery speeches one after another from the tribunal the peasants alone or two by two as men in common trouble filed slowly into the lobby they all seemed instinctively to drift toward the telegraph booth they were the men who had suffered a blow and were nonplussed their faith in the little father was now irretrievably shaken in the duma conservative and academic professors stung to desperation hammered and pounded the ministry and finally introduced a resolution which incidentally they asked a peasant to read expressing their mistrust of the ministers demanding their resignation and a new and responsible ministry this was parliamentary the peasants acted differently they voted in agreement because they were told it was right to do so what they did of their own initiative was to send scores of telegrams which strangely enough the imperial wires carried that night carried till they were hot we have been refused land liberty and new laws tell everybody this was the burden of the messages that was the mujik's impulse these messages were sent by sad men just coming to the realization of their situation but having done this they were not materially relieved they sat together on the lobby benches and conversed in low tones when adjournment was announced they went sorrowfully away several never to return one resigned utterly discouraged a few days later one died as a result of his heartbreaking disappointment adrianov of simburst government and the duma rose in the middle of the afternoon as a token of respect several remained ill in their lodgings for a week it is difficult for us in america to understand and appreciate such intense feeling as these simple peasants reveal 
but to them this duma was the most serious event in their lives now they were utterly crushed by the realization that apparently the czar did not care for his people that the duma was a mockery and a farce and that if they were to escape from their plight it must be through their efforts the telegram sent that afternoon constituted the biggest piece of revolutionary propaganda since the father gapon labor demonstrators were shot down in cold blood in the square of the winter palace in january nineteen o five how can you fight i asked some of the peasants who had been sent as delegates to st petersburg and who intimated that this refusal of the governments meant open rebellion the soldiers have taken our arms it is true they replied but we have left our wood axes and our scythes we can cut telegraph posts we can burn barracks and landlords houses it is a commonplace psychological fact that the slower a man is to anger the more terrible will his wrath be the moujik is grim and determined as for time it does not exist for him at any railroad junction in russia one may see any number of peasants waiting about all night or all day between trains six eight ten hours delay in making connections troubles no peasant one night i stepped off a volga steamer at a landing far too small to be mentioned on the biggest map it was nearly midnight and the rain was descending in torrents my destination was a place distant between twenty-five and fifty miles my information was no more definite than this and the journey must needs be by horse or wagon my companion and i were utterly at a loss to know how to proceed from the landing for we could not see an arm's length before us and we had not the remotest idea which direction to take presently we discovered a moujik whom we hailed with joy he told us he was waiting for a boat down the river which he expected would come along about five o'clock in the morning where had he come from we asked petrovka he replied our destination our delight at the coincidence was unbounded and we straightway asked him how we were to get there and the distance to proceed at night was impossible he told us for the roads were flowing streams and the mud ankle-deep as to the distance he had not the dimmest idea how long were you in coming we asked what time was it when you left petrovka the fellow laughed as he answered friend you must know we have no clocks when i left the sun was there and he pointed to about five degrees above the eastern horizon and when i reached here the sun was there and he pointed to about five degrees above the western horizon so we knew it to be about three-quarters of a day's journey he told us further that though there was a village a little more than a mile away from the landing we could never reach it in such a storm just then a horse neighed not twenty feet away we eagerly splashed through the mud in the direction of the sound and found a young peasant on the point of driving off he had brought some goods to the steamer we had just left and now he was returning to the village we begged him to take us home with him and put us up for the night he assented readily arrived at his house a typical peasant's hut with roof of mud and thatch we helped him put up the horse and followed him inside his father and mother and several brothers were asleep on the floor peasants usually sleep on the floor in summer in winter there are sleeping boxes over the stove the old woman was the only one who moved at our entrance and she did not look at all surprised she pointed to an ancient home-made bed and told us we might lie there if we liked but the floor was better we knew the bed would be swarming with vermin so we chose the floor the old woman threw down a sheepskin for my friend i rolled myself in my travelling rug this instance is typical of the moujik's placid hospitality not once but many times i knocked at peasants huts in out-of-the-way places and asked for shelter sometimes i received the greeting where did god send you from but moujik curiosity is easily appeased the psychology of moujik religion brings one to the realm of mysticism and superstition russia is filled with sectarians 
the dukobors are known in america because of their wholesale immigration into canada a few years ago they were a caucasian sect the Malacani are another kindred sect also originating in the caucasus in central russia are many other sects holding and practicing strange tenets among them suicide by fire and exposure of their naked bodies to the furious storms of winter certainly no country in europe has so great a variety of mysterious beliefs but these all belong in a category apart from the superstitious orthodoxy of the average mujik to describe the sectarians would necessitate the compass of a volume whereas there are certain salient characteristics of the accepted orthodoxy which are ever impressing themselves upon the traveller at the outset the forms of religion are well-nigh universally observed most peasants remove their hats when passing a church or an icon and cross themselves three times in the interior one sometimes finds a small crude shrine set up at the entrance to a village before this shrine travelling moujiks prostrate themselves falling to their knees and bowing forward till their foreheads rest in the dust every moujik has his revered icon and holy pictures usually the icon is set in the corner of the wall facing the door so that every one who enters may reverence it after each meal the peasants upon rising from the table bow before the icon crossing themselves i have seen icons in vodka shops thus reverenced by peasants coming to buy liquor the peasant too has a blind but sometimes very real faith in miraculous images and pilgrimages to well-known shrines like the madonna of kazan and the iberian shrine in moscow are constantly maintained the ringing of the village church bells on a sabbath morning or on the occasion of a saint's day is something wondrous and memorable there is nothing melodious in the sound a terrible clanging and pounding loud wild sonorous discordant but the mujik believes that these sounds drive away evil spirits in spite of all these surface signs of ingrained religion the mujik is not a religious being the orthodox church has no real grip upon his life and apart from the sectarians and old believers the peasant is intensely ignorant of all religion and religious beliefs he strictly observes the church fasts because it has been his custom to do so and because the priests tell him that he must but it must be remembered that the priest is not so much a spiritual teacher as an agent of the government nor do the priests by their example show the people what christianity might do for them they are frequently dirty slovenly creatures guilty of many excesses of public drunkenness and not infrequently accused of dishonesty monasteries are sometimes dens of iniquity and i know of convents which are semi-public brothels the mujik abstains from flesh food during the long lenten fast and on the regularly prescribed fast days but he drinks at the same time and as a result of his impoverished physical condition he falls easy victim to the strong drink this gives rise to the common idea that russian peasants are drunken during a certain long fast i was spending some time at a large house in south russia one afternoon upon returning to the house after several hours absence the master and i met one of the maids in the hall weeping bitterly she told us to go quickly into the dining-room there we found the gardener and the laundress both maudlin drunk standing before a small icon of the virgin repeatedly drinking the good health of the holy mother this shocking irreverence had quite undone the maid flagrant as this incident sounds it is less so than many of the stories one hears of priests holy sisters and mother superiors mother superiors like abbots are often appointed because of their social influence and may be without any previous ecclesiastical or monastic training there was a classic story in russia told of alexander the third who was once visiting a certain town near moscow a local monastery was pointed out to the emperor and a little way off a convent the emperor looked from one to the other and then began to scan every point of the horizon does your majesty seek something asked one of the escort yes responded the emperor 
you tell me yonder is a monastery and over the way a convent i am looking for the third building the foundling institution the mujik's religion so far as i had observed it is a set of forms to which he bows much as he pays his taxes and an instinctive feeling which is never discussed nor thought about that outside of himself is some great and mysterious power which he must not offend and by observing the forms which this vaguely understood being delights in he may expect in return protection in any hour of trial the mujik is naturally shrewd this is a reasonable explanation an adequate reason for his going regularly to church and of course no god would see his children inflict the punishments of fasts and long ceremonials upon themselves without rewarding them at some future time that there is a genuinely practical element in the mujik's religion is indicated in a well-known popular legend which purports to explain how it comes that st cassian's day falls only on the odd day of leap year it also is a keen analysis of the psychology of the mujik's religious outlook the two saints cassian and nicholas so the legend goes appeared before the lord together what hast thou seen on earth asked the lord of st cassian i have seen a mujik foundering with his cart in a marsh by the way answered st cassian why hast thou not helped him inquired the lord because i was coming into thy presence and i was afraid of soiling my bright clothes so they would offend thine eyes at this moment the eyes of the lord rested upon st nicholas who approached falteringly his dress utterly dishevelled and spattered with mud why comest thou so dirty into my presence asked the lord because i was following st cassian and seeing the mujik of whom he just spake i have helped him out of the marsh the lord hesitated a moment then said because thou cassian has cared so much about thy dress and so little about thy brother i will give thee thy saint's day only once in four years and to thee nicholas for having acted as thou didst i will give four saint days each year and that is how it comes about that st cassian's day falls on february twenty ninth and st nicholas's day occurs quarterly in this case mujik ethics are illustrated as eminently practical and so with mujik morality sexual immorality is so commonplace among the officers and among certain court and aristocratic circles that it is no longer scandalous it is accepted and also in the industrial towns among the proletariat but among the peasantry an entirely different code exists a code of sex honor born of what americans would call horse sense early marriages are the rule to be sure much earlier than in the towns but the standard of morality is probably higher among the peasantry than among any other class of people in russia in one village which i visited in south russia the village schoolmistress and schoolmaster aged respectively twenty-one and twenty-six were living together in what they called a free love union yet the matter was not noticed especially by the peasants in other words the mujik while morally strict with his own people is highly tolerant of the lives of other people and this tolerance does not stop here but is extended also to beliefs the religion of the mujik is so lacking in detailed creed that he is not inclined to quarrel over beliefs with any one in this respect the sectarians are less amiable they not unnaturally are dogmatic and largely inclined toward bigotry but the sectarians are apart from the typical russian peasant laziness is frequently ascribed to the russian peasant here one may not assent nor at the same time repudiate the charge between the peasants of different sections are differences in temperament and characteristics almost as great as between some races the landed proprietor is the man who most often calls the mujik lazy he best should know but by what standard is the russian peasant adjudged lazy the average russian official comes to his office at ten or eleven o'clock in the morning and in three or four hours he feels that he has done enough for one day russia borders on the east 
there are parts of russia traversed by bedouins by camel traders by people whose months and years slip easily by on the hillsides and deserts compared to any of these the russian peasants are most industrious soil is a factor if a peasant has only one deshatine of ground as is the case with thousands of peasants in the interior in governments like saratov and voronezh it is quite impossible for him to keep busy the year through especially if he has no knowledge of modern agriculture as most of them have not there are thousands of moujiks who have not yet heard of intensive cultivation who know nothing of the advantage of rotating crops and who use wooden ploughs because they have always used wooden ploughs or or have not the money to buy iron implements when they learn that such exist in the world russia is not equally fertile throughout in some of the districts where an annual famine is recurrent one finds soil which should be rich and productive it lacks only water which could be managed by irrigation but the government has never taken large steps to solve this difficulty so the soil is subjected to abuse by peasants who know no better then when the crops become meagre the peasants are reduced to starvation but the great point of all is that it is less than half a century since the shackles of bondage fell from them surely not one generation nor two must pass before these recent slaves shall be judged by the side of men who have been free for centuries under serfdom the obligatory duties of peasants were vague ill-defined chores and even these were prescribed by someone else someone who said when it was time to cut wood for the master when it was time to sow and when it was time to reap the problem of adjustment is only a little less real and formidable to these people than it was to the american negro slaves and the differences of opinion in russia to-day are quite as great in regard to the relative advantages of the present condition as compared to serfdom as in america in regard to the welfare of the negro now and before the war but one thing i have noticed no moujik ever desires to return to serfdom the twinkle in his eye is full enough of intelligence when this question is put to him the moujik is rarely indiscreet in his talk this characteristic is noted by most travellers in russia and it is surely true not infrequently a man who has been talking most intelligently will give an answer to some simple question which is perfectly inane he has suddenly become suspicious so he shrewdly turns you so completely off the track that metaphorically you are ditched this seems to be an instinctive ruse to learn that the forms of democracy are not new in russian life one needs only to turn to the villages the very word duma is not new towns and even villages have their duma tolstoy talks about the gospel is understood by the mujik the ideal of civic life as conceived by the mujik culminates not in the state and autocracy but in the people an aggregation of mujiks there is an ancient proverb familiar throughout russia which expresses this ideal of democracy each for himself but god and the mir for all the mir being an association of villagers coming together to work out the common weal of the village under the laws of the land the national laws have allowed a wide scope in certain directions and the opportunity has not been lost by the moujiks they have been left free to manage many of their local economic interests in common like the allotment and periodic redistribution of land their fisheries cutting of timber and also they have been given absolute freedom to divide and distribute among themselves the village share of taxes collected from all of the people they have elected their own immediate administrative officers a certain number of local judges and those in turn have limited freedom in regard to accepting local custom and tradition in precedence to civil or criminal law prescribed by the state to the peasant therefore the duma is an institution similar to this local town meeting he has always been used to only on a national scale the shock came when the duma delegates in st petersburg found that 
to deliberate come to conclusions and to vote for certain measures was wholly a different thing from gaining those measures this was not like the duma they had been accustomed to at home there is much of animal patience about the mujik he is a stolid stubborn creature these qualities have led enlightened russians to call him a child when the duma began landed proprietors and gentry were wont to speak of peasant deputies as children but impartial observers soon form their own opinions the mujik is wily he may not have been so outspoken in the duma as men more accustomed to town life but he has the voice where voice means influence and his vote is as good as a university professor's in the assembly the peasant members usually stand solidly together they know what they want they ask for it concretely land and liberty and mark the craft they know that they cannot work out the land problem so they say to the constitutional democrats you want certain measures passed very well we will vote for them but you must turn your thoughts to the land question which is what we are interested in the constitutional democrats could not dispense with the peasant vote so they were coerced into a green and the mujiks would sit on the benches in the lobby swinging their legs and smoking cigarettes while tedious debates lasted going in when time to vote the peasants know their time is coming they have only to keep on smoking cigarettes in the lobby going in in time for each vote and to keep talking all the time about land and liberty during the duma session their telegrams went to every part of the empire they well knew they could afford to appear indifferent to the details of working out any bill the pretentious frock-coated gentleman might see to that the mujik understood that it was his part to lie low for a time only not to cease murmuring land and liberty he had the whip hand and knew it then no fool is this simple untutored rustic during the first duma the peasant deputies awoke to a consciousness of their power and importance through painful surprises they realized that they had a destiny to fulfill when these deputies returned to their respective villages all over the provinces they related to their fellow villagers all that had transpired in the duma then came the great peasant awakening which marked a new era for russia just those few months from may to july did it during that period the russian peasants bounded forward almost incredibly and in a few weeks advanced further than in many previous years to gather evidence of this change which literally swept over russia during the spring and early summer of nineteen o six i planned a long trip through the interior where i would see typical peasant villages and come in contact with many hundreds of the men upon whom it had suddenly dawned that they were indeed men men of power of ultimate influence and with a future in which to work out their own great destiny End of chapter fourteen Section twenty two of the Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durand. Chapter fifteen The Peasant Awakening. Part one. The dissolution of the Duma tore away the last remaining vestige of faith of the peasants in the Tsar and in the government. I allowed a month to pass after the dissolution before I set out upon my journey into the interior, for I wanted the news to permeate everywhere before my arrival, in order that I might gather impressions of the effect of this step upon the peasants. Intense repression was the aftermath of the dissolution, and martial law was spread to every quarter of the empire. The number of arrests made during the latter half of the summer was appallingly large. I left St. Petersburg on the night train, intending to leave Moscow the following evening. 
In Moscow I stepped into a bookshop to purchase a map. As I turned to leave the store, a clatter of spurs and the rattle of a sword caused me to turn my head, and I saw an officer of gendarme, accompanied by several regular soldiers, entering the shop by the rear door. A moment later, a party of several officers and more soldiers passed through the front door by which I was about to pass out. The senior officer motioned me back. The doors were all locked, a soldier placed by each, and all of us who were there, proprietor, clerks, customers, understood that we were all under arrest. Thereupon we made ourselves as comfortable as we could, pending the long and tedious search of the officers for forbidden books or pamphlets. From time to time I glanced out of the window into the streets, where I could see the radiant face of my drosky driver, whom I had engaged by the hour. It was just the noon hour when I had entered the shop, and I began to get ravenously hungry, but I had to bide my time. After several hours of patient waiting, we customers were taken into a rear room and subjected to a searching examination. I was able to establish my identity as an American citizen and was presently released, but all of the others were detained, some for overnight and two or three for several days. In the interior, none of us would have got off so lightly. It was now early August, and 85 of the 87 provinces of European Russia were then under some form of extraordinary protection or martial law. One of the five exempt, or officially tranquil, provinces was Kostroma, a government which lies across and above the upper Volga. The capital of this province, Kostroma City, is situated about 260 miles north of Moscow, and it was here that I planned to begin my long journey through the peasant country. Kostroma once boasted historical consideration as the cradle of the house of Romanov. Here lived Michael Fedorovich Romanov in the year 1630, when he was elected Tsar. Just outside the town rises the convent of Ipatiev, which offered him a safe refuge, when the embittered Poles marched thither to slay him, and were diverted from their intention through the wit of the peasant Susanin, who, under the pretense of guiding the men of the south country to the hiding place of the Tsar elect, led them far into the forests, out of whose bewildering vastnesses no man might hope to escape. Today there are large imperial estates in Kostroma. I came here, turning over in my mind the probability of finding the loyal spirit of Susanin still lingering among the Kostroma peasants, a devotion supposedly of traditional character. I was recommended to several typical peasant villages within a radius of 50 miles of the town of Kostroma as worth my visiting. The town of Kostroma is an industrial rather than an agricultural centre. Large linen mills, starch and cutlery factories are there. The employees of these establishments are mostly peasants. Some of them contribute to the support of families in the villages, while not a few quit the mills and factories at every sowing and reaping time to help with the labours of the field. Thus, Kostroma peasants are not solely dependent upon their crops. There is yet another factor which helps to better their conditions, and which, according to the theory of some observers, should temper their feeling toward the government. The individual holdings of land are larger than in many sections. The average allotment is from 8 to 16 acres per adult male. This sometimes aggregates 30 acres to a family. Taken all in all, then, I had every reason to expect these peasants to be conservative, contented, and non-revolutionary. A local Zemstvo official, known to the peasants, offered to accompany me to the villages, to introduce me, and to vouch for the fact that I was seriously interested in knowing the precise feelings of the peasants in regard to the dissolution of the Duma, their attitude toward the government at the time, and their state of mind toward the next Duma. We travelled through the country in a native conveyance called a Tarantas, a basket-like affair drawn by three horses. Were it not for the incredibly rough roads, a Tarantas ride would be quite merry. The peasants at one of the first villages, at which we called, proved not only communicative, but so frankly eager to express themselves that the experiences of the evening proved full of significance. This village was located about ten miles from Kostroma, 
and consisted of a group of three or four hundred houses. As Russian villages go, this one had every appearance of comparative freedom from the ravages of poverty. To be sure, few of the houses were painted, and the streets were mere mud-rutted lanes, but the general appearance did not suggest squalor or the grim life struggle so often characteristic of Russian villages. Our troika pulled up before a tea-house near the close of the day. Within we found groups of peasants from the fields who were loitering over glasses of refreshing tea. There may have been forty in the room when we entered, mostly they were men of middle age. Their long hair was trimmed squarely, their beards shaggy and unkempt, though on the whole they had a neat appearance. Some wore shirts of bright red, others of blue. Their great boots were clodded with the soil. To foreign eyes it was a striking and picturesque scene. The rough rafters of the room, the bare walls, the home-turned benches and chairs fittingly framed the picture of these massive, strongly built peasant folk enjoying the first respite from the day's toil. When our steaming, fragrant tea had been set before us, my companion told the men, briefly, that I had come all the way from another country to talk with them. Their interest was fixed instantly. Within a very few minutes the number in the room had swelled to nearly one hundred, and so intent did we all become that several hours slipped by all too quickly. Will you tell us why the number of people of other countries lent money to the Russian government to help keep us down? This question came abruptly from a keen, blue-eyed mujik early in the conversation. We don't understand why the people of other countries should oppress us, because what have we done to them? My best explanations were obviously futile. The bold fact was clearly grasped by my questioner that the Russian government had borrowed money in France and Austria and England at a time when it seemed as if the lack of money would end the regime of insufferable oppression and wrong. His mind reached no farther than this, and his sense of justice and right were hurt. This man nurtured bitter enmity against his government, so I pressed him to tell me the reasons for his strong feelings. Everything costs too much, he replied. In this village we are not like peasants in other places who need more land. We have enough. What we want is another government, a government that will help the people to live. We are tired of paying 18 kopecks, 9 cents, for sugar, and too much for everything we buy. It is the government that does all this. A murmur of assent rolled round the room. Such boldness of speech in the midst of so large a company amazed me. Six or even four months before such daring was unheard of. When you say you want a change of government, what do you mean? I asked. We want a people's government, answered a swarthy-faced man who leaned far over an adjoining table. We want a real Duma. But you had a Duma, and look what became of it, I replied. We don't want that kind of a Duma, he persisted. We want a Duma that can do something for the people. A constituent assembly, interrupted a younger man. It did not seem possible that these men could be so clear on the situation as their words seemed to indicate. So I said, you see, I am a foreigner. I know nothing about your conditions. What do you mean by constituent assembly? We mean, responded the man near me, a Duma that can make all of the laws. We don't want another Duma that is hampered by a lot of laws at the start. We don't want any ministers except those appointed by this Duma, and we don't want any other officials who are not appointed by our Duma. This is what we mean by constituent assembly. Whether this extraordinary development was the result of agitation, or of the peasants' own progress toward a political concept, I did not then know. But there it was, a hundred peasants, in what amounted to a meeting, declaring for a constituent assembly, and explaining with perfect clearness and lucidity what it was they wanted to abolish and what they hoped to attain. "'Have you seen the Vyborg Manifesto?' I asked. "'Of course we have read it,' they exclaimed, laughing. "'What do you think about it?' "'It is foolish,' answered one of the older men. "'Stop paying taxes. "'We have not paid direct taxes in two years. "'Of course we shall not pay any this year. "'But can we stop drinking tea and vodka?' Can we stop using matches? As for not sending soldiers to the army, suppose we don't. Five soldiers are soon due from this village. Suppose we don't send them, what will happen? Cossacks will come. The whole village will have to defend those five men. 
That would mean bloodshed. Is it not better that we should get every one of those men to promise that they will never shoot at their brothers? If we do this, we can accomplish the same result without spilling blood in the streets of our village. One of the Constitutional Democratic Duma deputies from this province was urging a group of peasants to accept the Vyborg Manifesto when up spoke a canny mushik and said, You ask us to stop giving taxes to the government? That means stop drinking tea and vodka? Very good, but you are a lawyer. Will you stop putting stamps on all of your papers and documents and letters? These peasants, so far as I talked with them, had lost faith in the Constitutional Democrats, they felt that the members of this party were not always single-eyed, and in the Weiborg Manifesto they showed their lack of understanding of the peasants by asking them to do several ridiculous and impossible things, and then dropped into private life, leaving the peasants to muddle through with the practical side of the manifesto as best they could. "'Why should we shed our blood for a Duma that is dead?' asked the man, who had asked why England helped the government with money. The old Duma can do nothing for us. It is over. Give us a constituent assembly, a Duma that will make all of the laws that cannot be dissolved, and then things will be different. We would then feel we had something worth fighting for. But your Duma has been dissolved, and you have no immediate prospect of a constituent assembly. What do you intend to do? We will join any movement for a new government, was the surprising answer. We won't begin, because in this village we have no pressing reason. But if the peasants in the districts where there is famine will begin, we will join in. The peasants must rise together. How are you to do that? The Duma has taught us that it is possible for us to be united. Whatever is done now must be done by all of the peasants and all of the people. This being the province where the Emperor's family came from, I went on, I expected to find the peasants here quite loyal. There was a loud laugh at this, more direful than words. Up to this point the name of the Tsar had not been mentioned. I was curious to know their feeling toward him, so I ventured a direct question. When did you begin to lose faith in the Tsar? There was a momentary silence in which I almost regretted the question. Then someone answered, We never speak of the Emperor now, but we cannot forget that when our representatives drew up a response to the throne speech setting forth our needs, he refused to receive it. The Kostromo peasants now were sympathetic toward revolution because they had slowly reached the conclusion that the existing regime must go because it was evil and they saw no other way of getting rid of it. Their faith in the Tsar, which once was so strong, was hopelessly shaken and they no longer were soothed by the empty phrases which are periodically lavished upon them in hollow religious solemnity in the imperial ukases and rescripts. The significance of the Kostromo situation lay in this, that here was the ancient home of the House of Romanov, a province that had ever been loyal to autocracy, now not only had this loyalty disappeared, but open unrest prevailed, and threats of rebellion were freely expressed. The feeling of the peasants toward the government, that remained as it was before, full of hatred. Toward the Tsar they had changed. Previously they believed in him, but now they saw that the Tsar and the government were one, so they cordially hated both, and dared to tell us so. Here surely was evidence of a peasant awakening. Midway between this officially tranquil province of Kostromo and the frankly revolutionary government of Kazan, the old Tatar capital, lay Nizhny Novgorod, assertive, daring, ever since the good old days of old, when independence was maintained for several centuries against all invaders. The ex-Duma deputies, Zemstvo officers, and other citizens to whom I brought introductions, assured me that this whole province was not unlike a powder magazine, which a spark might touch off at any moment. Several estates near the city of Nizhny Novgorod had just been burned. The landlords of others had fled in anticipation of a coming wave of destruction. To such an extent was this true that not one of the gentlemen with whom I talked could suggest one estate within a reasonable distance of the city where I might hope to find normal conditions. At the same time, they all stated that the southern part of the government was thoroughly imbued with the idea of revolt, and that the completion of the harvest-taking might be followed by outbreaks 
regardless of the peasant movement in other parts of Russia. Here, in Nizhny Novgorod, however, I found a charming relief from the serious business of observing the peasant awakening, and the progress of the people toward revolution this proved like a childhood dream come true. The fires of insurrection were alight here and there through the province. Landlords of estates nearby were making off in anticipation of the rising tide of the peasant movement. But the great fair had all the charm of a world, wondrous strange, all the novelty of boyhood's most bizarre fantasies. When life grants so delightful an experience as the realisation of an olden dream, without one tinge of disappointment, one is filled with gratitude. And so I blessed the dear old geographers who spared a corner of one of the broad flat pages to a picture of Nizhny Novgorod. For the nonce I tried to forget the tumult and the struggle. Here was the fair. Landlords' estates might burn to ashes. For a few days I was determined to forget them, confident that ere long I should see other places in flames, as I had already seen whole towns reduced to ashes. A world exposition, whether at Paris or St. Louis, is a wearisome thing after the first one has been seen. The sameness, the fatiguing miles we walk in vain search for something new, none of this in Nizhny, unless one has been to Calcutta and knows his Turkestan, his Caucasia, his Siberia and Lapland. Nizhny is fascinatingly new. It is a people's fair above all else, a practical thing. The annual exchange of thousands of small things from the mysterious east and the frozen north, the one ample market of near a million peasants from the interior governments of Russia. The tourist will not find preparations to please his extravagant tastes. Utility is the underlying aim of the Nizhny Fair, but utility from the standpoint of the needs of the people who contribute to its upkeep and depend upon its resources, and the needs of the vast Tartar horde of stolid muzhiks and hardy people from polar regions are wondrously alike the needs of Europe and the Western world. The bazaars of Persia, of Dagestan and Tashkent range side by side with booths of pelts from Archangel and Nova Zembla, and frequently enough to be noticed a stall of old Cathay attended by narrow-eyed Orientals in rich blue silks, their plaited pigtails glistening black against the bright cloth. A few enterprising European merchants are represented, but only a few. I met one surprise at a picture postcard counter. The proprietor, a native Nizhny Novgorodian, asked me if I spoke English. When I answered that I did, he asked me if I had ever been in England. When I again answered yes, he asked if I had also been in America. Once more I told him yes. Then he came to the point, have you ever been in Boston? Yes, I know Boston quite well, I replied. A wide smile of genuine joy spread over his face as he grasped both my hands and wrung them in excited cordiality, enthusiastic to a degree utterly foreign to Boston. Early in his life he had spent four years in Boston. Since then he had never ceased regretting his inability to return there. His uncompromising loyalty to what he called the best city on earth would have done credit to any Bostonian of Mayflower lineage. Nishni streets flaunted gay colours. The myriad peoples who thronged the thoroughfares of the fair made up a crowd remarkably different from any I had ever before beheld. Here, I thought, it will not be difficult to forget Russia and her troubles. Alas, the Russian people make no such resolve. Never a day but some stroke against the government is contemplated. Never an event without some effort to turn toward the goal of Russian liberty. Hardly had I reached the fair when a chance acquaintance urged me to buy a ticket for a certain performance to be given that night, ostensibly for the benefit of an orphan asylum in a distant part of the country. But, as my friend explained, this orphan asylum was non-existent, and the proceeds really were for the Social Democratic Party. Next Tuesday, another charity performance was advertised, the proceeds to go to the Social Revolutionary Party, these being the two most active revolutionary organisations in European Russia at the time. End of chapter 15, part 1
Section 23 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adrian Stevens. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durand. Chapter 15, The Peasant Awakening, Part 2. In the midst of the fairgrounds I met an old-time revolutionist whom I had known as an exile on the east side in New York. She was among the amnestied in October 1905 and had returned like a released prisoner of war to the fight. When I met her she was about to start for a revolutionary meeting to be held in the depths of the forest a little way out of Nizhny. Meetings of this nature were quite common at that time, despite the fact that they were attended at considerable risk. The place of meeting must be announced by word of mouth, through a small committee, to each and every one of the four or five hundred people who are to attend. Absolutely nothing may be committed to paper. In spite of these precautions, the secret police frequently hear of the gatherings, and Cossacks are sent to fire upon the crowd. Twice within a fortnight my friend had been at such meetings, which were surprised by soldiers. At one, the volleys from the Cossack rifles had brought down a number of men and several young girls. The Nizhny Novgorod Fair was inaugurated long before the discovery of America. It owes its origin to the jealousy of the Muscovite princes of the commerce and trade which annually centred at Kazan, the seat of the Tartar Khans. The Kazan fairs date from 1257, but Muscovite fairs soon began to surpass those of the Tartars, and eventually the Kazan fair ceased to exist. Nizhny has not always been the location of this fair, for in the early days, Tsar Michael Fyodorovich, the first Romanov, and Ivan the Terrible changed the site to other vulgar towns, but so far as history is concerned, the associations will remain clustered round the old fortified town built at the junction of the Oka and the Volga, and called Nizhny Novgorod. It is a big affair. At the last official rebuilding, there were 60 buildings and 2,500 bazaars. Many small booths are added each year, and in addition are the usual sideshows, usual in the East. To me, they were most unusual. Beautiful Caucasian dancers, real Cossacks doing wonderful feats of horsemanship, old Russian tableau, sectional characterizations such as singers from Little Russia, northern camps, Degestanis, Turkestanis and Persian industries. All in all, the fair comprises about 8,000 definite exhibits, some of which are very large, but the impression made is not of costly wares designed for the homes of the rich, but simple things such as simple people need in daily life. The grand shops are there, as everywhere, but the ensemble effect was of useful, cheap articles for a workaday people. The Caucasian bazaars glisten with silver wares, bejeweled daggers, silver ornamented whips, bracelets, cigarette boxes, slippers adorned with hand-worked designs of gold and silver thread. Costly sounding articles, these, but in reality very cheap, and to Caucasians very necessary to the rest of the world very pretty. A dagger is as much a part of Caucasian dress as a waistcoat of a European. All Caucasians are horsemen, and ornamented whips are as universal among them as embossed saddles among Mexicans. As for the bracelets and earrings and brooches, where is Milady who will deny that these are among life's essentials? The Russian stalls show samovars of brass and nickel, linens, peasant linens, often exceedingly pretty and ridiculously cheap, home-pounded metal candlesticks, cups, plates, and even small implements, the various kinds of Russian costumes of the present day and of long ago, ancient stars being frequently worn on Sundays and special feast days by the peasants for their extra dress-up clothes. Before the Persian bazaars I was wont to linger longer. The stately main, the innate dignity of these swarthy Easterners commands interest. Their great dark eyes suggest infinite depth lost in height. Their strange yet meaningful expressions seem to flit from age to age, as lightly 
and as swiftly as a woodland bird darts from bough to bough, now soft as memory, recalling a long and mighty past, now stern and austere, remembering the hardness of the present. And the goods they sell are not of our world. Delicate embroideries, slight stuffs of silk as veil like as dew webs on the grass of a summer morning, yet traced with bright colours by fingers we know not where, beyond the great mountains that divided Europe from Asia, far beyond the Caspian Sea. Out of the depths of this ancient but still little-known land have these goods been brought on the backs of camels. A few months earlier I had watched long camel trains of Persian traders crossing the Nutcha desert, leisurely plodding the hot, sandy stretches with the goods of their country with which they thought to please other eyes. At Nizhny I was not tempted to buy any of these goods, for in my rooms in St. Petersburg I had enough table covers and hand-embroidered squares to supply a host of friends with souvenirs. I had picked them up in Tiflis, in Transcaucasia, during one of the pitched battles between the Armenians and Tartars. The Armenians had taken possession of a hill in the town just above the Persian quarter, and began firing upon the Tartars whose quarters adjoined the Persians. The Tartars returned the fire smartly, but as neither of these nationalities are notoriously good shots, the innocent Persians, who unluckily were between the two camps, were the chief sufferers. When the Russian troops came up, they fired indiscriminately upon the Armenians and Tartars, likewise upon the Persians, who could not be distinguished. The result of the melee was the almost complete demolition of the Persian quarter. These unhappy merchants and traders started in panic for their native country, and those who had managed to save any of their goods at all were glad enough to sell them in quantities for a song. But even at Nizhny, these Persian stuffs are inexpensive. I saw groups of admiring muzhiks, clad in what someone has called their national costume of rags, venturing to invest a hard-earned rouble in a gaudy table cover. Interesting as are the bazaars, with all their varied displays, the crowds of patrons were surpassingly fascinating. Beautiful Tartar women, with faces half-veiled lest the eyes of a strange man should rest upon them. Mohammedan Mullah, in silken robes of many colours, like little Joseph's, with snowy turbans wound round their shaved heads, setting into bold contrast the polished olive skins of their faces. Peasants in shoals who stare and stare, housewives who question and price a thousand things, and sometimes risk a purchase. It was with a feeling of refreshment, and no little regret, that I boarded a vulgar flat-bottomed steamer to proceed on my journey to Kazan. Kazan has long been a troubled government. The nearer one approached to the famine belt, the stronger were the sentiments of insurrection. So complete was the failure of crops in some counties of Kazan this year, that the harvest would not suffice for a single month. The estimated amount of government relief needed for Kazan government for that year alone was 32 million rubles, $16 million, a sum so vast that it was already known that the central government, as usual in straited circumstances, would be obliged to cut it down so largely that the appalling suffering was inevitable. Taking a small boat that, for a few months each year, plies up and down a tributary of the Volga, I made a three days journey into the interior of this province, stopping for part of a day with a well-known Kazan landlord, a marshal of nobility, Prince Uktomsky. The monarchy has no more loyal supporter than Prince Uktomsky, but when I asked him the attitude of his peasants toward the emperor, he regretfully confessed that their disillusionment had gone so far that there was no hope of the present Tsar ever regaining their confidence. The defeats in the East completely shattered their faith, he said. As for the Duma, he was reluctant to admit that its dissolution had influenced them, but when I talked with the peasants at work on his estates, I found that their silence was deep with foreboding, and their looks were sinister. The next Duma will contain many more peasants, he said because the constitutional democrats have discredited themselves. The peasants will not trust them again, neither will they boycott the elections. The peasants with whom I talked supported this view. The Weiborg Manifesto failed utterly to impress them, 
and since the constitutional democrats were in the majority in the late Duma, and yet failed to help them in their plight, they will try to return only peasants to the next Duma. News of the assassination of General Mim, of evil memory, and the bomb incident in Monsieur Stolypin's house in St. Petersburg, had not yet penetrated to the remote villages of this province, although both events had happened nearly a week before. In one of the villages I handed a newspaper containing an account of both incidents to one of a picturesque group to read aloud. Had there been any lingering doubt in my mind as to the revolutionary spirit of these people, it would have disappeared in this moment. Details of the bomb affair were listened to with breathless interest, but when it was learned that Monsieur Stolypin was uninjured, there were expressions of chagrin, of disappointment and regret. "'What? Do you approve of these terroristic acts?' I exclaimed. A silence fell over the company, until a young peasant with a frank and rather striking face answered, "'Yes, we believe in the killing of ministers. They are bad men. They are our oppressors. It is good that they should die.' For a peasant this was very advanced thinking." I left Prince Utomsky's towards the end of a summer afternoon for the estate of Professor Vasiliev, some five hours' journey away. Three hours after leaving the Utomsky estate, we passed a certain convent. My peasant driver was very insisted that I and my interpreter should pass the night here. "'But how is that possible?' I exclaimed. "'If it is a convent, surely men may not tarry here overnight?' May God forgive me, replied the horseman, but in many months the sisters have had no opportunity to welcome such handsome travellers as you. If you will only stop here, you will be received like great men. When my interpreter further questioned the fellow, he told me a tale that recalled Boccaccio and the Florentines of the Middle Ages, which I was assured was truly Russian. Two hours later we passed Professor Vasiliev's gates, Dogs greeted our arrival, and the professor himself raised a window to call out in Russian, "'Who's there? What is it?' "'Good evening, professor,' I answered in English. "'You do speak English, do you not?' "'English. Yes, I do. But who are you?' "'An American,' I replied. "'Impossible!' exclaimed the good man. "'But come in. Whoever you are, you're heartily welcome.' And heartily welcome we were made. Not only the professor, but his delightful wife and his charming oldest son and daughter all spoke perfect English, and their cordiality was beyond anything I had anticipated. We talked until past midnight, and then a room was prepared for my interpreter and myself. I chanced to have with me a copy of Professor Paul Milyakov's admirable book, Russia and its Crisis, being lectures delivered at the University of Chicago, Professor Vasiliev and his son were overjoyed at this, and begged me to let them have it overnight. Milyokov himself may not have a copy, they told me. It is a forbidden book in Russia. Next morning they told me that they had both read it through the night while we slept, and returned it with profuse gratitude. Professor Vasiliev conducted me over his estate, and afforded me opportunities for conversations with many peasants and everywhere I found my earlier impressions confirmed. The peasants had advanced by leaps and bounds within a few months, and in the words of the professor, Kazan was then ripe for insurrection, if only the firebrand were applied with the assurance that neighbouring provinces were rising also. Professor Vasiliev was a staunch liberal, a constitutional democratic deputy to the First Duma, and a hereditary landowner, Yet he looked upon the expropriation of land in Russia not only as desirable, but as presently inevitable. At the same time, I am a monarchist, he added. But, though a monarchist, I must say that the blunders of the present monarch have damaged him forever with the peasants. The war shook their belief in him. His treatment of the Duma added to their scepticism, and the sending of the Duma away was the final blow. As for the expropriation of land in Russia, continued the professor, I believe in the principle, and I shall be glad when my lands are taken, with the rest. I would leave to the proprietors only their house gardens. 
When the man who has much to lose is willing to lose all for the good of his neighbours, then, indeed, is the spirit of true citizenship met in its purest form. These visits to Prince Uktomsky and Professor Vasiliev and the conversations with their peasants went to confirm the impressions gathered in Kostroma and Nizhny Novgorod. The peasantry no longer cherished dreams of autocratic infallibility. The idea of revolution had gained strong headway, especially since the Duma. An idea cannot be held back by Cossacks, by rapid-firing guns, by bayonets, or by the legalised lawlessness which is screened by so-called martial law. The government, through its fatuous policy of oppression and reaction, had now awakened the sympathies of practically all of its people to revolution. Active revolutionists in any country are in a seeming minority up to the crisis. When the wave of success attains formidability, the ranks of the then new regime suddenly become filled and solidified. The present government, partly owing to the financial support it receives from the peoples of England, France, Austria and other countries, still maintains a show of strength. But examination reveals the obvious condition. Strength merely to demoralise the ranks of the revolution, while lacking the strength to rule or to administer. The next province I went to was to Simbursk, the next province below Kazan on the Volga. Mountain of the Winds was the name given to Simbursk city by early Volgaside dwellers. Plain of the Whirlwind might Simbursk government well be called at the time I passed through. Conservatism would scarcely be expected among the constituents of Aladin, that daring outspoken Labour group leader in the Duma. Revolutionary, as he was called by people who heard his impassioned speeches. But the Honourable Maurice Baring, after listening to him many times, recalled the words spoken by Mirabeau of Robespierre. That young man will go far. He believes every word he says. Of Aladin's beliefs I knew nothing at the time, for this was all before his visit to America, where, together with Tchaikovsky, the father of the Russian Revolution, he did more, perhaps, than any Russian has ever done to arouse the American people to Russia's wrongs. Of the man I knew little, only this. The peasants trusted him, and in as large degree as the constitutional Democrats had lost the confidence of the peasants, Aladin and the toil group had won it. This was not because of Aladin, however, but because the peasants were now unequivocally and avowedly revolutionary, and they trusted the man who dared shake his fist at ministers, hiss them, and shout loudly for their demission, and who had publicly referred to the peasants as men, not as children, whose championship of the men in sheepskin had been neither apologetic nor patronising. Simbursk is an illiterate government, Five-sixths of the population cannot read or write. It is hard indeed for an English mind to conceive the status of education in a country of pretending standing as we find it in Simbursk. The government, Zemstovo, school appropriation averages ten kopecks, five cents, per head annually. Only nine-tenths of one per cent of the men and five-tenths of one per cent of the women receive more than a primary school education while only four in a thousand ever finish the gymnasia, high school, and four in ten thousand reach the universities. In spite of these tremendous handicaps, it is patent to the most careless traveller through these parts that in a simple, direct way, the people know what they want. We want a Duma that we can trust, and that shall be the highest power over us, said a middle-aged peasant to me as he paused in his work in the fields. Were you satisfied with the Duma you had? The Duma was all right, but the ministers were bad, and it was wrong of the emperor to send it away. The way in which the constitutional democrats had dropped out of sight since issuing the Vyborg Manifesto had told strongly against them. Prince Baratiev, a constitutional democrat, a Simbursk deputy to the Duma, told me frankly, Formerly, the Constitutional Democratic Party enjoyed the confidence of the peasants of this government, but since the dissolution, I think they have moved more to the left. During the course of this journey, I searched diligently for conservative peasants, peasants who still believed in God and the Tsar as of old, 
but the peasants themselves were always the first to say, Before the Duma we thought differently. It was a Simbursk peasant, however, in a village twenty miles inland from the Volga, who said, We had always believed in the Tsar as our emperor, by divine authority, but now we see that if we put a crown on a hitching post and call it Tsar by divine authority, it is the same. About this time the government announced that it was prepared to alleviate the agrarian stress by placing certain appanage, or crown, lands at the disposal of the peasants for a consideration. How do you feel in regard to the emperor's latest step in putting the appanage lands at the disposition of the peasants through the peasants' bank? I asked a group of six peasants whom I was questioning in Simbirsk. A chorus of derisive exclamations immediately followed. We believe no more in anything that comes from the government or even the emperor. We have had too many pieces of worthless paper read to us. It may sound good now, but in the end it will not be for our good. As a matter of fact, if all of the appanage lands of Simbirsk government were distributed among the peasants of that district, the allotments would average only one-eightieth of an acre per capita. Furthermore, a large part of the 480,000 acres, the aggregate amount of imperial lands within the government, are wooded and consequently unavailable for immediate agricultural purposes. It may be explained that the appanage lands are lands set apart for the support of members of the imperial family. How did you hear of this imperial proposition so soon? I inquired, knowing that so remain a village could not yet have received the newspapers. It was read out in the church on Sunday, they answered. Then the priests must believe in it. That is why we don't, they went on. The priests are black hundred, and we believe no more in them. What do you believe in? I asked. We believe in a Duma for the people, a Duma without ministers who work against our interests. Simbirsk was another famine district. Even for an agricultural district in Russia, it was terribly poor. 24% of the population had no horses at all, and 40% had only one horse per household. This year the crop failure was the worst in two generations. It was estimated that $5 million would be needed for food for the peasants alone, and many millions more for the starving cattle and horses, and for seeds for next year's harvest. The peasants looked forward to the illimitable suffering of starvation through the long months of the Russian winter, knowing full well the crying needs which shall soon beset them, and that without money the government will find it impossible to alleviate these needs, one peasant said to me in the presence of the group, You wonder, perhaps, why we take strangers into our houses this way and tell them everything as we are talking to you? I have usually found the peasants frank and friendly, I replied, at the same time, I should be glad to know why you are so free with me. Because, said the speaker, you come from another country, and it is in other countries that the Russian government borrows money. We think that if the people of other countries only understood how hard our position is, they would not help the government to put us down. This was not the first peasant who had brought up the question of foreign loans to Russia. Nor was this the first time I had failed in attempting to explain to the Muzhik why foreign loans are possible. In Kostroma, at the very outset of this journey, I had met with the same thing, and there, as here, failed in my attempt to explain the theory of foreign loans. To the peasant, the only principle involved was that of oppression. Every ruble loaned to the Russian government was another lash across the back of a struggling, starving peasant. No other issue loomed before their eyes. Withal, the kindliness of their attitude always amazed me. To the ignorance of the people of England, of France and of Austria do the peasants ascribe their willingness to open their purses to the stained hand of tyranny. If the people of other countries only knew, they said, there was something inspirationally beautiful in the ingenuousness of sturdy men so simple, even Russian peasants, who still not only believed in the supremacy of plain morality, but who had no understanding of the business, the financial considerations which, in the workaday world we know, do supplant the innate ethics which make for right, for justice, and for fair play among men. 
At the beginning, I was startled when violent sentiments were expressed by peasants, but now I was accustomed to them. So recently such boldness would not have been possible, but now it was truly amazing. In each government I had visited on this trip, the same spirit prevailed, and similar utterances were freely heard. The territory I traversed was so great that all theory of this being the result of agitation was done away with. These were the spontaneous conclusions of the peasants, not only in widely different sections, but in all sections I passed through. At this point I became satisfied that, at last, the peasants were awake to their true situation. The Duma did it. Its propagandic influence was felt throughout Russia, and here were the fruits. The boast of the peasants that they would not wait for another Duma, that they would rise presently, was, of course, dependent upon circumstances. But whether conditions were propitious in the autumn of 1906, or the spring of 1907, or 1908, or some other year, makes no material difference in the ultimate outcome. A year or two, or a decade or two, is of small moment in the history of an empire. In the summer of 1906, it became clear that the Tsar had lost his peasants, and through his own faithlessness. At Simbursk, I entered the heart of the famine district, and from this point on, my attention was almost entirely claimed by the misery of the starving people, whose pitiable suffering I had to witness in utter helplessness, appalled by the magnitude of the crime. I call it crime because famine in Russia is preventable. The regime that persists in maintaining the present archaic economic system is responsible for all the pain, the epidemics of disease and the deaths which follow in the wake of the calamity we call famine. End of chapter 15, part 2《Section 24 of the Red Rain》The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Blakely The Red Rain — The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland Chapter 16 — Through the Hungry Country Samara province marks the heart of the hungry country, which includes all of the Volga provinces and most of the provinces of Great Russia. Samara is the most important of these provinces, owing to its situation. Samara city, the capital of the province, is the chief point on the railroad between Moscow and Siberia, and being also on the Volga, it has developed into a large shipping port. In good years, when harvests are plentiful, Samara throbs with life and activity. The volume of trade which it handles is enormous. Its connections extend to all parts of the world. But when famine smites the land, Samara seems to cower in unwonted insignificance. The busy air of prosperity grows clouded and dull, and the shadow that envelops the city is but a somber reflection of the awful reality, the blight of famine and starvation that has descended upon the country. There are big landlords in Samara province, as in neighboring Volga provinces, who work land for profit. Ordinarily, they ship immense quantities of grain to Europe. The raising of these crops gives employment to several hundred thousand peasants who come from other provinces for the sowing and the reaping, and who rely upon these earnings to help them through the winter. This summer, the peasants came into the agricultural district as usual, but they wandered weary miles east and north and south, only to be turned away from each place in disappointment and despair. Work there was none. The crop failure was almost absolute. The scanty returns yielded by the sun-baked earth could easily be gathered by local laborers whose own harvests were mere mockeries. And so these thousands of peasants who journeyed eastward in search of work were finally turned back towards their own provinces, empty-handed and hungry. They wandered back as tramps, penniless, broken, to face the winter under circumstances hardly better than that of those who stayed at home. In a country crossed by several large rivers, as in this hungry country, the Volga, the Don, the Kama, and many little streams, an irrigation system might easily be introduced. The proposition is a perfectly simple one from an engineer's point of view. The question is, who should undertake the work? The peasants cannot, the great landlords who are rich will not, and the government is too thoroughly honeycombed with corruption to ever consider a plan of this kind. 
That such a scheme must eventually be resorted to, there is no doubt. Under existing conditions, there is a partial famine in several of these provinces every year, while the whole area is annually exposed to such dreadful famine as marked the years 1892 and 1906. When I passed out of Simbirsk, I had covered one more stage of our journey down the Volga, before turning eastward across the country towards Ural and Siberia. This brought me to Samara. Ever since leaving Moscow, I had been chiefly interested in the peasants and their change of attitude since the Duma had come into existence. But in Samara, I could have thought for nothing save the famine. I had read of famines and thought I knew about what to expect in a starving land. But the depressing reality of the suffering, the heroic, despairing battles to prolong life even a little while had never before come so close to me. From the city of Samara, I made journeys in three directions, across the Volga and west, south, and east. In all of the starving villages I passed through, the same heartrending scenes were repeated. Food supplies absolutely exhausted, thatch being torn from the roofs to feed the horses and cattle, families doubling up, i.e. the occupants of one house moving over into a neighbor's in order to use the first house for fuel, relief kitchens so short of relief that only one meal in two days could be dispensed. During the 47 hours between meals, the people lay prostrate on their backs so as to conserve every particle of strength, parents deserting their children because they could not bear to watch them die. Why is this suffering visited upon thirty millions of people who are powerless to help themselves? Their oppressors are blessed with material prosperity. The very flour dispensed by the government is flagrantly adulterated in order that corrupt officials may glean a few thousand more rubles to spend on their dancing girls and French champagne. The Russian famine frauds have been sources of graft these many years, and members of the government as high up as the Assistant Minister of Interior implicated in the scandals. The morning I arrived from Simbirsk, the Samara newspapers published in prominent positions the following announcement. Whoever donates one ruble and a half, 75 cents, saves a man from starvation one month. A village priest in an outlying village wrote to a gentleman to whom I brought introductions. Our peasants are already reduced to one meager meal a day. Parents, overwhelmed by their misery, are abandoning their children and are going off that they may not see them die. Seven priests in joint conference in the district called Buzuluk appealed to the Red Cross Society. There is no bread for the people, nor fodder for the cattle. The peasants are picking over the hay they have gathered for their horses, little as it is, and are extracting for their own use spears of the grass called goosefoot in a few weeks even this will be gone. The famine relief workers were everywhere beside themselves with the enormity of the problem. Never in the history of Russia had the need been so great, and never had the relief been proportionately so little. Armored trains, machine guns, Cossacks, and soldiers, maintained on a war basis, had so strained the financial resources of the government that only the scrapings were left for the alleviation of the famine. The most powerful of nations would find it difficult to meet the exigencies of such a dire situation. Crippled Russia might well be overwhelmed by this seeming hopelessness of the task. Pressed to the verge of starvation, as these millions of peasants were, they were forced into making sacrifices of inestimable consequences. They were selling their plows, their wagons, their own labor for years ahead. They were submitting to obligations as arduous as serfdom. Six peasants, for example, in the village of Bogumo, borrowed fifty dollars from a local priest and in return gave him the use of six acres of land for sixteen years. Here and there, a prosperous priest, or a peasant who had money, loaned it to the starving peasants at rates of interest amounting to two hundred and three hundred per cent. I heard of four cases of three hundred per cent. All of the money which could be thus secured by the peasant went for immediate needs, no provision being made for seeds for the next year, and as the implements were nearly all being sold, it will be years before the peasants of the famine districts get back to even the deplorably miserable conditions of this year. The purchasers of the farm implements and the horses and cattle were the remnants of the old Asiatic nomad tribes, who through long centuries roamed over the lands where Europe and Asia merge. Generations ago, Samara was important as one of Russia's eastern frontier posts. At this point, the Asiatic invaders, the Tartars, the Bashkirs, the Kyrgyz, and the Kalmuks, were beaten back into the mysterious unknown lands which at intervals through centuries seemed veritably to vomit them forth. They came not as armies are advanced in ranks and regiments, but in hordes, helter-skelter, human beings in droves. Now all these swarthy peoples are nominally conquered, and the spirit of conquest is dead in them. 
They are content to live pastoral lives and eke out a living as they may. They are nearly all dark people, as illiterates are called in Russia, but they somehow manage to fare better than the Russian peasants. They suffer no irksome regulations. Their wandering life makes it easy for them to escape the burdens that the government would lay upon them, and so it comes that they are able to profit by the dire distress of the peasants. For a song they purchase what the peasant has sweated blood to acquire. The Tartars especially are ready purchasers of horses, for horse meat is their common diet. In the village of Tolkai, for example, I witnessed a sale of peasants' horses to Tartars that was memorable. Colts were sold for forty cents. A horse still able to work could be bought for five dollars. Horses showing signs of starvation went for two dollars and a half and three dollars. Two rather dilapidated horses went for four dollars and a quarter the pair. Having sold their horses, their cattle, their implements, having pulled the thatch from their roofs of their outhouses and homes, having burned even their own houses for fuel, all of these things having been acquired through years of toil, how many years must lapse before these peasants will regain the status of free and independent men? Where there is famine, sickness takes root and flourishes. Typhus, scurvy, and fowler diseases ravage starving villages, making yet more hideous the plight of the suffering people. The drinking water goes bad and becomes a great disease-spreading medium. Even smallpox sometimes attains the proportions of an epidemic. In house after house I visited were the frail little bodies of children faded to mere skin-coated skeletons upon whom the hand of death already rested. And save for the men and women who volunteer for service in the relief kitchens and who may be medical students or nurses, there is oftentimes no medical aid whatever for the sick and dying. One phase of hunger which I had not seen before was the swelling of the limbs before death, presenting an abnormally healthy appearance. The relief dining rooms were entirely inadequate to cope with the situation, so that in many places I found that meals were given only to the young and the very old, while the middle-aged men and women, that is to say the workers, were left to shift for themselves. The theory of this is that the strong ones can best endure suffering and hardship, but of course, this method is open to question since such a policy tends to weaken the only ones in the village who might serve the rest of the village with their labor. It is very like discriminating in favor of the unfit. At the relief stations, the feeding of the inhabitants begins at an early hour in the morning and continues through a greater part of the day, since the dining rooms are rarely large and sometimes 1,500, 2,000, or an even greater number must be fed during the days. There were three dining rooms in one village where I stayed overnight and every day upward of 1,500 meals were dispensed. The total population of the village was under 2,000. Without these meals, there would have been absolute literal starvation. From four to six months each year, these dining rooms were open, this being in the region of annual famine. When the paltry crops begin to ripen, the village becomes self-sustaining. It's a niggardly sustenance, but it keeps soul and body together. From their tiny parcels of land, and with their very primitive methods of agriculture, it is possible for the peasants to store enough food to last till the next harvest, those who can find employment in the summertime on the estates of the large landowners. The price of labor is appalling. In this village, from three to eight rubles a month, from one dollar and a half to four dollars a month. This means from twenty-four to twenty-six days of toil in the fields during long days, for in this northern land, summer nights are brief and summer days very long. It was nine o'clock in the morning when I visited the first of the three dining rooms. An ordinary village house had been renovated and fitted with tables and benches, and a small kitchen built in extension. The group who were eating when we entered suggested a Salvation Army Christmas dinner, ordinary musics with their wives and families, all poorly clad. The clothes they wore were largely made at home. The coats were of sheepskins, the wool worn inside, and the sun-cured skins out. The stockings and boots are of a kind of burlap, usually held to the feet and legs by cords. This footwear is common among both women and men. The meals provided were naturally of the simplest foodstuffs, vegetable soups, porridge, and black bread mostly. Each person received one meal a day, or in some districts, one meal in two days. The dishes and spoons were of wood, made by the peasants themselves. The average cost of these meals was from 43 to 45 rubles, $21 and a half to $22 and a half, per 1,000 meals, about two or three cents a meal. The young men and women who looked after this work were allowed seven dollars and a half a month, yet so simple is the life they lead that this was ample to defray all of their necessary expenses. It does not matter what one's private resources may be, in the midst of such extreme poverty, one's very appetite wanes and the sin of luxury and extravagance presents itself in a new light. 
In spite of the deplorable condition of the people living in the 27 famine provinces, and in spite of the marvelously long way a ruble will go in alleviating starvation, of charity in Russia there is little, save among the hungry peasants themselves. The starving are always ready to share their last half pound of bread with anyone else in distress. Nowhere in the world are Maurice Hewlett's lines truer than in the midst of Russia's hungry country. Only the poor love the poor. Only those who have little give to those who have less. The less poor gave their mites, and the government distributes the taxes gathered in provinces which are still able to pay and money borrowed from abroad, that some of the starving population may be supplied with scanty meals. The rich landlords in the midst of these districts seldom contribute anything to relieve the sufferings of their own peasants. Many of them live out of Russia altogether, some perhaps because they find the constant distress and unquiet disagreeable. The Grand Dukes and connections of the reigning house prefer Austin, Paris, and the Riviera to Russia. Abroad they escape the unpleasant sight of half a nation going hungry. The Emperor is one of the richest men in Europe, yet it is very rarely that he donates anything to charity so far as is known. The administration insists that it is endeavoring to solve the so-called land problem. And how? Large tracts of land belonging to the royal family were placed at the disposal of the peasants, for consideration. A certain amount of land was available in many governments for fifty and one hundred dollars, a desiatine. One prominent landowner proposed selling one million desiatines to the peasants at a rate of one hundred dollars per desiatine. One hundred dollars a desiatine? Peasants that were reduced to eating grass cut for their horses, buying land at $100 a desiatine is an obvious absurdity. And even if some of the peasants did venture to mortgage themselves to these great landowners for years to come by buying a small strip of land which they could not succeed in paying for in a lifetime, the land problem would still be no nearer solution than before. In several villages I learned of the comeliest daughters of the place being sold to traffickers and prostitutes who supply maids to dealers in Eastern European capitals. This selling of girls has often been misunderstood. I do not think that parents ever realize what they are doing, any more than the girls understand what they are being bound to. A man, or perhaps two men, comes to a remote village with offers of work for certain likely girls. A sum of money, which often seems very large to the starving peasants, is paid to the families in token of good faith, and the girls start away with the man or men, as they suppose to employment in some distant city. Thus unwittingly do parents sell their own children into bondage, and probably in few instances do they ever learn the tragic sequel. In the wake of famine is pain, disease, and death. The results reach down through years, and ever and always innocents are the victims. The more terrible part of it all, to me, is that the famine in Russia is largely unnecessary and preventable. There is land enough in the country for all of the people, if it were only differently divided and even a part of that which is now lying idle were placed at the disposal of the people who could and would cultivate it. There is water enough in Russia to defy any drought, if it were only conserved and guided through channels and ditches, where it would reach the now dry and parched dustyatines of starving peasants. But so long as the government persists in staving off this vital issue, famine will be recurrent. The attitude of the government toward this great question is perhaps more directly responsible for forcing the country toward civil war than any other one thing. The measures suggested thus far by the government do not relieve the situation materially. The only possible solution to this agrarian difficulty is to allow the peasants more land and to teach them intensive methods of farming. Hundreds of thousands of acres lie unused, untilled. The peasants cannot buy it, for they have nothing to buy with. They never will have anything to buy with until they get a wider opportunity to earn more and to produce more, which can only come with more land. Thousands of them are already bound, body and soul for years to come, to big landowners and usurers who are frequently the village priests. The land, in the fullness of time, must be given to them, and if the government will not consent to this, the Duma will expropriate it as the first Duma set out to do, and was speedily dissolved for the effort. If there is no Duma, as there will not be if Nicholas too has his way, then sooner or later the peasants will have to take the land, and that may well mean the French Revolution, or worse, over again. One Sunday I started for the western part of Samara province, taking with me a Russian-American for a traveling companion and interpreter. Just beyond the railroad station called Tokai, we left the train and started across the country, engaging a local Yamshik driver and a rough springless wagon. We had not traveled more than an hour before we were stopped by a village gendarme, who demanded our passports and letters of permission to travel there. We really had an imposing array of credentials, but none of them seemed to impress our captor. 
Finally, I produced a letter written and signed by Prime Minister Stolipin. This extraordinary high chief of gendarme of the village stared blankly at the letter and said, Stolipin? Stolipin? Who is he? Turning away from us for a moment, he signaled up the street, and six other gendarmes appeared, to whom the first man addressed himself as follows. These strangers are Americans. They have an apparatus, my camera, for making drawings of our district. They are important prisoners, so we must take good care they do not get away. My friend and I argued long and loud to convince the men that in the first place we were not agents of the United States government, and secondly, that the United States was not contemplating an invasion of Russia at that point. But all was to no avail. We were carried off to the gendarmerie, and duly given a restful room all to ourselves. Two gendarmes were left to guard us. My companion was a timid soul who gloomily predicted a tragic and ignoble end for us. So largely to cheer him, I tried to gain the goodwill of our guards. I made a surprisingly good start in that direction when I gave each a little money for vodka, for it immediately developed that they were so appreciative of this generosity that they were not unwilling we should make our escape. Our driver was still lingering about outside the gendarmerie, trying to make out what was to become of us, and who was to remunerate him for the miles he had already brought us. Suddenly, deciding to be bold, we opened the door of the room where we had been put and walked out. It was the easiest thing in the world. As we drove off, our two guards raised their vodka bottles in token of their regards. We calmly continued our journey. Seven versts farther on, we came upon a peasant fair where many starving peasants were auctioning off their horses and cattle for whatever they would bring. The buyers were nearly all tartars. I got out my camera to photograph a particularly dilapidated horse, fairly tottering from hunger being sold for its meat, what there was left of it, to a swarthy Muslim, when a party of mounted police suddenly surrounded us, and we were again put under arrest. They carried us to the headquarters of the local priestoff, who examined us at a great length, and finally sent us under armed escort to the very gendarmerie we had cleared out of an hour before. This time our guards were not so easily won over. We were detained there till afternoon, and there seemed to be some doubt as to what disposition should be made of us. At first we were informed that we would be sent back to the city of Samara, where the governor would determine our fate. Later, however, we were carried to the railroad station, and told that we might have the freedom of the waiting room but not to step outside pending the arrival of our train. No train came until three o'clock the next morning, and then it was a train from Samara. Into this we were bundled and informed that we might go wherever we pleased after the train had passed the boundary of that province. The adjoining province was upon the slopes of the lower Ural Mountains, so I gave that as our destination. As a matter of fact, this was our direction anyway. So the only result of the incidents of the day was that I was slightly hurried on my journey towards Siberia. We left the train at Ufa, the capital of the province of Ufa. End of chapter 16 Recording by Beth Blakely Section 25 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia, by Kellogg Durland. Chapter 17. In the Land of Lost Leaders. Part 1 ufa held little to interest me so that after only a brief pause i continued my journey east to chiliabinsk the western terminal of the trans-siberian railway it had not originally been my intention to traverse siberia european russia i did want to cover thoroughly but when i found myself here on the edge of asia within a night's ride of the land of lost leaders I felt justified in making an excursion far enough over the border to bring me to the nearest places of exile, where I could meet and talk with men and women whom Russia had expelled. Instead of pursuing the line of the Trans-Siberian Road, however, I decided to follow the old route used by exiles in the days when no railroad penetrated even to the borders of Siberia. To reach this port, it was necessary for me to go north from Chelyabinsk, along the ridge of the Ural Mountains, and down into Yekaterinburg, a famous mining center, and the starting point of a short railroad line running to Tumin, the most northerly point reached by railroad in Siberia. From Chelyabinsk to Yekaterinburg was one long day's journey. Autumn was already descending upon the land, and the trees were tossing their dried and brown leaves over the steep slopes of the hills into the valleys below, 
where a lingering green still carpeted the earth from yekaterinburg to tumin is a night's journey when the first light of dawn creeps into the car window and one realizes that day will presently reveal the melancholy wastes of the dreariest country on earth a little of the meaning of that sinister name siberia possesses one and the desolate miles of waste and marsh country seem to hold a weird fascination the same train that brought me to tumin carried a party of exiles in the prison car ahead a car iron-clad with small square windows to receive the light windows crossed by iron bars at the station i watched the gendarmes forming their charges into line preparatory to the first stage of their long walk most of these prisoners were strikingly ill-clad for a siberian expedition several had no hats while only one or two had overcoats a representative of the revolutionary red cross society himself an exile was on hand to make note of these things of him i inquired the reason why these prisoners were so inadequately clothed he laughed at my ingenuousness and told me that recently a party of fifty had come in most of whom were clad in their underclothes with an old army coat over for decency's sake sometimes men are arrested in the dead of night torn from their beds without time to dress but often it happens that a man will sit for months in a local prison and then suddenly one night he will be hurried from his cell to join the party about to start for siberia there is no time to dress nor to collect his possessions the worst feature of this treatment is that the government usually makes no ultimate effort to make good this loss therefore the exiles have been obliged to organize a relief committee among themselves with underground connections with the outside world to make provisions for the neglected and ill-clad newcomers whom the government so mercilessly deserts upon their arrival in this region of long winter and incredible cold the exile whom we found taking notes of the needs of arriving prisoners was immeasurably delighted when we spoke to him his home was one of the university cities of south russia where he had been the editor of a local newspaper because of something he had written the wrath of the governor of the province was brought down upon him and he had been exiled to siberia for five years at the beginning he was sent to a settlement several hundred miles to the north but through influential friends in st petersburg he had been given permission to return to tumin which is a distinctly more habitable place than a remote settlement of half-civilized ostiaks he invited us to visit him in his lodgings and promised to introduce us to several other political exiles who were living in so-called free exile in tumin and to supply us with letters of introduction to various people that would be helpful to us in tobolsk when later in the day we climbed to his attic room i was struck by the atmosphere of refinement that was somehow conveyed in the simple furnishings of the room and the few books neatly arranged on a crudely fashioned table free exile is allowed only to certain privileged exiles and mostly to those against whom there are only trivial charges or undefined suspicions when we arrived our friend was composing a letter presently to be forwarded to st petersburg detailing the pressing needs of the revolutionary red cross committee in reply to questions i asked he told us how the revolutionary red cross society has its committee in every village settlement and hamlet where exiles are sent in russia and abroad its agents are always actively collecting money for food for the starving and clothing for the needy he cited many instances of the heroic sacrifices of men and women of smallest resources sharing their little with their comrades in distress in siberia exiles who have well-to-do families and friends receive contributions but these are almost invariably shared with those who have no such resources were it not for this work of the revolutionary red cross society the suffering in siberia would be infinitely greater than it is and the number of deaths from starvation would be appalling while waiting for one or two others to join us he gave me a little sketch of siberian exile history and life siberia began to be used by russia as a place of exile about three hundred years ago 
but at that time very cruel and terrible punishments were meted out to civil as well as political offenders the bodies of men were frequently mutilated their limbs amputated and hideous tortures applied that left lasting scars in order to dispose of these maimed and now worthless creatures they were dumped into this remote region of northeastern asia which was at that time a recently acquired possession a hundred years later that is just before the beginning of the eighteenth century bodily mutilation was officially abolished and simple banishment was introduced on a large scale exile soon came to be the usual punishment for a long list of crimes covering practically the whole criminal list men were exiled on every conceivable pretext or merely to get rid of them about this time the mineral resources of the country began to be known and the government conceived the idea of utilizing the labor of exiles for developing these resources this policy continues in force today from time to time the exile system has sunk into such a condition of disorganization and barbarity that the escape of death was sought by scores and hundreds pestilential prisons incredibly crowded were allowed to become fairly putrid with filth while the men and women confined in them grew foul with disease or lost their senses through suffering six years ago the czar by imperial ukase ended the banishment of political prisoners to siberia but you see how it is this edict like most of the imperial decrees that go out from our emperor and his government was meaningless a flood of politicals pours through tumin all of the time now and most people have forgotten that that edict was ever issued cruelties like those of former times are not employed now that is to say prisoners are not mutilated although they are sometimes beaten and roughly handled and while the prisons are still foul and bad they are not as they were even a generation ago what the government does now is to desert its political prisoners to inevitable starvation and to force many of them into intimate daily contact with loathsome diseases in the settlements of diseased savages in the interior i was soon to learn the full truth of these statements from other lips but i listened to this man's story with keenest interest it appears that there are two classes of political prisoners the so-called privileged and unprivileged exiles the privileged grade includes the graduates of all technical schools and universities all noblemen and the sons and daughters of noblemen the unprivileged are all others peasants merchants workmen clerks and the rest of the rank and file the government allows each privileged exile three dollars a month out of which he must rent a room or sleeping place of some description pay for his food clothing and all other necessities if the wife of a privileged exile accompanies her husband into exile she also is granted six roubles or three dollars and one dollar and a half for each child but at the present time eighty five per cent of the political exiles in western siberia are of the unprivileged class and these the government allows one rouble and a half or seventy five cents a month it seems almost unthinkable that a government which aspires to greatness would turn adrift living men and expect them to live for years on an allowance of seventy five cents a month sometimes exiles arrive unknown to the red cross society and then there happens to them what would happen to nearly all unprivileged exiles if the government's dole were not supplemented they starve at this point a bright-faced buoyant man of about thirty-five entered the room and shook hands with us with great warmth he soon told his story he came from the town of yaroslav on the upper volga by trade he was a carpenter last spring the workmen of yaroslav decided to keep may day the european labor day by what they called a peaceful celebration they would not only refrain from work they would remain indoors all day on the eve of may day the governor caused to be issued a proclamation warning all the inhabitants of the province that any one who celebrated labor day in any way whatsoever would be punished 
the Yaroslav workmen decided to take the chance they remained in their respective homes all day merely absenting themselves from work the next morning every man who had thus celebrated was placed under arrest the man whom i met here in tumin had been sentenced to three years of exile in siberia for this offence the man had brought with him his wife and five children as voluntary exiles during the first three days after their arrival in tumin they had no money and somehow had failed to connect with the red cross committee in consequence of which they literally starved the man told me that he had not one piece of bread for his children the youngest of whom cried constantly through hunger for many years the government made a slightly better allowance to exiles for food than now when mr george kennan was in tumin for example the cost of food for each prisoner in the forwarding prison was three and a half cents a day and for privileged prisoners five cents a day the impossibility of living on seventy-five cents a month the current allowance is patent on the face of it living is very high in siberia all foods are costly for example the government allowance of bread for soldiers is thirty pounds a month now thirty pounds of bread cost ninety cents sugar criminally high all over russia is twelve cents a pound in siberia ordinary meat is practically unobtainable at any price in the remoter places all vegetables save potatoes are unknown the character of the soil in the northern provinces is such that no vegetables will grow potatoes being scarce are thirty cents a pail i do not wish to sustain the popular impression that siberia lies entirely within the region of arctic cold and barrenness for it reaches as far south as the latitude of central and southern italy greece and constantinople but political exiles at the time of my visit to siberia were being sent rather to the northern and desolate parts of tobolsk province to yakutsk and the transbaikal region space forbids that i recount the vivid hours spent in tumin of interesting conversations i enjoyed with cultivated men and women who had been sent off to this distant asiatic province to end their efforts to do something worth while for their long-suffering fellow-countrymen after three days i started for tobolsk the capital of this western province where i anticipated planning a tour of a few hundred miles to outlying settlements used for penal colonization the great siberian tract or imperial highway begins at tumen and runs across the eternal desolateness of interior siberia to the amur river a distance of more than three thousand miles along this ancient road beaten hard by sore and bleeding feet moistened by myriad tears more than one million exiles trudged between the reigns of nicholas i and nicholas the second when exiles arrive in tumin they are thrown into the waiting prison until a sufficient number have arrived to make up a party for the interior they are then corralled like so many cattle formed into loose marching order surrounded by cossacks or regular troops and marched over the weary way they tramp thirty versts a day for two days and rest the third day rough russian carts called telegas usually drawn by one horse accompany each party to carry the luggage and provisions and sometimes sick or exhausted marchers at this rate of going through summer heat and winter cold many months are consumed in reaching the destinations to which the exiles have been assigned during the short summer season when the waterways are open convict barges carry some of the parties as far as possible along the rivers of the tobol the irtish and the obi in order to get a taste of siberian water travel i decided to go by boat to tobolsk and from there on and indeed back to tumin by the usual post roads the little steamer that carried us from the chief city to the capital of the province was filled with soldiers and tartar merchants returning from nizhny novgorod each spring the tartars travel from their northern homes with winter pelts ermines sables silver foxes up the siberian rivers to tumin 
then by rail over the ural mountains to perm and down the kama to the volga then up to nizhny novgorod the amount of commerce on the river surprised me greatly we met many boats heavily freighted plying between omsk tobolsk and tumen and there was every appearance of a large volume of trade passing over these waterways the quays and landing places were very crude in fact there were no regular docks at all at intervals a single post had been driven into the mud usually within a reasonable distance of some settlement or village which seemed rarely to be close to the stream and around this post the steamer's hawser would be made secure while a long gangplank would be extended to the muddy bank over perhaps ten or even twenty feet of water the steamer engines burned wood every few hours we would make fast to the bank near to a pile of cordwood which the native tartars constantly replenish and practically the entire crew and sometimes some of the passengers would act as stevedores bringing it aboard the settlements we passed were mostly of tartars the women would offer for sale milk fish and raw turnips the latter sweet and tasty though hard and very cheap two and three for a cent toward nightfall we would pass fishermen in crude boats that were often merely dugouts logs hollowed and roughly shaped on the whole the civilization of these shores was as crude as any frontier country could be and the dirty dilapidated hamlets we could see in the distance from the steamer decks suggested only decay and stagnation even the sombre wooden moslem houses of worship with their gilded or painted crescents looked faded and forgotten rarely reflecting any of the garishness which characterizes the temples of mohammed relics of a dead civilization are all that remain to these people who once boasted a powerful empire with glory as well as power end of chapter seventeen part one section twenty six of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg durland chapter seventeen in the land of lost leaders part two Tobolsk proved a business-like town of something over twenty thousand inhabitants. It commands an excellent location on the river Urtish, facing the junction of the Tobol. On a high bluff to the west of the town proper is a striking monument to Yermak, the conqueror of Siberia. Behind this monument is a small but tremendously interesting museum. It contains large collections of old instruments of torture branding tools used to stamp the foreheads and cheeks of prisoners instruments for pulling out the centre bone of the nose painful shackles and other horrible devices for human torture besides these things are splendid collections epitomizing the ethnology of western siberia through costumes and excellent models of the industries of the natives the ornithology geology and mineralogy of the country are also indicated through complete collections there is one good hotel in tobolsk but when we arrived it was entirely filled with officers and we were obliged to put up at a small and dilapidated inn kept by a pole the man's father had been sent to siberia with the polish revolutionists of the early fifties this man was born in siberia and had never been out of the country he had married there and had children born to him so that he had virtually become a siberian one of the letters of introduction given to me in tumin was to a young woman whom i had been particularly told to seek out first for reasons i did not question i was to find her through a mutual friend of hers and the writer of my letter of introduction the morning after our arrival in tobolsk my interpreter and i called at the house of the friend who accepted the password we had been instructed in as evidence of our trustworthiness she bade us enter and wait in an inner room while she sent out for the girl whom we wanted to see more than half an hour passed before the girl arrived when she came in i was greatly surprised by her appearance 
she did not look more than twenty and she was gowned as any woman might be of a morning in any fashionable resort in the season her manner and bearing suggested mayfair drawing-rooms my first thought was that she must be the daughter of an aristocratic family who had been exiled but i remembered that the remark had been passed that she was not a prisoner she was graciously glad to see us and told us we were most fortunate in having come to debolsk just at that time because there were many political exiles in town from all over the province even from Birazov, a thousand versts to the north it appeared that every autumn just before the rivers closed in for the winter delegates of one or two free exiles from each settlement were appointed to go to tobolsk to purchase the winter's supply of matches candles pins and other little things for once the winter sets in it is often many months before a courier can get through even with mail the girl told us to come to a certain house in a neighboring street that evening and she would have there to meet us a number of the delegates from different parts of the province the house she designated was one belonging to a physician who had been exiled from an eastern russian city for twelve years by order of the local governor he had never been able to learn what charge there was against him and as he was a constitutional democrat and opposed to revolutionary activity he found his exile particularly exasperating however he had brought his wife and children with him and was striving to make the best of his situation he welcomed us with the utmost cordiality when at the appointed hour we repaired to his house it was seldom that exiles have such direct communication with the outside world as we afforded one of the greatest hardships of exile life to educated men and women is the life of enforced idleness that they must lead hard labor indeed for politicals is usually interpreted in forced idleness for an educated and disciplined mind emptiness and absolute lack of occupation is the most cruel strain the result is that politicals often beg local authorities to permit them to go to work in the mines merely that they might have occupation this physician told me that previous to my coming some poor people had come to him to give them relief from pain they were suffering from a certain curable cause the doctor gave them some simple remedy and sent them away a day or two after he received a reprimand from a police authority he was there as an exile not as a professional man and he was not expected to use his professional knowledge the man protested that he had done very little yet it had relieved the poor peasants and inasmuch as the government made no provision for healing the sick he could not understand why he should not do what he could but the government does provide physicians was the officer's reply the physician then asked me to wait until others of the exiles came in when the Birazov man reported that the single Birazov doctor, for example, has a territory almost as large as the whole of France. Others told me that in the central and southern sections of Tobolsk province, physicians have districts which are defined as a radius of 500 versts of a given point. In winter, the only means of communication is by sledge fancy a new york physician who had one patient in atlantic city another in lennox and a third in utica and no way of getting from point to point than by horse or a boston practitioner with a call to make in pawtucket and a patient to be operated upon in bangor a delegate from a village called filinski gave me a photograph of the funeral of a political exile who died through the sheerest most wanton neglect he had a bad tooth which developed an abscess there was no one about who knew how to lance it or that it should be lanced and blood poisoning set in causing his death one by one the exiles began to gather to me it was a remarkable group there was a civil engineer who had formerly been the district manager of one of the baltic provinces railroads now exiled to the far north then there was a mining engineer from great russia the physician from perm in the urals a jewish student from odessa a peasant from saratov 
who still bore the fresh bruises and mutilations of the police who tortured him a harkoff editor a st petersburg schoolteacher and an intellectual peasant from moscow province this man a follower of robert owen could not get over his surprise at being greeted by a correspondent in siberia when we fought on the barricades in moscow he said correspondents came to see us when we had our peasants union congress in moscow correspondents were there and now in siberia a correspondent visits us he shook his head in deep wonderment later he showed me a russian english book which he had procured somehow and from which he hoped to learn english during the years of his exile around a steaming samovar we sat until far into the night that little group and i they relating to me the stories of their lives the conditions of their exiles and i telling them of what the world is doing the world of which they were once a part but which now seems as remote as another planet this world which they have lost some of them spoke english nearly all of them knew french or german they were strong men all men of great hopes of nobler thought and life than banishment and suffering can destroy the first matter i inquired about particularly was the prevalence of disease in the villages to which exiles are assigned i was already satisfied in regard to the inevitableness of starvation a report from a certain village five hundred versts from tobolsk had recently reached russia asserting that the number of houses in the village which were infected with a certain loathsome disease was so great that the exiles could not escape close daily contact with it this was an ostiak village and the disease had evidently been rooted there many years for the report stated that the noses and lips of many of the inhabitants were entirely eaten away i had already seen some dreadful cases so i was not unprepared to learn that this report which was signed by fifty political exiles was not exaggerated one of the group round our friendly samovar was an exile from the village of filinsky he told me that a careful investigation had just been made and of the fifty houses composing filinsky village forty-eight were infected with this disease and yet twelve politicals were assigned to this village a government physician stated that in his district ovat point there were eighty-two villages and over sixty per cent of all the houses in all of the villages were similarly infected there is another very common disease found in these northern villages it is a stomach ailment which poisons the blood it results from eating bad fish the query naturally presents itself why do people eat fish that have gone bad the explanation is plausible the northern summers are short and the winters excessively long the winters are also exceedingly severe and during weeks at a time the people may not stir out of doors it is necessary therefore for them to lay by what stores they can during the summer against the winter when they may not shoot or trap so the fish caught during the warm season are preserved according to a simple and crude method they are partially sun-dried then roughly salted the sun-baking decays them slightly and the salt preserves them in practically that condition ordinarily dried fish are preserved with a specially prepared salt often containing a dash of sulphur which prevents this slight decay but these crudely prepared and partly decayed fish are said to be not untasty once one is accustomed to the diet only the ultimate effects are disastrous however it is the best the people can do and so they depend largely on these fish during the winter scurvy is very common throughout the region of course the scurvy in advanced forms is one of the most nauseating of human diseases to look upon but throughout siberia as throughout the famine region there is no escaping it the political exiles in the town of birazov had prepared a telegram to the duma setting forth their plight this telegram was to have been carried from birazov to the nearest telegraph line one thousand versts away 
by the very messenger who brought the news of the dissolution a copy of the telegram was preserved however and given to me the text proved incontrovertibly that exile to a siberian village at the government allowance is equivalent to banishment to starvation to live upon the government grant would mean subsisting each day on one twelfth of a pound of meat local meat deer or bear etc one half pound of bread one half of one piece of sugar and eight potatoes there would then be left eleven cents a month for lodging and six cents a month for all exigencies and such luxuries as candles matches and clothing as a matter of fact it is difficult to find a room in any kind of a house for less than one dollar a month unless one sleeps with native ostiacs and the great crime of siberia is that political exiles are obliged to do this even when the ostiacs are foul with disease when i had asked as many questions as i cared to the conversation shifted to world interests and we might have been a group in any london or new york club how the sane men who make up a government can persuade themselves that it is the policy of wisdom to banish educated intelligent men like those whom i met in tobolsk is past finding out it would seem that in russia's time of great need that these were the very ones who were most needed in active effort of reconstruction it was far into the night when we separated and then it was with mutual reluctance that we said good night to me the evening had been one of intensest interest and most genuine inspiration and they too had appreciated the breath from west of the urals my companion and i walked home with our friend the girl who had brought together this little gathering for us she talked vivaciously of the work in siberia and i wondered more than ever about her when she stopped at her own front door it proved to be before one of the few big houses in the town this again increased my curiosity concerning her oh she is probably a schoolteacher suggested my interpreter but school-teachers in Siberia are not apt to wear Paris-made gowns and live in one of the grandest houses in town, I answered. The next day I asked our physician about her, and he replied, She is the daughter of one of the governor's staff. She was educated abroad. Most of her family live abroad. She chooses to accompany her father here because of the opportunities she has for service in the movement her father is in the interior now so she has unusual liberties i really might have guessed that her situation was something of this nature during the next few days i saw so many exiles in and about tobolsk that i gave up the idea of visiting outlying settlements since i had neither the credentials nor the time for visiting the prisons i only hoped and desired to talk with a fair number of exiles and hear their story of the conditions of political exile under the constitution this i was able to accomplish right here one house of special interest in tobolsk that all the politicals pointed out was a kind of community house built by the decembrists of eighteen twenty five who were sent to tobolsk during my stay here i met at least two men who had been exiled in eighteen seventy eight they had both met mr kenman when he was in siberia in eighteen eighty five and asked me to carry their greetings to him and to tell him that they were still there one man kosturin has made his lot more bearable by editing a newspaper or rather his wife edits and conducts the paper officially the season was now advanced snow flurries were daily in the air and there was a winter crisp in the trees that heralded the near approach of the icy storms that closed siberia through long months at four o'clock one morning we left tobolsk in a post chaise and drove continually for thirty hours along the great tract to tumin a distance of three hundred versts stopping only at post stations to change horses in tumin we lingered long enough to say good-bye to the men and women we had met coming in and then travelled by train to yekaterinburg this trip into siberia was very short superficial even yet it proved worth while 
i got a brief glimpse of the country i visited the two most important towns of western siberia and i met many splendid men and women who are doomed to long exile yet who were of good cheer to merely have met them face to face to have grasped their hands and talked with them through the still hours of night this alone was worth the long journey if i had needed any further evidence of the inhuman and utterly blind policy of the russian government i found it here in the treatment imposed upon men and women that any nation in the world should be proud of verily the flower of the land at yekaterinburg six weeks mail had accumulated so that i spent several days here before crossing the urals to perm where i rested again for nearly a week before continuing my journey westward to vyatka which i found in many ways the most interesting province i had seen in russia the peasants there are very progressive and through generations of practice have become marvelously skillful in woodworking some of the boxes i saw with secret compartments were examples of rare ingenuity and skill there is a museum there of the peasant handicrafts which is most interesting and withal the vyatkins have a business sense which has enabled them to build up a profitable trade in these things with siberia and russia at large through the nizhny novgorod fair and sale shops in moscow and st petersburg from vyatka i travelled by a new railroad to vologda and st petersburg arriving in the capital early in october when the nights were lengthening and the icy air was calling out the winter furs end of chapter seventeen part two section twenty seven of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita boutros the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg durland chapter eighteen part one my friends the terrorists my interview with marie spirodonova on the eve of her deportation to siberia led to my meeting a good many terrorists a moscow newspaper made so bold as to print a short account of my experience in the tambov prison and the entire edition of the journal was confiscated by the police a week or two later in st petersburg professor paul milyukov's paper the wretch the official organ of the constitutional democratic party published one or two of the photographs of marie that lubushitz had taken on the occasion of our visit and the police descended upon it some one unknown to me procured one of these newspaper reprints and used it for an edition of marie spiridonova postcards a moscow bookshop placed these cards on sale and the police permanently closed the shop after taking all of the cards these and other incidents which developed out of the tambov visit seemed to offer a guarantee to the members of the extreme left that i was trustworthy i may have been needlessly reckless perhaps in the way i availed myself of the opportunities presented through this chance means for nowhere in the world to-day is playing with fire apt to lead to deeper burns i need look back over only as many months as i can count on my fingers to realize the appalling price these daring men and women of the skirmish line of the revolution pay for devotion to their ideals of a free russia some died where they stood when they cast their one blow for russia some died blindfolded bullet riddled as the dawn wind blew fresh across the fortress courtyard others swung ignominiously from a hangman's scaffold the sunlight and the wide blue sky shut away from their last vision by a hood of black at least two checkmated their captors and laughingly claimed their heritage of death by their own hands several lie in living death in the far north several rot in pestiferous prisons a handful are in voluntary exile abroad dreaming 
planning, watching for the moment when they may most effectively return to the fight. Terrorism and assassination are the monumental bugbears in America. Of all the complexities of the Russian situation, nothing is so little understood, so frequently, I might almost say so universally, misunderstood in America as terrorism. Terrorism in America means anarchy, and that suggests haymarket riots or Zolgosk fanaticism, both of which are entirely outside the pale of terrorism as it is understood in Russia. Terrorism is a philosophy and a policy rather than the impulsive action of human passions. It is true, of course, in individual cases that the father or husband of an outraged girl will seek reprisal himself when hopeless of lawful aid. But cases of individual revenge have nothing in common with terrorism properly so called. Incidental to the terrorism of political origin is a certain amount of assassination worthy of mention. I mean assassination resulting from specific acts of military or administrative officials. For example, last year a number of women teachers in the Caucasus met to confer upon educational methods and to lay out a plan for an improved curriculum. The government disapproved of their taking so much upon themselves and sent Cossacks to break up the meeting. Not content with dispersing it, the colonel of the Cossacks said to his soldiers, These women are yours. The Cossacks then outraged all the teachers. Neither the colonel nor any of his men were punished. It is not difficult to understand how the friends and near ones of these young women felt toward the colonel who was responsible. It is not to be wondered at if someone, a father, a brother, a lover, or perhaps one of the dishonored women, took up bomb or revolver in retaliation. What would American fathers or brothers or lovers do under like circumstances? So long as the Russian government and the military and police authorities encourage massacres and do not rebuke such enormities as these, absolutism will continue to be tempered by assassination under such pressure as this the strongest wall of reason the finest ideals of manhood fall away and the impulse of the moment becomes not merely the supreme but the only dynamic of life terrorism however does not rest on a mere personal basis these incidents to which might easily be added a vast number simply account for the picking off of a man here and there usually a man of subordinate rank the terrorists of the revolution bear precisely the same relation to the movement as a whole as sharpshooters bear to a regular army no military officer ever advocated turning a whole army into scouts and sharpshooters and no revolutionist i ever talked with desired turning the revolutionary movement into a vast terroristic organization but as an auxiliary agency the fighting organization has its work just as distinct and as important as the work of the military organization the russian revolutionary parties properly so called are two the social democratic party and the social revolutionist party the former is a Marxian socialist party dominated by German thought and influenced even to its working methods by German ideals. More and more the social democrats are tending toward the doctrinaire. They aim to keep in step with the international socialist movement, and their immediate efforts are all toned and tempered by their ultimate program which is the establishment of a socialistic state in russia to supersede autocracy as soon as the rank and file of the people are sufficiently instructed in the nationalistic principles which underlie their philosophy active fighting and insurrection with the social democrats is now only occasional and is determined by peculiar local conditions the social revolutionists on the other hand are an out-and-out -out revolutionary organization in the usually accepted sense 
This party believes in barricade fighting when circumstances seem propitious. At all times its propaganda encourages preparation for armed revolts, and instills the belief that it is through insurrection that the balance of power will eventually be wrested from the bureaucracy. While endorsing insurrection, the social revolutionists find that there are long periods when active revolt is inexpedient, when the people are for the moment exhausted, their resources drained, their spirits dampened by the cruel reaction such as characterized the period of M. Stolypin's ministry, from the day of the dissolution of the first Duma. Yet there are always those who chafe under inaction, and who cannot cease from the strife so long as life and liberty are spared them. Of such are the Maximalists, an offshoot of the social revolutionists, whose exploits thrilled all Russia from time to time during 1906, but whose reckless daring resulted in the almost complete extermination of the party. Terrorism proper is not a blind, fanatical policy of bloodshed. It is a phase of warfare which can be logically justified, even when it cannot be sentimentally accepted. Assassination in a country where normal peaceful conditions prevail can never be justified. But terrorism, as it exists in Russia, rests on the basis that Russia is not only in an abnormal condition, but it is a country seething with internal war. The government maintains its army on a war footing. During the entire year of 1906, at least four-fifths of the empire was kept under martial law. Military trials and punishments were meted out to ordinary civil offenders and the men were executed for crimes so petty as stealing less than ten dollars the russian government maintains a state of perpetual warfare against its own people therefore the ethics of a peaceful land do not at all apply to russia terrorism does not mean reckless and indiscriminate bloodshed on the contrary, it means the prevention of bloodshed because victims of the Red Terror are almost without exception tyrants whose lives and regime, if permitted to continue, would demand the lives of numberless victims falling under their rule. The assassination of a Plev, a Sergius, a Pavlov, a Luchinovsky, sends a nation to its knees in praise and thanksgiving i speak i believe without exaggeration because the taking of each one of those lives saved the lives of many innocents who would have fallen under their merciless regime precisely as hundreds did fall before these pitiless rulers were overtaken by the terror marie spirodonova was the first terrorist of the present movement whom i met face to face I have described her charming girlishness, her burning idealism, her heroic daring. During the succeeding months I met a good many members of the fighting organization, and I think with everyone I was impressed with their splendid spirit. Personally I do not approve of bombs, save under extraordinary circumstances, but I can understand their vogue in Russia and this I know, that the terrorist, the assassin of the revolution, usually pays greater heed to safeguarding the bystanders than the government ever does. The slayer of the Grand Duke Sergius allowed five opportunities for striking his victim to go by, because the Grand Duchess Elizabeth was by his side, and her death was not desired. Zineda Konoplanikova, who shot General Min at Peterhof in August, sacrificed her own life to save the lives of some children. On a certain morning, when the general left his home, he was approached by Zineda, who was accompanied by one comrade. She held a velvet work bag in one hand. In the bag was a bomb. In her pocket was a browning revolver. Zineda meant to do her work well. As she was on the point of passing the general and dropping the bomb, two children ran toward her and flung themselves at her skirts. 
she carefully raised the bag above their heads, and turning to her comrade said, I cannot, the children. That same afternoon Zeneda waited for General Min near the railroad station. Again she carried the velvet work bag, and in her pocket the browning. The station was almost deserted. She determined to use the bomb and attempt escape. The bomb would make sure her victim and occasion enough commotion to perhaps enable her to get away unnoticed. But when the general appeared, he was accompanied by his wife and daughter. Like a flash, she weighed the choice. The bomb would kill the general and the two women, but perhaps cover her escape. The revolver meant the general's death and her own and no other. There was no hesitancy. Her hand reached for the browning, and General Min fell. As soldiers rushed upon her, she motioned them back, shouting, "'Careful, careful, this is a bomb!' The soldiers hesitated. Zeneda gently put down the bomb and gave herself up. In the dead of night, September 10, 1906, in the grim and sinister courtyard of the famous Schlusselberg Fortress, Zeneda was hanged. Many times have these terrorists shown similar care for the lives of the innocent. At least two or three sacrificed their lives during a maximalist incident, which is described at length in the following chapter, by the insistent daring of the protecting party in keeping the crowd of passers-by back from the zone of fire. The capture of Sokolow, known as the Bear, a man whom I knew intimately, on the Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg, was beautifully characteristic. The bear was five and twenty. He was more than six feet tall, deep-chested, light hair, small light beard, and deep blue eyes. The bear was a leader in the Moscow insurrection of December 1905. A spy who had successfully played the role of a revolutionist had arrested a number of the Moscow leaders. Sokolow had quit Moscow immediately after the insurrection, and worked only in other places. Sokolow was the soul and spirit of a certain group of the Moscow and St. Petersburg fighting organization. Some of the most daring plots were conceived by him. Now that he is dead, there can be no harm in my confessing that it was he who arranged for the blowing up of the ministers in the first Duma and it was he who forestalled the plan, as I shall describe presently. During the year he had dressed differently than when he lived in Moscow. There he was a workman, wearing a blouse and cap. In St. Petersburg he dressed as a fop, a coxcomb, an exquisite of the court. I knew him well, and was by no means unaffected by his gracious personality, his winning smile, his fine intensity. Ten months had passed since the Moscow affair. So many things had happened during those ten months that Sokolow had ceased to think of any danger from that old affair. One bright afternoon, as he was hurrying along the Nevsky, a beggar, clad in utter rags, stuck a dirty hand in front of him and whined a pitiful plea. A kopeck, sir, for Christ's sake! Sokolow drew out his purse and handed the creature a coin. As he did so, the beggar, who was scrutinizing the young man's features, emitted a shrill whistle, and Sokolow was instantly pounced upon by spies. The beggar was the old Moscow provocateur. A day or two later, Sokolow met the death of a soldier of the revolution. During the first week in November, there were fourteen executions, including two girls, at Kronstadt alone, and all of these had to be shot, because no one could be found to serve as hangmen. The convicts in the prisons declined the task, even on the promise of their immediate liberty and money. The two girls who were included in this execution were both students of the University of St. Petersburg. They had been convicted of complicity in a conspiracy against a military tribunal at Kronstadt. The two women were confined in the same cell. They met their fate bravely, and spent a great part of the night in singing. 
Mameyev wrote a telegram to her mother, asking her to come to Kronstadt for a last farewell. But the message was not dispatched by the authorities. Venediktov's mother, an old seamstress, living at Tambov, traveled to Kronstadt when her daughter was arrested but in spite of all entreaties did not succeed in getting an interview with her both women refused services of the priest who came to offer last consolations of the church in her final letter written to her mother venediktov said i can hear a noise in the passage the tramp of soldiers i am now perhaps about to die good-bye good-bye my dear mother at 4.30 a.m. the women were informed that they had to leave for the place of execution. They begged that they might be permitted to wear their ordinary clothes, and not be compelled to don the white garb of the condemned. Their request was refused. On arriving at the scene of execution, they found three of their comrades already there. All the five were bound to stakes, and a party of dragoons advanced toward them. Four of the prisoners fell dead at the first volley. Mameyov, however, was only wounded in the leg, and by some means managed to drag the bandage from her eyes and gazed at her companions. Then came a second volley. She dropped lifeless, and a few minutes afterward the bodies were thrown into the sea. Terrorism has a dual aim. On one hand, it aims to remove an oppressor, or one whose life and influence are deemed detrimental to a certain cause. On the other hand, it has in view the moral effect upon the successors of the victims, and upon other men similarly situated in positions of power, and upon the world at large. Most of the famous assassinations of recent years have been carried out by the social revolutionists, a special branch of the party, known as the Fighting Organization, executed the sentences of death pronounced upon Plev, Grand Duke Sergius, Ministers Sipiaguin, Bogolipov, General Min, Count Ignatiev, Procurer Pavlov, and one or two others of the year 1906. This fighting organization is a carefully organized body of about 100, controlled by a central committee. When a victim is selected for death, this committee decides upon the best method for attaining the end. There is no drawing of lots to determine who shall do the deed, as is sometimes asserted, but volunteers offer for the service, and are selected according to their fitness, judged by the peculiar circumstances incident to each case. These volunteers are not necessarily members of the fighting organization, and frequently they are not. The work of the fighting organization is one of judgment and direction, judging whose life is injurious to the liberal movement, and selecting the wisest method of carrying out the death sentence. End of chapter 18, part 1section 28 of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by rita butros the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg durland chapter 18 part 2 auxiliary to the fighting organization are the flying bands or more truly flying individuals who work independently of the fighting organization and carry out their work along individual lines such was marie spiradinova the maximalists only came into existence when the foregoing terrorists and fighting organizations determined to suspend their activities for a time this suspension of terrorist activity was announced in december of nineteen o five and was to continue until the government had definitely shown whether or not it was honest in its promises for reforms and liberties made in october at the time a constitution was granted the period of elections and the duma were to decide this great question 
which at that time was in the hearts and minds and on the lips of every one in russia it was a magnificent opportunity for the revolutionary parties to show their magnanimity the government was stoutly promising to allow the representatives of the people in the duma to inaugurate agrarian and personal liberty reforms the social revolutionists said frankly that they did not believe these promises. Nevertheless, they were ready to give the government every opportunity to prove that it had undergone a change of heart. The party, therefore, gave out that pending these first months of trial of the government under a constitution, they would refrain from all acts of terrorism. They declared that they would not cease from active propaganda work during that time, but that the fighting organization would remain inactive. This announcement was made in late December at a conference of the party held in Finland. It was endorsed by a majority of the representatives of the party at the conference. A small but effective minority protested this decision and in the end their disagreement resulted in a party split. The more forward ones were dubbed maximalists because they declared for the maximum and maintained that so long as the government continued to look upon the situation in the country as a wartime, so long the maximum fighting powers of the people should be kept continually mobilized and in use, even to the employment of the maximum of terror. This group realized that from the outset they were strong enough to embarrass the forces of Tsarism, and so they began their activity as a separate party, with enthusiasm and confidence. The more conservative majority were forced to accept the name foisted upon them of minimalists, indicating that they were working for the least, or the minimum. The maximalists began operations in early January, there were about seventy in the group, all young, daring men. Individually, they were men of character and of personality. Most of them were university men. In their personal habits of life, some were as rigid as ascetics. In this respect, they are not unlike many ardent revolutionists who are abstemious in some things to the point of fanaticism. I have heard revolutionists denouncing all alcohol, even light beer, with as much vehemence as a women's Christian temperance union lecturer. With them it is a clear, straightforward, practical proposition. Alcohol unsettles the judgment, strains the nervous system unduly, and in their eyes is an influence which retards progress. Beer tends to make all of life seem rosy and comfortable. Since discontent is the soul of revolution, many of the devoted revolutionists, including many of the maximalists, hate and fear all liquor as the ministers dread bombs. Among the original seventy of the maximalists were a few women. Since then the number of women has increased, and time has shown that some of the boldest and most dashing plays have been made by the women. Moscow was only just recuperating from nine days of barricade fighting, machine gun, and artillery fire, when the Maximalists began that series of raids which won them a reputation unparalleled in Russia and comparable to de Wet's boldness in South Africa, and our own Morgan, the raider. At the outset, while the group were shaping together, they confined their efforts to comparatively modest plans. They entered state spirit shops and carried away the government receipts. Sometimes they thus held up several state establishments in a single day. Then they organized riots and tried in various ways to incite the mob to insurrection at such times when armed uprisings, even of a petty character, were a menace to the authorities. When a clash occurred between the military or police authorities and the populace, the maximalists endeavored to assume the leadership of the crowd. In the hope of a general uprising at some future time, the maximalists deliberately set about training themselves for emergency action. During February, opportunities for this kind of work grew fewer, 
but the confiscating of government funds became their daily program. During these early weeks, none of the Maximalists were ever caught. They worked openly in broad daylight, and through sheer boldness invariably got safely away. In March came their first big affair. Twenty of them entered a Moscow bank in the heart of the city one forenoon, and while some of the party covered the directors and clerks with revolvers, others packed up 800,000 rubles and the whole party withdrew. Not a trace was found of any of the men at that time, nor any of the money recovered, save a small sum which fell into the hands of the authorities some time later through an accident. The circumstances of this incident were most dramatic. Two features of the raid created widespread comment. One of the band, upon entering the bank, had taken his stand by the telephone, and all the while the money was being packed up, he continued to receive all messages coming over the wire, as if he were the regularly employed telephone clerk. The other incident betrayed the gentlemanliness of the robbers. One of the maximalist group covered the director's room, although there were several officials in the room at the time. One of the directors fainted in his chair through fright, whereupon the maximalist who commanded the situation told two of the others present to lay the fainting official on a lounge, and then directed one of them to fetch a glass of water from the next room. The coolness with which this robbery was carried out excited the admiration even of those who scoffed at the idea that this money was for revolutionary purposes. This was perfectly true, nevertheless, for among the twenty who executed this raid were men of independent means, who declined to use any of this money for their actual personal expenses. Contributions were generously offered to different revolutionary organizations. At the time, only a part was kept in the hands of the party for current expenses, and this was divided into many parts and given over for safekeeping into the hands of different members of the group one a student had several thousand roubles in his keeping he was one of the poor ones a peasant's son toward the end of the spring he used some of this money to pay his tuition at the technical school where he was studying he did it openly, and frankly told his comrades that he had borrowed the money, a trifling sum, for this purpose. The action created so much adverse comment in the party that it was agreed that no one would ever again use party money for a personal need. An accident led to the restoration of a portion of this stolen money. At the last moment before the raid, one more man was declared necessary a young Moscow man named Belentsov, not a member of the maximalist group, but known to most of the members, was asked to join the raiders. He had courage and boldness, and these were the qualities needed. Belentsov was assigned to a particular post. He was not to touch the money, but merely to guard a certain passage. To the surprise of the men assigned to gathering the funds, Belentsov suddenly began to pack up some of the money. The leader of the party was disinclined to reveal to the bank men that there was the slightest discord in the group, so he permitted Belentsov to continue handling the money. Having acquired all of the money in the bank, the party disappeared to meet two days later at an appointed place all appeared save Balantzov. He was next heard from in Switzerland, whither he had fled with his part of the money. But unfortunately he was not a man of the same class as the others, as he had yielded to the temptation of drink. While under the influence of liquor, he had disclosed his identity and told the story of the raid. The police captured him, and in due time he was extradited to Russia. As the train which was conveying Belentsov to St. Petersburg neared the capital, the prisoner mysteriously disappeared. The soldiers who had him in charge declared he had jumped through the window, and in evidence pointed to a demolished window-pane. 
the train was stopped and a tremendous search instituted but to no end balentsov was not found the explanation is entirely worthy of the maximalists convinced that balentsov in the hands of the authorities was dangerous to the whole party the maximalists determined to rescue him at vilna several of them boarded the train which carried their willem comrade a disguise in the form of an officer's uniform with necessary facial disguises was left in the washroom of the car in which balentsov was held prisoner in some incredible way balentsov succeeded in making a lightning change of costume in the washroom and as an officer of the czar took his place in the train as a passenger i fancy there was a bottle of vodka connected with this incident for otherwise it would have been difficult to have hoodwinked the soldiers balentsov sat in the train while the woods and fields were being scoured for him then travelled by the same train to st petersburg that night he made good his escape into finland in the meantime the bulk of the money had been handed over to the cashier a man of reputation and position during the days when the police were searching most vigorously for it, the money remained in the home of this man. A few weeks afterward, 200,000 roubles of this money was deposited in the very bank from which it was stolen, and during the succeeding months interest was paid upon it, until it was eventually needed in the work. The first reverse of a serious nature occurred to the Maximalists a few weeks after this successful bank scoop. The police, baffled on every hand in their efforts to capture the band, resorted to the old-time successful method of an agent provocateur. Of the original seventy, some ten had now paid the penalty of their reckless daring. So well did the agent provocateur do his work that forty-five of the remaining sixty were lodged behind prison bars. Some are still under arrest. Others finally were freed through lack of evidence, while others made bold and successful escapes. The ideas that the Maximalists stood for were now beginning to be understood and in spite of this tremendous setback the party began suddenly to grow and develop fresh strength young blood from different parts of the country offered their services to the maximalists they were prepared to perform any commission that would be a blow against the government the government was still in sore need for money as the new foreign loan had not then been negotiated and so it seemed that the confiscation of government funds from every possible source was a most effective way of worrying the administration also these robberies following one upon another in rapid succession continuing for weeks demonstrated to the world the weakness of the government in regard to its police administration and helped to increase the feeling abroad of the government's powerlessness at the same time, the revolution was in sad straits for money. The government had sent expeditions everywhere to disarm the people. To rearm half of Russia every now and again is a huge task and terribly costly. Therefore, this policy of the maximalists was practical revolutionary service, however one may regard it ethically, inasmuch as it was embarrassing to the government. The next big plot was arranged in June. It was to blow up the ministers in the Duma. This plot has never before been disclosed, but I can vouch for its authenticity. Indeed, I was conversant with the details of the plan from the day it was concocted. The Duma had asked the ministers to resign. The Duma had gone further. It had demanded that the ministry resign. When any minister appeared in the Duma tribunal to speak, he was hissed and hooted, yet there was no word of demission. The maximalist then said, As an auxiliary body, it is now our duty to impress upon the whole world that the word of the Duma must be obeyed. The Duma is the people. When the Duma cries to the ministers, Resign! 
That cry must be understood as coming from the country at large. Since they do not resign of their own will, the Maximalists will undertake to coerce them. The plan finally adopted was to teach all of the ministers of autocracy a grand lesson by blowing up as many of the ministers as could be caught together in an accessible place. At that time the ministers were frequenting the Duma. It was not unusual for five or six ministers and assistant ministers to gather in the ministerial box of an afternoon to listen to the people's chosen representatives proclaiming diatribes against the wicked administration. The Maximalists procured plans of the Duma, found a means of access through forged tickets carefully copied from an original ticket of admission, and the men who were to take part in the plot were all chosen. There were to be six men with bombs, besides a covering group. Three of the six were to throw their bombs simultaneously, while the other three were to loiter in the background to watch the effect of the first fire. If any of the first three failed to explode, or if the damage done seemed insufficient, the others were to throw their packets of death and destruction. When this plan was about to be executed, the question arose among some of the members of the Maximalist group. Is it wise to have this thing in the Duma? Will it not react unfavorably upon the Duma itself? Opinion was divided. In spite of these questionings, however, the plot would undoubtedly have been carried out as planned in the Duma had not a very curious chance intervened. The men who were to throw the bombs were one afternoon scrutinizing the plans when someone pointed out that the ministerial box was separated from the foreign correspondence box only by a narrow aisle. Some, if not all, of the correspondents would thus inevitably be made victims of the explosions. The carefully arranged plot was there and then abandoned on grounds that correspondents were, theoretically at least, non-combatants, and as such must not be exposed to death in this way. The determination to do away with the ministers, however, was not abandoned at this time and the question next to be settled was where else are the ministers sometimes gathered together why in the upper house or council of empire therefore plans of that building were obtained and as there was no press box in juxtaposition to the ministerial box it seemed as if the plot would be carried out here but about that time the dissolution of the duma early in July, caused a suspension of the sittings of the Council of Empire, and thereby was this plan of the Maximalists frustrated. The sanguinary mutinies at Zweiburg and Kronstadt, which followed the dissolution of the Duma, were encouraged by Maximalists, and among the agitators captured at both places were members of this fighting group, Wherever there is a fighting line, there are sure to be maximalists. The bomb incident in the home of M. Stolypin early in the autumn, which cost a score of lives and wounded two score others, was the work of maximalists. The last week in October was marked by the most daring coup ever planned by the maximalists. It was in connection with this episode that I came nearest to the heart of this form of terrorist activity. End of chapter 18, part 2For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Darland Chapter 19, Part 1 A Close Call One silver night, in late October, I was returning home a little before midnight. St. Petersburg was subdued but not hushed. 
Gorodavoys paced the Nevsky with their bayonet-pointed guns unslung. Not that they were anticipating trouble, but readiness for emergencies was now the rule among the military and the police in the capital. As I stepped briskly down the Ekaterinsky Canal toward my street, I suddenly came upon my friend Nastasia of the fighting organization. So late and alone, I exclaimed. I have been waiting half the evening for you, she explained. For me? Is it so urgent? Yes, you know, she hesitated. You know, there have been many arrests these days in St. Petersburg. Nastasia was coming to something, but what I could not divine. We are all liable to search, she went on. Perhaps you will not mind keeping some papers for us? This was no unusual request. People who expected the police often handed packets of correspondence, legal papers, and other documents to friends who were not suspected. In common with many other non-Russians in St. Petersburg, I had frequently accepted such a trust. An English correspondent had brought the original copy of the Vyborg Manifesto, with its appended signatures, back to St. Petersburg, at the request of the leaders of the Constitutional Democrats. Without a second thought, I told Nastasia I would gladly keep anything for her, then turned and together we walked to her house. Nastasia was living on the top floor of a large apartment building with three other girls, all members of the organization, although one was ostensibly a student in the university, one was studying music at the conservatory, one was a teacher, and Nastasia was professionally a nurse. Nastasia had been with the troops in Manchuria, and after Mukden, her hospital was among those that fell into the hands of the Japanese. When we arrived, the three other girls were sitting round a samovar, talking. Two of them puffed little Russian cigarettes. I drank a glass of tea with them, took the papers they gave me, and departed. I heard the Kazan bells sound one as I poked the sleeping Dwornik of my own lodgings to open the door for me. The next morning I left home at eleven o'clock. I had not passed many yards beyond the Hotel Victoria in the Kazanaskiai when the report of two light bombs, followed presently by a rattling revolver fire and gun cracks, sounded on a street only two blocks away. When I reached the spot, the confusion and tumult was so great that I was unable to make anything of the melee. The first thing I came upon was a wounded horse streaming blood into a gutter. Around the corner was a general riot of panicky men and women, terrified horses, and stolid Cossacks and police. A carriage was standing in the middle of the road, deserted. One of the horses that belonged to it was lying dead in its tracks. Window panes for a block and a half were shattered. There seemed to be wounded and killed men, and a number of arrests, but my impression was mostly a blur, with here and there a projecting detail. Intuitively I felt a connection between this incident, whatever it was, and my experience with Nastasia the night before. The more I thought about it, the more curious I became. I hurried over to Nastasia's, only to find the apartment deserted. In the early afternoon I learned from various eyewitnesses what had happened. The carriage I had seen standing in the street had been conveying some government monies across the city. The trip was supposedly secret, and the carriage was guarded by Cossacks. The government had learned before this not to convey money anywhere at stated times or intervals. Only one man was supposed to know when a trip should be made, and this one was always a man of such rank or position as to have authority to order the military escort on the spur of the moment. To this day it is not known how the terrorists, maximalists as it chanced, knew of this particular transfer of money. All that the government authorities ever learned about the affair were the bare facts of the exploit. An apple vendor strolling down the street of the Catherine Canal had paused to rest his basket on the canal railing. 
Opposite the spot where he stood was a little tea-house into which nearly a score of young men had been dropping singly and by twos. There was also one girl. Apparently these young people were not acquainted with one another, but it was remarked afterward that they all looked rather constantly out of the restaurant toward the canal, and the apple man plaintively calling his fruit. Suddenly the basket of apples was seen to slip off the railing, and the fruit splashed into the murky water. Twenty chairs were pushed back, twenty young men pressed toward the street. A closed carriage with armed escort was approaching the spot. Boom! Boom! Two quick explosions dropped the horses that drew the carriage, and the horses of the escort snorted and plunged wildly down the street. The young men now all fell to the work with wonderful skill and precision. One group drew a cordon of protection around the carriage, while another group approached the carriage and collected the bags of money. The affair was carried out with more coolness than speed, and in consequence the raiders found a company of soldiers from a nearby barracks down upon them before they started to escape. So well did the protecting party do their work that not one of the attacking party was caught or injured. The leader of the maximalist group lost his life in trying to prevent the crowd in the street from rushing to its own destruction. Knowing that a street crowd instinctively rushes toward the scene of excitement, and knowing that a rifle and revolver of fire would be directed toward the carriage where the maximalists were capturing the money, sergia the leader patrolled the street forcing the crowd to keep at a safe distance he brandished a browning revolver and roared thunderous curses upon the people he fought them back and continued in this work until captured three days later he was executed another of the protecting party a young engineer was captured in the same effort and his revolver taken from his hand he knew he would be hanged and that in all probability the government would first try to wring a confession from him that would implicate others in his pocket was another revolver which his captors had not discovered he could not get it out of his pocket but he succeeded in so turning it that when he pulled the trigger the bullet passed through his bowels he died half an hour later in horrible agony the money was delivered over to the girl who had been standing and waiting. She carried the packages to a carriage just around the corner, and was driven swiftly off. Not one kopeck of the approximately 400,000 roubles was ever recovered by the government. From this standpoint, the affair was successful, but it was successful at an awful cost. Including those whose lives were lost on the spot, and the executions which followed, eight of the group died for this well-planned haul of two hundred thousand dollars. Incidentally, three innocent passers-by were also arrested and executed. Justice must be satisfied in Russia. Up to this point my connection with the affair was slight and of small consequence but that night I allowed myself to be entangled to an extent that escape came near to being impossible. About dusk, when I returned to my lodgings, I found Nastasia and two young men sitting round my table awaiting my coming. I knew both of the men as maximalists. One of them, Sasha, was the son of one of the old generation revolutionists, who had spent many years in incarceration in Schlüsselburg Fortress. He and Nastasia were lovers. Love in the revolution has played no mean part. It has inspired deeds of noblest daring. It has led to splendid sacrifice. Sometimes it has proved unsettling and precipitated disaster. The instant I looked at my friends, I knew my suspicions of the morning were correct. They were perfectly frank about it. The men were both implicated. Nastasia was not directly concerned in the affair, but she was one of the group, and consequently in constant fear of being taken as a suspect. Indeed, the very name I knew her by, and her passport, were newly acquired, and under dramatic circumstances. She had been working in Moscow previous to the December insurrection, and under her own name was sought by the police. 
During the barricade fighting, Nastasia saw a girl comrade shot down near her. With sudden inspiration, she bent over the dead girl and drew forth her passport, then quickly slipped her own passport into the place of the one she was taking. Nastasia's name appeared in the list of the dead, and thenceforth she was known by the name of the girl who had fallen on the barricades. Escape from St. Petersburg, and if possible from Russia, was the subject of their discussion. They had come to my house because they feared their own quarters would be suspected and watched. Presumably mine was a white house on the police records. These soldiers of the revolution were naturally elated at the success of the coup, but frightfully depressed by the loss of life which had attended the expropriation. One thing only now lay before them, the getting away. The police were ransacking every house in the city. Orders were issued that afternoon that doorkeepers should report before morning if anyone without a passport remained overnight in any house. Ordinarily there was a grace of three days, but this fresh order commanded reports to be made before daybreak. Eighty arrests had already been made. The railway stations were filled with police spies and gendarmes, and every person leaving by any train was scrutinized. The wagon roads were covered by soldiers, and the boats leaving the ports were observed as carefully as the trains. Sasha was inclined to risk remaining in the city for a day or two at least, but Nastasia, knowing that to be caught meant immediate execution, would not hear of delay. She was determined that Sasha at least should hasten to safety that night. I had no suggestions to make, though I wished them well, and went out to supper, leaving them still discussing a possible plan. I returned about nine-thirty. The three were still there, and with a plan worked out. Sasha was to dress as a foreigner, say an Englishman, and taking me for a companion, he would boldly take the night train to Helsingfors in Finland. Nastasia and the other man had each a different idea for themselves. I was not keen to start upon this expedition, but they were my friends. Furthermore, Nastasia had once seen me through an exceedingly ticklish experience, and this was the first time she had asked anything of me. When I hesitated, she pleaded so earnestly that I finally consented to the plan. There was no time to lose. Sasha donned one of my overcoats, an obviously English hat, threw a steamer rug over one arm, picked up a top hat box, and we were off. The heavy end of the trip fell to me. Sasha was to know no Russian whatsoever. I, with my scant traveller's vocabulary, was to do all of the interpreting that might be necessary. Sasha, unfortunately, knew not a word of English. Our conversation had, therefore, to be in German. The danger was increased considerably by the fact that Sasha had no passport at all. Masquerading as an English traveller, there was small use of his having anything but an English passport which of course was not procurable on the moment. I held my usual American passport. Ten-thirty had long been the hour of departure of the Helsingfors train. It was twenty-six minutes past the hour when Sasha and I dismissed our carriage and walked slowly and with a degree of nonchalance into the station. Gendarmes stood in rows between the ticket office and the platform. Sasha was magnificently steeled for the ordeal. He knew we would be looked over by perhaps a score of eyes, and a single suspicious movement might lead to discovery. He stopped near the middle of the station and lighted a cigarette, while I stepped to the wicket to purchase the tickets. Two first-class tickets to Helsingfors by the 10.30 train. "'It is gone, sir.' "'What? Gone? But it is not yet 10.30.' The schedule was changed today, sir. The last train left at ten ten. My heart sank clear to my boots, for I knew what a shock it would be to Sasha, who had risen so well to the role he had assumed. So I inquired if there was a train to any point in Finland that night. There was none. There would not be another until the next morning. 
Sasha flinched ever so slightly when I told him, and his face paled perceptibly, but he picked up the hat-box he had set down and led the way out of the station. We called a cab and started back for my rooms. On the way we arranged that Sasha would come to me the next night at seven o'clock, and we would try it again. Then, leaving the luggage and the rug with me, he slipped noiselessly out of the carriage without the driver even knowing. All that night he wandered among the sheltering shadows, dodging gendarmes and late prowlers. I don't know where he lay in hiding during the day. When I got in at the appointed time, Sasha was asleep on my couch, apparently in no way troubled by the great peril that threatened. I do not exaggerate the danger. Many more arrests had been made during the day, and early that evening a comrade not under suspicion had learned that the force of police spies in the stations had been greatly strengthened by the arrival of a party of Moscow Police Department men and these had brought with them photographs of several men whom they were looking for, among them a photograph of Sasha. Sasha had once been taken in Moscow and escaped, but not before being photographed. This picture was now reproduced on slips of paper like handbills, and circulated among the watchers. This knowledge shook even Nastasia in regard to the wisdom of repeating our plan of the previous evening. However, something had to be done, and that quickly, for the noise of this successful coup had echoed all over the empire, and the St. Petersburg authorities were goaded to great activity in the hope of making up in the number of arrests for their alleged negligence on the day of the incident. The chances of escape were growing hourly less and a fear seemed to possess both Nastasia and Sasha that perhaps even my house was no longer safe. Yet in St. Petersburg they had no other. Sasha scribbled a few mysterious words in Russian on one piece of paper, and a name and address on another, and handed both to me, asking me to carry the note to the address on the second slip of paper. I rushed away without looking at the address, jumped into a cab, that happened to be standing in front of the house, and directed that I be driven to, 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 I could not make out the writing. Let me read it, offered the driver. No, you can't, I said. It is not written in Russian. No matter, said he. I read German. But it is not German. It is French. C'est bien. Je parle français. I had heard of government agents acting as cab drivers, but I realized instantly that I was now, for the first time, face to face with one of these spies. For a Russian cab driver to be familiar with French and German is even more extraordinary than it would be to find a New York or London cabbie speaking two languages besides his own. Pretending to read the address, I called out an address in an entirely different quarter of the city. I discharged that fellow, and looked about for one of the usual peasant drivers, such as are always found on the streets of Moscow and St. Petersburg, having finally deciphered the address and put it into Russian. My driver left me before a very grand house in a fashionable quarter. I was admitted with considerable ceremony. The atmosphere of the establishment was more like that of the court than of anything else, Presently, a young exquisite introduced himself to me as the man whose name Sasha had given me. "'Sasha wants me. Where is he?' he said. "'At my house,' I replied. "'But you are at dinner.' "'Dinner can wait. Where is your house?' I told him. "'Is it a white house?' he inquired further. I told him it was, to the best of my knowledge, whereupon he slipped on a rich greatcoat, and we returned together.' Sasha and this mysterious stranger embraced like brothers. They kissed each other repeatedly. Whatever their business was, it was quickly dispatched, for in ten minutes the young man departed. Sasha never offered any explanation concerning him, but I have always suspected that he was one of the treasurers of the organization, for these are usually men of social standing above suspicion. When the stranger had gone, Sasha unfolded to me the plan for the night. 
the finnish frontier was so closely guarded that to escape in that direction seemed impossible they had decided upon a bold scheme that would succeed if only it were carried out with sufficient dash End of chapter 19 part 1section thirty of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg darland chapter nineteen part two a first-class compartment for two was engaged on the gilt-edged St. Petersburg-Moscow train, which leaves St. Petersburg at 10.30 every evening. Nastasia dressed as a bride, Sasha as a bridegroom. A party of half a dozen friends got together in proper attire for the wedding party, seeing the happy couple started on their way. Sasha, being without a passport, was the one obviously vulnerable point in the outfit. If any suspicious gendarme should happen to question the pair, a passport of any kind would probably disarm his suspicions, whereas no passport at all would mean sure arrest. "'Lend Sasha your passport,' Nastasia said to me. "'Mine? Oh, I can't do that,' I explained. "'Why not? It may be the means of saving his life. If he gets caught to-night without a passport, he will be executed.' let him have yours for this night only from moscow it will be returned to you i hesitated a long time but finally handed my precious identification paper over to sasha at ten twenty nine exactly a noisy rollicking crowd of young people swept into the moscow station a bride and groom led the way followed by several friends who pelted them with flowers and confetti the rows of gendarmes whom we passed between smiled broadly and evidently never suspected that the whole party was a ruse. We all knew that several of the men under whose very noses we passed held in their pockets photographs of Sasha. I closed the compartment door as the daring couple stumbled hurriedly into the train. A half minute later the three bells signal of departure sounded and the train pulled away. The next morning we waited for the telegram Sasha had promised to send, announcing their arrival in Moscow. By noon we began to grow anxious. When evening came, and nothing had been heard from them, our worry increased. The next morning brought neither message nor my passport, which should have come then. That day wore by, and the morning of the third day dawned, and still no word. We were all prepared now to hear the worst. One thing puzzled us. Why did the police not make public their capture, if they were taken? Every other arrest made in connection with this incident was promptly made known. We pondered over this a good deal. Finally, on the evening of the third day, we called together a council of trusted friends, and the opinion of the conference was that Nastasia and Sasha had been taken, that my passport had probably occasioned some bewilderment and until the rightful owner of the passport was found the capture would not be made public sasha we knew would give no hint as to where i might be found and it would naturally take several days to locate me this being the best understanding of the situation we could reach the precariousness of my own position was apparent to all if I were so directly implicated in a terrorist act as the finding of my passport in Sasha's possession would imply, no power on earth could save me from the fate which had befallen all the others implicated in the incident. Opinion was divided as to the wise thing for me to do. Two or three urged me to fly to the frontier at once that very hour, Others counseled that I go to Moscow first to make sure of the fate of our friends and my passport, for Sasha had promised that if he were taken he would do all he could to destroy the passport. If he had succeeded in this, I would merely have to obtain a fresh passport. There are always ways of doing that. 
The latter plan appealed to me, so I procured a seat in the same train they had travelled by three nights earlier. I took with me a dress-suit case containing necessary clothing and, alas, for the foolishness of men, two terribly incriminating packets. No one thought I would be arrested in the train en route to Moscow, and so it did not occur to any of us that there was peril in my carrying two valuable packages to comrades in Moscow. The first was a bundle of original Peasants' Union documents, at that time to even belong to the peasants union was sufficient cause for exile to siberia the other was twenty copies of one of the installments of shisko's history of the russian people which had been forbidden by the police and to be possessed of one copy was cause for arrest Further, in my pocket, I slipped a Browning revolver, although I had no permit to carry a revolver at all in that part of Russia. Russians themselves are constantly foolishly careless, but until this night I had not understood how easy it is to be blind to one's dangers when they are close before one, or hedging one round. Until the train had actually started, I had no companion in the compartment, although there were places for four. But as the bells sounded and the train started, an officer of gendarme joined me. He sat down opposite me, looked me over rather searchingly, and asked me in Russian what was the time. What a stupid question, I thought. He must know when the train starts. However, I told him, 10.30. I could speak single words in Russian clearly enough, and I could understand much of simple conversation, but I could not put many sentences together with any intelligence. "'Where are you going?' next asked my officer companion. "'To Moscow,' I replied. There was something in the man's glance that made me very uncomfortable, so I drew from my grip a book and began to read. So I drew from my grip a book and began to read. I was conscious for some time of his eyes scrutinizing me from head to foot. I tried not to let him know I knew he was watching me. I fought down my fears and read on. In half an hour the officer opened his grip and took out a small pneumatic traveling pillow. I saw the full contents of the bag. There was one Russian blouse and the pillow, nothing more. The grip itself was a large one, twice the size of my dress suitcase and the fact that he would use so huge a valise to carry a pillow that would go into a pocket and a blouse that would fold into an insignificant parcel confirmed my fears that the man had been sent hurriedly on his journey and that quite evidently he was shadowing me there was nothing to do however but to keep on and to pretend entire indifference after a time I grew drowsy and folded my coat under my head for a pillow, wrapped my rug about me, and lay down. The last thing I did was to examine the compartment door to see that it was securely fastened. The train was running over a smooth roadbed, and the gentle motion to and fro soothed my nerves, and in a little while I fell into a deep dreamless sleep. The striking of a match awoke me suddenly. I half opened my eyes and saw my gendarme officer looking at his watch. It was still dark, and I drowsily wondered what the time was myself. I was too sleepy to look at my own watch. I guessed the hour at about four o'clock, closed my eyes, and was just sinking into sleep again when I felt a hand reach across my body and strike the compartment wall. At the same instant the hoarse voice of the gendarme officer cried out, "'Sir, sir, wake up!' I opened my eyes wide to see the man leaning over me, his arm across my body, and his face directly over mine, so close that I could feel his foul breath with each word he spoke. "'Has any one been in this compartment during the night?' he shouted excitedly. I understood perfectly what he said, but I did not grasp his game. So I simply said, "'What?' And as he repeated his question, I gathered my wits. I do not speak Russian, I said. Yes, you do, he replied. No, only a few words. I am an American. An American, he cried. That is impossible. I saw the trap I was walking into. His next demand would be for my passport. 
so I shifted the matter like a flash. "'What is the matter?' I said. "'Why do you wake me up in the middle of the night this way?' "'Has any one been in this compartment?' he asked. "'No, I think not,' I answered. "'Did you make sure the door was locked last night?' "'Certainly. Is it not locked now?' "'Yes, it is. That is what makes it so strange.' "'Makes what strange?' I put in, really getting greatly puzzled. "'My money and my official papers are gone,' he blurted out. At these words I felt a shiver pass up my back. For a flash it was as if my spine were in water. Then I pulled myself together. "'When did you have them last?' I asked. "'Just before I went to bed,' he answered. "'Then they must be here.' In the meantime he had drawn the curtain back from the single candle that lighted the compartment, and in that dim light we sat in opposite berths and glared at each other. The seriousness of my plight came over me very clearly. I was without any means of identification. My passport was in the possession of a terrorist, or the police, having been found in the possession of a terrorist— my luggage contained one packet upon which a Russian would be sent to Siberia, another packet which would send a Russian to prison, a revolver in my pocket at a time when the law permitted the military to shoot any person caught with a revolver with his own weapon. I was practically under arrest as a common thief because this gendarme's money and papers had disappeared. The situation was so overwhelming that for the first time in my life I failed to see even a fighting chance. Murder has never at any time been in my heart. But there, in that ghastly light, with the gendarme officer sitting opposite me like a panther about to spring, with the shadow of arrest, prison, and the gallows itself over me, the thought did enter my head to shoot my captor. It was his life against mine. I felt sure I could draw my revolver and fire before he could prevent me. But then what? The report of the shot would startle the passengers in other compartments. It would bring the train men. I could not drop out of the window of an express train. I realized that that was out of the question. My brain was never more active, never half so clear, it seemed to me, and my nerves were under absolute control. Yet I could not think of the faintest loophole of escape. In despair I sank back on my improvised pillow. I would see what the officer's next move would be. A silhouette of a beam and crossbar, with a dangling rope, weighted by a black mass, set against a roseate eastern sky at dawn, came before my eyes, with all the clearness of a ship seen in mirage. At least I would be hung for an old sheep, I mused remembering the array of points on which i would be arraigned ranging in seriousness from the charge of being a pickpocket and common thief to implication in a terroristic act after some minutes the gendarme summoned the conductor who looked me over critically and shook his head then the two began to search with apparent diligence for the lost articles in and under the officer's bed when they had looked there pretty thoroughly, the gendarme approached my things. Like a flash, it came over me that he might have slipped his portfolio or money into my shoes or under my coat. If this were the case, I preferred finding them myself. So I sprang to my feet, angrily pushed him away, and began to shake out all of my things carefully before the officer and the train guard. Nothing was found. The officer then turned to my dress suitcase. I knew I was lost if once he saw into that. So I began a veritable tirade, using all the Russian I knew, supplemented by German, French, and English. I saw that the conductor was beginning to be impressed by the fact that I might be a distinguished foreigner. Or, there was another thought, he might believe me a sympathizer of the cause and he also being a revolutionist had determined to assist me suddenly my eye fell on the alleged lost leather document case under the officer's pillow where anybody must have seen it who looked at that end of his berth at all my discovery clearly embarrassed the officer and disgusted the trainman who slammed the door and left the officer too looked as if he didn't know what to do 
I fell back on my pillow and went to sleep very shortly. I was weak from the strain, and I knew well that I was not out of the woods. I had merely put off the crisis till morning. The train rolled into Moscow at half-past eight. My gendarme was plainly agitated and at a loss how to act. I sized up the situation in this way. He had been dispatched from St. Petersburg to follow me as a suspect, and to take me prisoner on any pretext that might offer. His departure had of necessity been so hasty that his information concerning me was scanty. He had naturally supposed he was after a Russian. In the evening I had answered his simple questions in monosyllables, which sounded all right, then in the night, when he had tried to trap me, I had revealed to him that I was not a Russian, and this fact had completely disconcerted him. Also, my leaning back in despair, he had mistaken for genuine nonchalance. A guilty man, he had evidently thought, would not be so indifferent under the circumstances. When the train stopped, I could see that he was uncertain how to act, to arrest me or not, I feared he would take the opportunity of winning a little glory for himself by taking me on chance, so I determined to take advantage of his stupidity and hesitancy. I held out my hand in a most friendly way, gave him a hearty grip, raised my hat, bade him a cheery good-bye, and just as he started to act I sprang from the train, threw myself into the crowd, and— surprise of surprises felt a hand reach for my suitcase and a familiar voice say let me take this sasha come quickly out of this he murmured and we hastened into a carriage and drove to the home of a mutual friend comrades in moscow who had been notified of the coming of sasha and nastasia by a secret code telegram had sent a messenger to a station nearly half way between the two cities to warn them that the dangers in the moscow station for a day or two would be too great for them to think of arriving there thereupon they had left the train at a small water station and lay in hiding three days from there it had not been possible for them to send any word to us in St. Petersburg. Nastasia had taken a circuitous route into Moscow, while Sasha had boarded the very train I was on. Thus we arrived to-day. My passport was returned to me, and I quickly delivered up my dangerous packets. Sasha planned to leave for the South immediately, but a soldier of the Revolution is never master of his own destiny. In the early afternoon a cipher telegram came from St. Petersburg, urging Sasha's return there that night. This seemed the height of folly to me, after jeopardizing his own life and the lives of others, to get away from St. Petersburg and then to turn right back again. This was more than I could understand. But Sasha knew that more lives depended upon his obedience, so he prepared to leave that evening. Trains from Moscow back to St. Petersburg were not apt to be so closely watched as those going out. Sasha thought to go on the 9.30 train. I went to the station with him, for he seemed to have a strong premonition that he was about to perform his last service for the cause, to which his life was dedicated. When I tried to purchase a ticket, I was told that there was not a place left on the train. Sasha had, therefore, to wait for the 10.30 train. We sat down at a table in the buffet and ordered two glasses of tea. Presently, a member of the Moscow organization, a friend of Sasha's, stepped up to us, pointed out a certain man at an adjoining table, and said, "'Watch that fellow carefully. He is a spy. He may be shadowing you, or may be someone else, but watch him.' We did watch him for half an hour, and became pretty well convinced that he was following Sasha. Ten minutes before train time, a brilliantly dressed woman swept by us. I looked up, and I own I was badly startled. I recognized her as one of the women's secret police of St. Petersburg. Only the day before, she had sat at the very next table to me in the Hôtel de France in St. Petersburg. Now, thirty hours later, she was in Moscow. By shifting our position several times, we made out with almost equal surety that she, too, was shadowing us. 
but sasha knowing that his nerves and my own were badly strained at that time was loath to be frightened out of his course two bells sounded and we started for the train at the gate where tickets are examined sasha looked back and saw the man whom we had been warned against immediately behind me just beyond the gate stood the woman whose face i knew so well she seemed to be waiting for someone four weeks later i learned quite accidentally that this very woman had been on my trail more or less continuously for several months sasha and i both took in the situation at a glance and sasha whispered to me i don't want to die to-morrow this job at any rate must be finished first we boarded the train passed through the cars dropped off the other side into the yard and got into a side street behind the station once more the police net closed empty the next day sasha made his way to st petersburg via vilna Two weeks later he participated in a terrorist coup near Kiev, then fled to Warsaw and the Polish frontier. He paid some money to a Jew whom he knew of, who smuggled him into Austria one night. Three months later, when I was in Paris, I called on Sasha and Nastasia, where they were living on a top floor of a house on a street leading off the Boulevard Saint-Michel, opposite to the Luxembourg Gardens. They were both working hard at chemistry, agriculture, history, and philosophy, looking forward to the time when they could re-enter their own country to participate in the final overthrow of the autocracy, and then serve as teachers of the people through the long, serious period of the Reconstruction. End of chapter 19, part 2《Section 31 of the Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros The Red Rain The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland Chapter 20, Part 1, With the Russian Workman Mr. Medhurst, the charming and companionable British consul for Southeast Russia, urged my visiting Yusafka in the government of Yekaterinoslav. Come down for a weekend, he urged. You will see the deepest mines and the deepest mills in the country. You will find conditions favorable for visiting the workmen in their homes as well as watching them at work. And besides, you will see a British colony in Russia that I am prouder of than anything else in this whole country. We were then in Rostov-on-Don. Yusafka is difficult to reach from any point, but Mr. Medhurst wired Mr. Arthur Hughes, who was in command of the works at Yusafka, that we were leaving Rostov early that evening and would reach a certain junction at 1 a.m., from this junction to Yusafka, the railroad is owned by the new Russia Company, and a special train would have to be sent to meet us. The ride to Taganrok on the Sea of Azov through the gathering night was quickly made, and from there our road turned west and inward. Mr. Methurst told me fascinating tales of ancient Greek towns along the way, towns lost to the world centuries ago. The mounds of crumbled dwellings, storm-swept through long years, are almost wholly screened by the soil and turf that sea winds have blown over them. But the story of their forgotten glory will be disclosed when science or commerce toss aside the accumulations of the centuries, revealing the buried temples, the homes of the traders, the relics of a dead civilization. In a drenching rainstorm, we transferred to the private train that was to convey us to Yusafka. It wasn't much of a train, a small freight engine, and a box car, but it answered the purpose. We rattled noisily through the black, tempestuous night toward the flaring furnaces of Yusafka, which we could plainly see ahead. 
Suddenly there was a tremendous shriek from the engine, the brakes shut down, and the train brought to such a rough standstill that both Medhurst and I fell over. The grimy head of the engineer poked through the door, and in a terrified voice the man cried, "'Oh, Baron, Baron, Master, Master, what's to be done? Another train is coming this way on our track.' There was no doubt in my mind what was to be done. In the phrase of the sea, I would order full speed astern. Not so, Medhurst. With the nonchalance of an Englishman, in full command of himself and the situation, Medhurst replied, "'Go back to your engine. Open your whistle. Ring your bell, if you have one. Drive ahead at top speed. Make enough noise to warn every train on the track. If they don't hear, run through them.' I trembled at these words, but Medhurst knew the men he was dealing with. The other train pulled up and backed away the instant our whistle began to toot, and we rolled into Yusafka station in safety. Mr. Hughes had sent a carriage for us, a great open barouche drawn by a pair of magnificent black Orloff horses that travelled over the ground much faster than the local trains. The Hughes's house is like a delightful English country home, built for comfort, with ample room for guests, and a large stable across the court. Arthur Hughes welcomed us, and led us directly to a tempting supper, hot soup and a cold bird. "'You'll forgive my sending a goods car for you, gentlemen,' he began, almost before we got into the house. "'But the mother of one of the men fell ill, and we had to send her to a hospital on another line.' i knew you would rather ride in the goods car so i sent her off in the regular car it was nearing four o'clock when hughes showed me my room as he said good night he lingered at the threshold as if anxious to say something what is it i asked say old man i hate like the deuce to say it you are my guest and all that you know but we are in bad times now you won't mind putting your revolver within easy reach will you I laughed and assured him I was quite accustomed to that in Russia. But Hughes was obviously chagrined that he had to make the request. The house is guarded, he added, and everything will probably be all right, but we have to be prepared for anything you know. Good night. Mr. Medhurst and I got up late next morning, and as we lingered over a delicious English breakfast, eating slice after slice of toast and marmalade, and drinking far more tea than usual because it was english breakfast tea which is a rarity in russia he told me the romance of yusafka fifty years ago russia was almost completely given over to peasant life the simple wants of the people being supplied by home industries which are still maintained foreign prospectors were the first to realize the vast possibilities of russia's natural resources and to begin to prove them the pioneer among these foreigners was one john hughes a welshman who discovered in the government of yekaterinoslav near the sea of azov rich deposits of iron and coal Hughes was the hard-headed son of a blacksmith who stubbornly fought his way upward until he had become a master shipbuilder. He knew all about iron and much about steel. He knew, too, that in an undeveloped country like Russia it would be impracticable to utilize to advantage on any large scale the richest iron deposits if coal had to be transported. After a good deal of searching, he found both minerals in juxtaposition in South Russia. Coal mining was then so new a thing to Russia that there was no coal mining cast. It had to be created. John Hughes sent to Wales for a number of tried Welsh miners who came out with their families and set up a British industrial community. The idea of Hughes was to make his British men foremen, as soon as possible, in order to establish an industrial class among Russian workmen. Simultaneously, with the inauguration of this enterprise, Russia began to build thousands of miles of railroads, and to encourage the foreign investor, 
subsidized the company in the form of advance orders of such magnitude that the new russia company as it was called in a few years was employing twelve thousand workmen and paying an annual dividend of over twenty per cent the british workmen to-day are all foremen and managers the workmen are all russians thus the iron and steel workers and the coal miners came into existence in russia other companies especially under french and belgian initiative followed john hughes and his new russia company into the field the english employers introduced british housing conditions and british systems so that the russians early had the advantage of western methods wages were low and still are because throughout the country wages are low sporadic strikes have occurred but there are no trade unions as yet it seems to have been the policy of the foreign companies to pay their workmen who have come out to russia from abroad more than the same men would have received at home but to pay the russian workmen the current wages of the country the name Yusafka is a corruption of Hughesafka from John Hughes. Mr. Arthur Hughes, my host, the grandson of old John Hughes, was the only member of the family left at the works of the new Russia company to deal with the men and look after the vast and valuable properties, the holdings of the company. There is always a deal of romance about engineers who carry civilization into the wilderness who wrest earth's treasures from remote plains and unexplored mountains whether in mexico or the andes south africa or interior russia my experience has been that these men are always workaday fellows who resent it when the picturesque and the heroic side of their lives is mentioned and hughes was no exception a rich man the son of a now wealthy family educated at a leading english technical school and in the Carnegie Works in Pittsburgh, an expert in the Bessemer process, a cultivated English gentleman in thought, instincts, manner, and speech, only thirty, master of twelve thousand restless, wretched workmen, in a foreign country, in time of revolution and general lawlessness, and his life constantly threatened, once when he rescued a young Jewish girl from drunken Cossacks, again when he recklessly interfered to save a lot of stupid workmen from a black hundred entanglement such is hughes he lives absolutely alone and coolly attends to business day after day striving to maintain the precedence of his company over all others in russia through the merit and quality of the goods produced after a day or two i began to understand what mr medhurst meant when he urged me to remain at usafka a fortnight hughes will be delighted he said to have some one to whom he can talk in his own tongue and besides it makes another gun in the house as it turned out i remained ten days during that time hughes did everything a perfect and generous host could do not only in regard to helping me to all of the information i wanted concerning the lives of the workmen but also to make my visit happy late afternoons we would ride out over the rolling step straight away as the crow flies and come back by the compass when night began to fall evenings i was initiated into the intricacies of chess which i had never before had the boldness to approach the great industrial section of russia corresponding to the black country of england is in the provinces of the south chiefly about yekaterinoslav here are the deepest coal pits the largest factories and forges the richest iron mines here across the miles of intervening steppe between the villages and towns are always visible the towering stacks of works the nights are made fascinating by the clouds of fire that ever and anon belch starward from the mighty furnaces which melt the ore to fluid and where are fashioned the rails destined to join east with west and north with south and the girders which shall span the great rivers the steppe is a place of vast silence 
the widest expanses of the world's oceans are not lonelier but where the work and industry of men have possessed the steppes claimed the earth and all that lies beneath the fields of waving grain reared structures of stone and metal for the moulding and fashioning of civilization's necessities from these crude riches silence there is none neither night nor day the summer winds which gently bow the corn on the encircling fields are laden with the sounds of mighty hammer strokes grinding wheels the shrieks of whistles and the laboured puffing of the engines over the steppe broods the mystic spell of limitless nature over the industrial plains which are the steppe in transition is the palpable heartbeat of the workaday world and the men whose labor is the soul of these great industries are themselves like the country of the past and of the future few have permanently left the soil the men who swelter in the glare and blinding heat of the blast furnaces who turn the cooling metal in the rolling mills pause in their labor and see in the distance a hut of stone and mud with a roof of thatch and about it a farm a farm too small and too poor to support them and their families yet to them home the russian workman is an industrian through necessity some there are of course who have tired of this dual existence and have relinquished the farmland as time goes on more and more will do this the working class will cease to be the inert mass it is to-day and will become a potent factor in the country but to-day this working class is largely composed of men who work in the mills and factories while their families work the land or rent their land or who hire cheap labor for their land or who themselves drop their tools lay by their picks and drills quit the furnace and the forge at spring and harvest time and return to the open to sow and to reap russian workers therefore are workmen in the making or at best men not yet weaned from the soil workmen of the first generation with the blood and traditions and even the property of the peasant the phrase russian workman is really an anomaly the russian workman properly so called is a development of the future hewers of wood there are in russia and drawers of water but professional workmen in the technical english sense referring to the men whose entire lives are spent in the factories and workshops are few industries there are aplenty factories foundries mines and workshops but a great part of the men found in them are representative of a transition period a hybrid production part peasant part artisan serfdom in russia was a recognized institution until but yesterday as it were and to-day eighty per cent of the population are people of the land tillers of soil guardians of cattle and the man with the hoe is not technically a workman time has about the same value to the russian workman that it has to the russian at large chs directly in an hour or two when we get round to it the russian workman's day is twelve hours long but the number of holidays church and state are appalling to a european at easter for example there are ten days marked in red on russian calendars if a factory runs every working day in the year that means two hundred and twenty days but there are few workmen who pretend to work even every working day yet he must so regulate his living as to have enough reserve from his wages to carry him through the holidays this is simplified for him by the regulations of the church which prescribes long and stringent fasts at these times the expenditure for food is reduced to a minimum likewise the efficiency and productivity of the man it is no uncommon thing for workmen of massive frame and naturally strong physique to faint from exhaustion in the mills during the long fasts energy crispness of action interest in the work are all impossible under such conditions the working day begins at six o'clock 
it is the practice to begin on an absolutely empty stomach, not even a glass of tea. At half-past eight there is a half-hour for breakfast, which usually consists of tea and pierogi, a kind of warm bread with chopped meat in the centre, or fish. From nine o'clock till one there is work without intermission, then dinner. The usual dinner is a kind of soup called shti, or borscht. This is more of a stew than a soup, for it contains chopped cabbage, carrots, and other vegetables, and a chunk of boiled meat. The soup is gulped down first, then the meat. Sweets are only included on holidays. This must suffice until six o'clock, when the day's work is done, and the workman returns to his hovel, be it farmhouse or lodging, and sits alone with his steaming samovar, drinking many glasses of tea. And for solid food, meat and potatoes, or fish and potatoes, and black bread. Tea is always taken from a glass, and without milk or lemon. Nor is the workman extravagant as to sweetening his tea by dropping several pieces of sugar into every glass he drinks. Russian sugar is made very hard, and on account of the excise is three times as costly as in neighboring countries. The workman, like the peasant, places one hard lump between his teeth and strains his tea through it. Thus one small lump answers for a glass. End of chapter 20, part 1section thirty two of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rita boutros the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg darland chapter twenty part two with the Russian workmen. The cost of living is not particularly low in Russia. It is the standard of living that is low. An English workman could not live on the same fare as the Russian workman, and an American workman would not even try. The actual prices of foodstuffs and rentals are lower than in England, much lower than in America, but wages are proportionately lower and the variety of foods in the diet of the russian workman is much less than that of the english or american workman the wages of a common laborer are seventy-five kopecks or thirty-five cents a day men of the type who attend the blast furnaces in the metal works average sixty-five cents a day while the rollers who are accounted skilled workmen and are paid by the month receive one hundred and twenty-five roubles or sixty-three dollars these however are only the very best men the second men who make up the majority receive from twenty-five to thirty dollars monthly coal miners are sometimes paid according to the amount of work they do and sometimes by the day as in england and america but their total income either way does not amount to more than fifteen or twenty dollars a month. The rank and file of laborers do not average above twenty dollars a month. These figures all refer to the best paid industries. The first expenditure is for house rent. The common price for an ordinary workman's house is four rubles or two dollars a month. This includes two rooms and a kitchen, sometimes a cellar, frequently an outside pantry, which not uncommonly contains a stove, in order that in the summer months, when the heat is great, the cooking may be done outside of the main house. Workmen's houses in industrial Russia are of three general types. First, the houses built and owned by the companies and rented to the men, or loaned to them without cost. Second, the average workman's house, and third, the artel, or lodging for single men. The company house is the poorest type. The occupants of these houses are only the poorest workmen. There are unskilled artisans in every mill and factory whose wages are small. 
so the companies make up for this in small part by giving them the rental these houses if rented would bring about one dollar or one dollar and a half per month one-tenth of the wages goes for house rent this is so general that it may be stated dogmatically men living in free houses make from ten to fifteen dollars a month men living in the four rouble houses average forty roubles or twenty to twenty five dollars a month the skilled men are so few that they occupy the better type of house such as usually is occupied by foremen the artel or lodging house is a curious institution common throughout russia from twelve to sixteen single men live together in specially built houses consisting of one large common sleeping-room a common kitchen and eating-room and a small ante-room for the caretaker the caretaker is usually an old woman she scrubs the floors does all the chores and acts in every capacity the living is of the crudest and cheapest twelve roubles or six dollars a month is the common price paid by each lodger this includes food one rouble or fifty cents additional is paid for the rent the caretaker gets the difference between expenditures for the food and supplies and the total amount paid by the men the sleeping accommodations are very simple in some artels there are plank platforms one foot to eighteen inches from the floor and on these the men lie like packed sardines in others each man has a crude bed there is a stove at one end of the room and on the walls usually colored pictures chromos the only decoration save the ever-present icon in the corner near the ceiling the morality of the russian workman is mainly negative religion is everywhere or at least ecclesiasticism but what religion is or means in russia is hard to determine church-going is general the most striking building in each village and town is the church the clatter and din of church bells breaks out at any hour within are invariably garish decorations of gilt and gold the workmen like the peasants always remove their hats and cross themselves many times when passing a church and when they enter they have every appearance of piety and devotion russian churches do not have pews or seats the congregation stands or individuals at their own will and pleasure so far as i could discover kneel and pray and bow forward until their foreheads rest upon the paved floor i have seen a cab driver asleep upon the box of his cab when hit upon the back by a companion awake startled and instantly as if by instinct whip off his hat and cross himself on every hand are evidences of ecclesiastical power and influence and yet what does it stand for one is not shocked or surprised to find a drunken priest on the street the most devout drink to excess at stated times they pillage plunder and steal goods and chattels and other men's wives so far as one can judge religion has no grip whatever upon the hearts of the people no influence on their conduct of life at the same time the forms of the church are scrupulously maintained the fasts are adhered to to the physical detriment of the people and no house is without its icon but there is no commandment that is not lightly broken it would be wrong however to convey the impression that the russian workman is a drunkard he is not he drinks at certain stated times only usually when he draws his pay drink does not seriously interfere with business in russian industrial centers there are drunkards in every community in russia as in most countries but on the whole the per capita consumption of alcohol among the workmen is not great and with the exception of the one day in the month which follows the pay-day the workmen are not given to drunkenness sundays and holidays might be added morality is a totally different question a gentleman who for thirty years has been the paymaster of one of the largest works in russia went so far as to say to me morality is unknown among russian workmen 
in this respect industrial russia to-day is not unlike industrial england immediately after the industrial revolution the breaking up of the homes and emigration have always resulted in a lowering of ethical and moral standards compared with the english and american workman the russian is inferior physically he should be capable of greater endurance and effort for his frame is large and heavy but weakened by his insufficient diet and too rigid adherence to the fasts prescribed by the church he has so undermined his strength and so reduced his capacity that in the run of months and years he is worth only one-third of an english workman and not more than one-fourth of an american a Russian looks a long time at his work before he begins, said a mine foreman to me. Figures furnished me by superintendents and employers demonstrated that the average English workman can do the work of three Russians. The Russian is listless. He does not understand the reason for hurry. Tomorrow is as good as today. He has not been trained by discipline, nor encouraged by the reward which should accrue to the thrifty and the pushing. Looked at critically, he is good raw material, but very raw and very crude. Like the country at large, the Russian workman promises well under proper conditions, and if sufficient time and capital are invested in him, he will develop an adequate earning capacity but his religion must first be tempered with intelligence. He must learn to make the best use and the most use of his naturally strong physique, and his economic condition must so alter that it will appear to him worth his while to devote himself with more heart to his work. He must adopt a much higher standard of living, and demand recompense for his labor that will enable him to maintain that advanced standard." Under the present system, industry is not rewarded by promotion. A miner, for example, can never become a stager, nor a stager an engineer. Having once taken the examination for the lower post, all further advancement is precluded. Also, the line between industrialism and peasantry must be more sharply drawn. The man who is farmer in summer and plate roller in winter may be none the less a good farmer, but he is very much less valuable as a plate roller. The two lines of life are parallel, but they don't interlace. One day I climbed into a huge metal basket and was lowered 2,500 feet toward the earth's heart. The walls of the shaft were of splendid firm masonry, great blocks of stone like granite. The engines which controlled the descent were equipped with the most modern patents for haulage, automatic brakes, and indicators. At another mine I gingerly placed one leg in a small wooden affair like a nail keg, grasped a hemp rope from which the keg was suspended with one hand, and was swung out over a dark well called a shaft and with the other hand and the other leg, the one outside the keg, maintained an unsteady balance and saved myself from too violent contact with the sides, as two horses jogged round a ring, unwinding a drum, allowing the keg and its load to go jerkily bottomward. Here the shaft sides were of timber, crude wooden slats interlaced after the fashion of a crib, the former was the result of the English influence, the latter was pure Russian. Between the Russian miner and the French, Belgian, or British miner is this difference. The Russian has not the blood of coal miners in his veins, nor the traditions of underground workers handed down to him from preceding generations. Whereas the others are generally miners by tradition and breeding, the Russian is really a peasant driven from his land to seek a living where he can find it. Mining is a casual choice with him. He would as leaf be in the rolling mill or tending one of the coke ovens. This system of labor, which permits workmen to spend part of the year on their farms and part in the mines and mills, is a symptom of Russia's industrial revolution. The workers who do this are called the go-aways, and make up a large percentage of the workmen in the industrial districts of South Russia, 
with the result that they are poor agriculturalists and second-rate workers slowly the system will pass and industrial towns composed of a permanent population be established the russian peasant has been on the land so long that he has little ambition to leave it when the land is worked out exhausted and the annual harvest is no longer sufficient to keep the souls and bodies of his family together he goes off to the towns the vast area of european russia given solely to agriculture makes it often necessary for the peasant to travel far to find winter employment thus north russians have a journey of fifteen hundred or two thousand miles to the south russian mines and factories this is a goodly distance for a peasant when harvest time comes year after year the worker more and more shrinks from going back to his patch of land to reap the meagre harvest and each year some give up the thought and remain at their work many more however have a bread-in-the-bone love for the soil and with a political revolution in the atmosphere with a general cry from one end of the empire to the other of land land they come up out of the black depths of the coal pits and back to their desiatines in the hope that one day other desiatines will be given them and they may leave their proletarian life forever naturally this condition does not produce miners or other workers of the best type and hence the coal miners of the donitz basin do not compare favorably with the coal miners of england or america one of the great drawbacks to the progress of the coal industry among russians is the russian engineer russian law provides that the chief engineer at each colliery shall be a russian or at least shall possess a russian certificate which amounts to the same thing there seems to be universal agreement that the russian mining engineer is rarely a practical man trained in a mediocre technological school he comes to a colliery resplendent in a long coat with silver buttons and gold insignia this coat rarely comes off a russian engineer never goes down into a pit if he can avoid doing so i can testify that i usually saw them strutting about above ground and always wearing their good clothes looking much more like officers on parade than practical engineers the feeling against these dressed-up theoreticians is very strong among pit foremen managers and all practical miners if a coal miner becomes expert in any particular line of work he may become a section boss but as for working up from the ranks it is unheard of and impossible according to present laws if a man desires to become a manager he must make up his mind to this before going into the mines at all then pass a manager's examination after which he may never occupy any other post the russian coal miner like most russian workmen persists in clinging to the inherited idea that the land is where man belongs that the land is for the people and his work in the mines is merely to supply him with food and raiment till the people shall come into possession of the land when he will lay down his tools and go back to the soil this is the prime reason for his backwardness the russian coal miner is naturally careless and lackadaisical time is meaningless to him he lacks caution in his work and handles explosive as if they were minerals as harmless as coal the government understanding this characteristic largely removes responsibility from the workman and places it upon the employer by granting high compensation in cases of accident the employer, therefore, takes extraordinary precautions through his managers. This system is by no means a bad one, for in presupposing the ignorance and carelessness of undisciplined workmen, the chance for accident is reduced to a minimum. The government also protects the children. No boy may be employed at manual labor, or for a full day, until he has attained his fifteenth year at the age of thirteen a boy may go into an office for half days to encourage schooling a boy who passes the third grade in the common schools is excused from sixteen months soldiering 
These are comparatively recent regulations, copied, I believe, from Germany. There is no gainsaying their value and reasonableness. That such wise laws as these should be found in connection with an industry where there are such absurd restrictions, as, for instance, the preventing of practical miners from becoming superiors, is typically Russian. Not political revolution alone threatens Russia today. Industrially, there is every symptom of the disorganization which precedes an industrial revolution. I found Russian workmen agitating armed revolt because they wanted more land. That is the slogan of the peasants. The workingmen stand for supporting the peasants in this, in order, as some of them expressed it, that they may quit the industries and return to the land. So long as workmen look upon their work as a temporary expediency, Russia will not develop a strong working class. But this is only incident to the transition. Revolution, armed or unarmed, must evolve change, and with the wider liberties and scope for individual development which Russia soon will have, the workmen will have opportunities to develop their own industries, for the present the prime thing is change, immediate and radical change. It matters not what the shibboleth, so long as it leads to this. Thus far the workmen have not been allowed to consider themselves as a class. Any form of organization is prohibited by the government. Any effort toward industrial betterment, improved conditions, or any of the reforms which are common movements in England and America are unheard of and unknown in Russia. The wonder is that the Russian workman is as good as he is under existing conditions. Given freedom of belief, freedom from ecclesiastic superstition, freedom from civil slavery, freedom of organization, and the Russian workman will develop a vista leading to his own better day. The tenth day of my stay in Yusavka, I was called back to Moscow by telegram. The call was urgent, so I determined to catch a train from a station some fourteen miles away, which left just at dawn. Hughes himself put me into the same barouche that had brought Mr. Medhurst and me to the home I now left with genuine regret, and drawn by the same black Orloffs. "'I'm sending two trusted men with you,' Hughes said, as I gripped his hand in farewell. "'Both are well armed.' And we rolled out of the gate and into the cool night where furnace fires belched flaring flames above near and far horizons and where the rattle of mine-shaft wheels and cars intruded upon the stillness which properly is the birthright of night but here is unknown end of chapter twenty part two section thirty three of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rita Boutros. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Darland Chapter 21 Part 1 Tolstoy, Odessa, Constantinople a sojourn in Russia seemed incomplete without a pilgrimage to Tolstoy. Russia's grand old man attracts travelers from all corners of the earth, and though it seemed an unpardonable intrusion for an unheard-of citizen of a distant country to call upon the seer in his own home, to draw upon his strength and time, I was deeply grateful to receive an invitation to visit a dear friend and disciple of his, who lives on the estate of the Count's eldest daughter, for I knew that this would mean a happy meeting with the one man in all Russia I desired most to see. The year had turned November when this invitation came, and I was already looking forward to quitting the land of struggle and chaos. Tula, the town of Tolstoy's home, is almost the exact center of European Russia, and is reached from Moscow. Yasneya Polyana, Tolstoy's house, is located something over two hours' drive from Tula station. 
Yasnaya Poliana, that is to say, pleasant clearing in the woods, and never did the home of the prophet seem more fittingly named than now, when confusion and chaos roll unchanneled from the Baltic eastward, from European frontiers northward, covering an empire. Tolstoy looks across the seas of tumult, his hoary head towering above the wreckage, his superbly discerning vision penetrating a beyond still hid from the masses of his countrymen. And it is also true that the elements of to-day are as clear before him as before other men. He sees them all, an incompetent government, a struggling but thus far incapable revolution, twenty-seven millions of starving peasants, a disloyal navy, an untrustworthy army, a paper constitution, and a reactionary regime. All these things he sees, views them calmly, and picks out a clear line of progress that leads to a goal where all of the black road will be justified. Of him, surely, is it true, he has a faith that meets a thousand cheats, yet drops no jot of faith. Tolstoy alone among Russians to-day is able to see his country's plight in perspective. Snow softly blanketed the earth and coated the bare trees of great Russia when I said farewell to St. Petersburg and Moscow, and made toward the center of the country to the station called Tula. A simple muzik with a handmade sledge, scarcely higher off the ground than a sled, offered to drive me out to the home where I was to be a guest, adjoining the Count's place. The horse did not look any too robust for the trip, but the Yamchik, peasant driver, assured me that the horse was the best to be had, and strong enough to accomplish the distance. As soon as we had left the streets of the town and struck the open country, the man opened a friendly conversation. He began by telling me he had only recently come back from Manchuria, where he had served all through the war. It was evident that he had not enjoyed the service particularly, and when I sympathized with him, he told me how, after the first battle, he and several of his companions held a secret council. They were all agreed that war was a bad job. In the first place, not one of them knew just why they were fighting, and the idea of shooting at people whom they did not know, and in return being shot at, appeared to them as wrong. At the same time, the government and their officers made them do these things. One soldier from Tula suggested writing to Tolstoy. A letter was indicted and sent to Yasnaya Poliana. In the course of time, these soldiers received their answer, in which Tolstoy told them that he believed all war was wrong, that the army had no business in Manchuria, and that if the consciences of the soldiers troubled them, they should not shoot. After that, continued my driver, we always knew what to do. We knew in our hearts that it was wrong to fight under such circumstances. We marched into battle because we had to, but after a few minutes our officers would all disappear. Then we all ran away. We ran every time afterward. I told the story to a Red Cross nurse later for the humor of it. She laughingly said she was sure it was literally true because one night after the Battle of Mukden, a young captain was brought into her ward with an injured head. His wounds were not serious, and shortly after they had been bandaged, the officer began to laugh loudly. She went over to him and asked what amused him so greatly. "'The way I was wounded,' he replied. "'Our regiment had not been long exposed to the fire when I decided it was too hot for comfort. I looked all about for some place of shelter.' At last I espied a small gully or ravine, so suddenly, running toward it, I leapt in, only to find my general and my colonel there before me. Well, there wasn't room for all three of us, so we began to nudge and push each other, for none wanted to get into the open again. Finally the general said to me, "'Captain, you are not showing becoming deference to your superior officers, sir.' At that I had to crawl out. As I did so, a shell exploded nearby, and a piece of it hit me in the forehead, causing my wound. The second night after my arrival at the house where I was a guest, I was taken over to Yasnaya Poliana. 
Tolstoy had been informed of my presence in the neighborhood, and had graciously suggested to my friend that she bring me to see him. The fast-falling late autumn night was settling over the snowfields and silver woods as we climbed the knoll upon which Yasnaya Poliana House stands. In summer the place must have a fascinating charm, for all the elements of a beautiful country park are there. Flower-beds and wildwood, orchards, groves, and arbored walks, a bit of water, fields rolling toward distant horizons, broad sky, and vistas that hold one surmounting the knoll a pleasant house large enough without being grand comfortable without pretension at the door a black poodle barked a welcome a man-servant helped us to unload the heavy garments we wore against the cold of a russian november night with not unexpected directness we were taken straight to the count's study there he sat near a table desk which was littered with piles of letters and papers good evening he called cheerily and quite as though i were an old friend his hands which were extended in welcome were warm as if the fires of his strong life and body still burned fiercely as when he commanded men on sebastopol bastions ranged over the unconquered caucasus and hunted with the most daring of his comrades through great russian forests he had been horseback riding in the afternoon he told us surely few men carry the weight of seventy-eight years with more vigor the first words of greeting over he began to ask about his friends in america men whom he knows personally or by reputation a conversation with a neighbor from one's own home town on a chance meeting in a foreign land would scarcely have been different there was a delightful eagerness for word-of-mouth news names of men in new york slipped as easily from his tongue as from one of his own circle shelves of books in many languages walled the room from floor to eye level while above hung portraits of many thinkers who have or should have influenced the world prominent among them henry george and william lloyd garrison do you read garrison tolstoy asked as my wandering eyes rested on the portrait of our own champion of liberty do you read channing thoreau emerson i always ask americans about those four great men they should be read by the young men of to-day a tall candle burning on the table by his right side threw its restless gleams across the old man's rugged face and involuntarily my mind ran incredulously over the intensely human career whose latter days are now marked by such inspiring serenity we could not long keep off the subject of Russia and her troubles, however, and at last I ventured to ask him what was his interpretation of the movement of things in Russia at the moment. Tolstoy pointed to an old volume of Rousseau's Emile lying on a table at the other side of the room and asked me to bring it to him. Turning over the pages of Book Four till he found the paragraph he sought he paused then read very slowly and with emphasis these sentences on dit qu'il fallait une révélation pour apprendre aux hommes la manière dont deux vouloir être servi on a signe en préserve la diversité des cultes bizarres qu'ils ont institués et l'on ne voit pas que cette diversité même vient de la fantaisie des révélations dès que les peuples se sont avisés de faire parler d'eux chacun l'a fait parler à sa mode et lui a fait dire ce qu'il a voulu si l'on n'eût écouté qu'est-ce que de dit au cours de l'homme il n'y aura jamais aucune religion sur la terre the last sentence he read twice and then handed the book across the table that i might absorb the passage this is what we have all got to learn, he said, to listen to the words God speaks to us in our hearts. We need no other religion or philosophy than this. We need no institution like a church. This message is for the people of America as well as for Russia. And the whole significance of the present terrible situation in Russia is that the Russian people are being brought to the point where every other channel will be closed and only by turning to God will they be able to save themselves. 
in other words tolstoy sees as every one in russia must see that the drift of things is toward an abyss and tolstoy reads into this tendency a deeply religious meaning he accepts it as part of a divine plan and he firmly believes that the russian people will come to look upon their situation as a call from god to discard their ancient superstitions and to inaugurate a new era in which each individual will endeavor to readjust his life into conformity with the infinite Tolstoy appreciates, as does everyone in Russia, that the Russian liberal movement aims to effect a social revolution, and that a successful political revolt will only mark the beginning of the struggle. Tolstoy does not view this as do most Russian thinkers, however. He does not accept the accomplishment of a socialistic state as a goal at all, for he distrusts the economics of socialism and as a philosophy he rejects socialism vehemently it is not a second-rate but a hundredth-rate philosophy he says the present growth of socialism he went on in explanation is to be accounted for in precisely the same way as the present popularity of inferior literature poetry drama and art it is all part of a passing phase M. Leroy Bollou, the French writer, said Tolstoy, was here not long ago, and he said to me, The Russian Revolution, it is for fifty years. That may be, but in the end, whether ten years or fifty years, a new era of righteousness will be established in Russia. Late in the evening we adjourned to the dining-room, where were the countess and a party of about a dozen. A more varied group one seldom meets under one roof, there was the Count, strong in his faith, confident in the truth of his own philosophy of Christian anarchism. There was a son who, during the Japanese war, was a patriot, a loyal subject of the Tsar, and as such volunteered for service in arms and served in Manchuria. There was the eldest brother of this soldier's son, a constitutional democrat, or middle-of-the-road man, and next to him a sister who is married to a man who is an Octoberist, a conservative deputy to the first Duma, and she shares her husband's political opinions. Also there was a disciple of Count Tolstoy, who believes not in war or parliaments at all, and a social revolutionist who believes ardently in revolution and even in terrorism. Each was true to his own convictions, and perfectly outspoken. When the Count had drunk his glass of tea, little heeding the babble of conversation around the board, he pushed back his chair, and for several moments slowly paced the room. The huge dining-room, warm with hospitality, afforded a striking picture that night. Against the high dark walls stood out several life-size oil portraits. In one corner a grand piano, near it a table on which were strewn a pack of cards, and opposite a cosy corner. In the centre of the room, the long dining-table around which were gathered the company, at one end a steaming samovar. Slowly back and forth paced the Count, now in the shadow, now in the light, his shaggy grey beard against his dark blue peasant blouse so stalwart so vigorous so keen to all things he seemed above all so serene in spirit for he glories in the present dark hour of his country believing it harbingers the approach of dawn the awakening of the russian people to a consciousness of a grander destiny than they have dreamed of before when as true sons of god they shall realize that heaven of which the dogmatic preachers talk only not in a distant future but here on earth. However often it may be true that a prophet is without honor in his own country, Tolstoy is honored and revered by the peasants in the villages of Tula, and his own influence throughout Russia is very great. Curiously enough, though, it is his unconscious influence which is greatest. Tolstoy, above all living men, is the apostle of non-resistance and passive resistance, but in Russia all resistance of necessity becomes active resistance. Tolstoy pamphlets on the horrors and evils of war, perhaps more than any other influence, have brought army service into disrepute with the people. 
the russian people hold their enforced military service as one of their prime grievances and to avoid such service every ruse and device is resorted to from bribery and perjury to open passive resistance that is stubborn refusal to carry arms but the government views this attitude as opposed to its interests and consequently revolutionary refusal to bear arms in russia is punished by imprisonment Tolstoy told me of a peasant thus imprisoned who replied to the court that sentenced him, Very well, imprison me. I shall pray for you and my unhappy country, whose rulers make men do evil. The beginnings of resistance have been inspired by Tolstoy's peaceful and Christian writings in thousands of cases, and eventually fruited in revolutionaryism and insurrection. This unconscious influence, which Tolstoy has exerted during the last decade, and more especially during the last two years, is enormous. Peasants in every section of Russia knew more or less about Tolstoy, and while not professing to be Tolstoyans, nevertheless admit that the beginning of their criticism of the government, and the first inspiration to trust to their own thinking, came from one or another of Tolstoy's writings. Doubtless there are thousands of people all over the world who owe, even if they do not recognize, a like debt to this great restive spirit, the dynamic of whose life has been both innate and conscious moral earnestness. A moral leader of the force and caliber of Tolstoy cannot fail to impress a generation, and this is Tolstoy's contribution to life and the world. He has quickened men to thought and action, and he has pointed a goal and standard above all others in the God which dwells within each and every human being. Upon leaving Tula, I went south to the Crimea. On the train I read Tolstoy's Sebastopol sketches, which contain about the most graphic descriptions of war ever written. Curiously enough, the season of the year when I first saw Sebastopol was the same as Tolstoy describes upon his arrival in the besieged city in 1854. During all my stay there, I could not get away from the remarkable coincidental similarity in conditions, December 1854 and December 1906. To be sure, Sebastopol was not besieged by alien foes from without but it was besieged by revolutionists from within. This, like most ports and all naval stations, is a revolutionary stronghold. Only the day before my arrival, an admiral or port officer had been assassinated. Sentinels patrolled the streets at intervals of one hundred feet. The hotel kissed was guarded. Small bodies of troops were moving in different parts of the city and when the early morning mist lifted a half-dozen warships were revealed lying at anchor for several hours during the forenoon large forces of cavalry and light artillery were kept manoeuvring in the plain across the narrow strip of water from the pristan it might just as well have been a besieged city save for the lack of wounded and dead men the outward aspects of the town were every whit as warlike and everywhere were the signs of martial law. End of chapter 21, part 1
not so much because of the Jews as on account of the powerful Black Hundred organization made up of waterfront laborers and the lowest elements of a special city, who, under government tutelage, from time to time break loose upon the Jews. Incipient and real massacres are apt to break out there any time. The Governor-General, Kalbars, is a notorious reactionary and encourages every form of repression. I had studied the Jewish question in many other places, and in Odessa, as in Warsaw, Vilna, and other Jewish centers, I became convinced that the Russian government, by its extraordinarily blind and stupid policy, has itself created the Jewish problem. If the five million Jews who are now in Russia were scattered among the 140 million people of the Russian Empire, they would scarcely be noticed. But Russia chose the arbitrary part, and closed to the Jews all but a tiny strip of the empire. In only nine governments, and in Poland, many Jews live, and these are the districts which constitute the Pale, South Russia, Poland, and the Baltic provinces. Having corralled all the Jews over whom it has jurisdiction, the Russian government then proceeded to enact a long series of special discriminative laws and to inaugurate special Jewish taxes. Stripped of every right and privilege of citizenship and manhood, save one, the right to pay taxes, the Jews of Russia have had no other recourse than to develop their mental powers. This they have done most creditably under circumstances quite as adverse as learning arithmetic from a borrowed textbook, by the light of a rail fire during the hours between the end of the workday and sleep time. And now because he has given himself devotedly up to the one thing left him, and has been successful, he is feared. Whatever may have been the original motives of the Tsars in the restrictions they laid upon the Jews, the present attitude of Jew-baiting Russians is based upon jealous fear. One thing all observers mark, outspoken bitterness against the Jews on the part of peasants, flourishes in the parts where the Jews are not. Within the pale most often does one find champions of the Jew. Nearly every telegraph correspondent for the foreign press, who hastened to Bielostok at the time of the massacre, commented on the testimony of the townspeople that, to quote one of them, the Jews and Christians had always lived together like brothers. The Jew is much more apt to be suspicious of the Christian than is the non-Jew to nourish ill-will against the Jews, whom he comes into frequent contact with. If it is not literally true that to know is to love, it at least may be said that to know is to tolerate, with regard to the Jews in Russia. The persecution of the Jews in Russia originates with official Russia, and the bitterness which their weakness and fears inspire is passed on to the people through the government's agents, often the priests, through the government press, and through the scapegoat, underling officials who are immediately above the actual perpetrators of the dire deeds, and below the higher officials who are morally responsible. The massacre of Bielostok was executed as a diabolical and fantastic orgy by the police and the soldiers. They deliberately shot little children. They ravished, then murdered young girls. They tortured men by the wildest and most excruciating devices and the police and soldiers, incidentally, looted Jewish shops and carried away pockets full of watches from jewelers and cash when they could get it. The governor of the district was removed, but not in disgrace. The actual perpetrators of these deeds still administer the law in Bielostok. The children and the families of the murdered see them every time they go out. I saw them when I was there. They walked about with heads in the air, as if they had done a noble thing, and were worthy, like war heroes. And the story of Bielostok is practically the very same as the story of Gomel, of Kishinev, and Odessa, save that in Odessa there is a stronger black hundred element of hooligans and rowdies, who, for a pittance, are glad to lend themselves to the unscrupulous and murderous police. Such conditions drive the older and weaker Jews to America, and the more spirited of the younger generation to revolution. 
It is the height of absurdity for the Russian government to excuse its Jewish oppression on the ground that the Jews are revolutionary. By nature and by tradition they are the opposite of aggressive and militant. They are revolutionary because the Russian government is oppressive and because they know no other course. The Russian Jew is docile, domestically inclined, and peace-loving naturally but when exasperated beyond endurance he becomes a daring antagonist. Surely it is no reflection against the Jewish race that the stronger men and women resent the endless insults that Russia heaps upon them. Even the passport of a Jew is differentiated. Fifteen thousand Jews gave up their lives in Manchuria during the course of the late inglorious war, in which they had no interest and for which they had no sympathy. Fifteen thousand more were wounded in the same ignominious cause. And yet Manchuria remains closed to the Jews as a place of settlement. Thirty thousand Jewish victims in one war. Yet no Jew may be an officer in the army or navy. It is characteristic that Jewish doctors should be called upon to combat epidemics of plague, and then are expelled from the district after the conquering of the disease. No Jew may take an active interest in any mining enterprise in Russia, nor may he engage in the oil trade, which in the Caucasus offers large possibilities. No Jew may buy or rent land. Only a very small proportion, three to five percent, of the children in the middle schools and universities may be Jews. The complete list of exceptional laws designed to curb the Jews extends to extraordinary length, and when they have been all gone through and applied, the Jew still has the yet more terrible situation to face in the spirit of his civil governors, who seek in every petty way to annoy him, to terrorize him, and every now and again to impress all of the Jews with the stubborn fact that they are Jews, and as such liable to slaughter without further notice. These are some of the reasons why the younger and braver Jews have a personal interest in the Russian Revolution, and why the older ones hail America as a promised land. The revolutionary movement is becoming less and less Jewish, not because the Jews are becoming subdued as a result of their continual persecution, but because the Russian population is increasing so much faster than the Jewish it is no class or party struggle, the revolution. It is a dynastic revolt. The great mass of the Russian people are done with the House of Romanov, and they want a new regime. Each different section of people has its own reasons, but none are more potent than the reason of the Jews. An appeal in the Novo Vremya, the semi-official newspaper of St. Petersburg, suggested that all trade should be interdicted to Jews, that all Jewish schools should be closed, and that Jews should be excluded from the secondary and higher schools, that all Jews who return to Russia should be interned in the northern part of Siberia, that Jews should be debarred from work on all newspapers, and that all Jewish property should be sold within five years. This appeal was printed in the press of the city prefect on March 4, 1906. On October 25, 1905, M. Lavrov, who was at that time an official of the Ministry of the Interior, sent round a circular demanding a general union of all who love their country against the Jews. An appeal freely circulated amongst the local troops before the Bielostok pogrom runs as follows. A foreign enemy has roused up the Jap against Russia. On the quiet, across the seas and oceans, the foreign czars, meaning, of course, more particularly, King Edward and the President, armed the enormous Japanese people against us. Then arose our strength of Russia. The foreign czars got scared. The hair bristled up on their heads, their skins crinkled with chill, and they thought of a mean idea, to undermine the heart of the Russian soldier, to shake his ancient Christian faith and his love for our father Tsar. They brought into the soldiers' ranks, almost wholly through Jews and hirelings, whole mountains of print, and also heaps of gold, that they might buy base souls. 
but our army turned away from these new judases the foreign czars blushed there began in russia an internal confusion again the fierce foreign foe sets his snares through his friends always the jews and the hirelings that he may seize altogether the land of our fathers but he never put his own head in the way of our cannon but bought through the jews the souls of russians christians brothers tread in the steps of christ cry out with one voice away with the jewish kingdom down with the red flag down with the red jewish freedom at the foe russian soldiers forward 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 they go they go they go this appeal was printed by the military staff of odessa odessa is the headquarters if not the cradle of the black hundred or league of russian men i had anticipated a certain reluctance on the part of the members to impart to me the details of their programme but to my surprise they told me about their juice sticking as if it were a most ordinary plank for the platform of a political party the rooms of the organization were fitted up like a salvation army tea-house gay with bunting and russian flags and the great lot of gilded icons in one corner several chromos of the czar hung on the walls the rooms were crowded both times i visited them with men of precisely the same type as the loungers who occupy salvation army reading rooms casual laborers the shiftless the workless life's derelicts among these were a score or more of young boys ranging from fourteen to twenty of the type described as young roughs i remarked that most of these wore brand new student overcoats so i asked one of these boys pointedly where he got his overcoat from the organization he answered why do you belong to this organization i then asked because of the benefits we have socials and private theatricals and sometimes we get presents like this overcoat what is the object of the organization i asked further to kill the jews he made answer but why do you want to kill the jews oh because the jews are a bad people they are against the czar and they spit on the russian flag and you kill them for those reasons yes certainly they must all leave russia or they will be killed just then the manager of the rooms came up and as i had overheard something said about revolvers i asked him if the members of the organization carried arms oh yes he replied we have fifty men who always carry arms we have to here in odessa there are so many jews here he then showed me his own revolver which was a regular army weapon these arms he said were given them by the police a circular was handed to me setting forth certain aims of the organization it began with the sentence all nationalities are equal except jews and then went on jews during several past years and especially of late have showed themselves irreconcilable enemies to russia and to all russians through their impossible man-hating spirit their complete estrangement from other nationalities their own jewish mind which understands only those neighbors who are jewish toward christians they allow all manner of violence killing included as it is known and as jews have said more than once in their manifestos that the present disturbances and revolutionary movement in russia with daily killing of honest servants of the czar who have remained true to their oath all is nearly exclusively done by jewish hands urged on by jewish money the russian nation understanding this and having the full possibility of using its right of master of the russian land could in one day put down the criminal tendencies of jews and make them bow under its will the will of the crowned master of russia but led by the higher principles of the christian religion and too well knowing its power to reply by way of violence prefers another solution to the jewish question the question which is equally fatal for all civilized nationalities considering that in the last year the jews with all their means are aspiring toward emigration into palestine and formation of their own state 
and believing that their emigration from all countries where they are now living is the only true means of getting humanity rid of the evil which the jews are the league of russian people will use all its means to form a jewish state and assist their emigration to the state regardless of whatever material sacrifices it may require from the russian nation the duma deputies were then appealed to to ask the government to deliberate with other governments with a view to promising international action along these lines in the meantime the circular went on naively all jews in russia are to be regarded as foreigners but with none of the rights or privileges that other foreigners have this attitude will doubtless increase their desire to emigrate to their own state the man who gave me this circular then went on to say that he himself believed that an occasional pogrom was a good thing because it increased the restlessness of the jews and he hoped that by continuing this policy russia would soon be rid of them in response to my request for some printed matter setting forth the aims and objects of the organization i was given a brochure which contained the following definitions number one aim to develop the russian national self-consciousness and strengthen the union of russian people of all classes for the mutual work and prosperity of their dear country number two the welfare of the country depends upon the complete preservation of russian unlimited orthodoxy autocracy and nationality number three the restoration of orthodoxy to its place of dominant influence number four autocracy consists in the union of czar with russian people further the russian language for all nations living within the empire the league takes upon itself the development of the national consciousness through the political life in the spirit of autocracy and spreading among the population christian principles which strengthen patriotism and awaken the sense of duty toward government society and home this is to be done through the usual methods of propaganda schools lectures books brochures and journals then comes the catch line of the whole pamphlet the league recognizes it as a duty to assist brother members in need moral and material dues fifty kopecks twenty five cents a year those who have no money may be relieved from annual dues such is the league of russian men to whom the czar addressed himself in december nineteen o five when accepting for himself and the czarevich the badge of the organization unite russian people i reckon upon you with your assistance i believe i shall be able to conquer the enemies of russia these very words of the czar are now used by the league of russian men as a motto for their official electioneering platform and there has appeared no repudiation on the part of the imperial patron this is a most remarkable and quaint document it consists of four pages set in large type but curiously enough one and a half pages thereof are devoted to the jewish question although all other nationalities are to enjoy civic rights equally with russians jews are to be deprived of such rights and privileges they are moreover to be excluded from all professions they cannot be doctors lawyers chemists contractors teachers librarians etc and public or governmental services under the heading commerce industry and finance we find such a curiosity as this the union will strive to increase the amount of currency by abolishing gold and by the reintroduction of national paper currency under the heading justice stands a clause as follows all offences against state and life robbery and arson preparing keeping carrying and being in possession of explosives by anarchists and reactionaries participation in these crimes harboring offenders also picketing in strikes damaging roads bridges or engines with a view of arresting work or traffic also armed resistance to authorities revolutionary agitation among troops instigating women and children to the above crimes 
all these offences are to be made punishable by death at the time i was in odessa acquainting myself with this organization it enjoyed the distinction of being the only legal political party in russia even the constitutional democrats and the party of peaceful regeneration being under the ban so long as such liberal inducements are made to membership presents of overcoats and firearms tea-rooms free shows and no dues the black hundred will continue to exist under similar inducements a like organization could be got together in london new york or chicago within twenty-four hours the organization employed by the pennsylvania coal operators during the anthracite strike nineteen o two known as the coal and iron police was made up of this class thugs ex-convicts the flotsam and jetsam of our big towns who for daily drink money were prepared to preserve order defy the government or commit murder all of which they did the morning of the day i was to set sail from odessa a strike was declared along the waterfront and stevedores and sailors alike quit their work passengers were informed however that the boats of the volunteer fleet would sail i had taken passage on such a boat an hour before the scheduled time of departure i drove down to the wharf a troop of cossacks clattered behind my carriage most of the way and upon arriving at the quay i found another troop of soldiers lined up to preserve order and cover our departure the actual getting away took nearly two hours owing to what looked to me like the sheer clumsiness of the crew the passengers on that ship were the most motley lot imaginable. There were seven hundred picturesque Muslims from Bokhara in Central Asia on their way to Mecca, a hundred or so Orthodox Jews bound for Jerusalem, a lot of Persian merchants, and a score of old German Lutheran colonists. All the way out of Odessa Harbor there was trouble with the ship, and about nine o'clock at night our bow was turned back towards Odessa. It appeared that the ship had been manned by a black hundred crew. Of the forty-eight men all told in the ship's company, forty-two had never been to sea before, and not one man on the ship knew how to handle the wheel. We were unable to get back into the harbor, and even if it had been possible, the captain feared to do so, lest a riot break out. So he went ashore in a small boat, returning some time after midnight, with three or four officers from other ships who were prepared to do seamen's work. We learned later that the five ships of the same line that followed ours to sea, under similar conditions, all came to grief. Two were stranded, two were burned, and one foundered. The next morning at sunrise the decks presented a weird and memorable picture the several hundred Muslims in their long, bright-colored garments, their green and brown and white turbans, the women with long horsehair veils covering their faces all but the eyes, many of them having brought along three or four of their wives from their harems, all kneeling on little strips of carpet, their faces toward Mecca, were vigorously reciting their morning prayers. The Jews had donned their black-and-white prayer shawls, and bound phylacteries to their foreheads and arms, and they with their faces toward Jerusalem were droning their prayers of thanksgiving and praise. The Germans, evidently touched by the religiousness of their fellow passengers, after much unpacking drew forth a great family Bible, and while all the others gathered about in a semicircle on a hatch, one fat old paterfamilias read aloud from the New Testament, and when he had done, they all fell on their knees and united in the Lord's Prayer. There was something tremendously impressive in the scene, and just a touch of humor, too. The German united with his wife in prayer for blessings to be bestowed upon them both. The Jew thanked God he was not born a woman, and the Muslim called aloud upon Allah without thought of his several wives who squatted near him, not daring to approach even in prayer the God of their husband. A breath of fragrant morning air from a soft and pleasant clime wafted across the decks, 
the buoyant waters danced in the glistening sunlight and one squared one's shoulders in sheer joy of being alive and thankfulness that russia and all her darkness lay behind Thirty-six hours after leaving Odessa, we passed out of the Black Sea into the azure waters of the Bosphorus. Frowning cannon greeted us on either side of the beautiful shore, but we who were quitting sanguinary Russia scarcely gave them a passing glance. The golden domes of Turkish mosques began to glisten in the distance under the morning sunlight, and soon we could descry the crescent-topped minarets that here supplant the cross-capped onion domes of russia's churches and cathedrals shortly before noon we rode at anchor close to the golden horn End of chapter twenty one part two section thirty five of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg derland chapter twenty two the trend say not the struggle not availeth the labour and the wounds are vain the enemy faints not nor faileth and as things have been they remain if hopes were dupes fears may be liars it may be in yon smoke concealed your comrades chase e'en now the fliers and but for you possess the field for while the tired waves vainly breaking seem here no painful inch to gain far back through creeks and inlets making come silent flooding in the main and not by eastern windows only when daylight comes comes in the light in front the sun climbs slow how slowly but westward look the land is bright arthur hugh clough when the troubled year nineteen o six ended the shadow of reaction began to deepen over the russian empire one by one the granted liberties and promised reforms of the manifesto of october nineteen o five were being revoked and recalled early in nineteen o seven the second duma met struggled through a brief existence and was dissolved by the magic word of the czar discouragement then possessed the people a sense of heart-breaking hopelessness to the men and women who had borne the heat and burden of the struggle it seemed as if all the efforts and the sacrifices the lives surrendered to the cause of liberalism and progress had been in vain the world at large passed hasty judgment the revolution has petered out the announcement that a new duma would be convened in the late autumn of nineteen o seven sounded hollow for the new election laws which disenfranchised millions of peasants promises so completely to devitalize the results of the elections at the very outset that the whole institution of parliamentarism seems reduced to a mere shell the results of my observations lead me to accept this period of stagnation and temporary inactivity as a matter of course a natural phenomenon consistent and compatible with the mighty struggle in which the russian nation is now plunged at the beginning of this book i pointed out that the periods of great revolutions are seldom brief m leroy beaulieu said to tolstoy that russia's struggle might continue fifty years even that it seems to me is a comparatively short time for the working out of all the changes which russia must undergo before she will be brought to the standard of modern civilization the political phases of the situation are secondary to the vital social and economic changes which are working out the ideas of a nation as well as the customs of a great people and the forms of an ancient government are all in the flux decades must necessarily elapse before such vast renovation is completed and in the meantime the movement making for this renovation remains of world-wide importance 
palpitating as it does with human interest and involving as it does the concern of a substantial amount of the world's commercial interest france germany austria england and america all have business and commercial associations in russia which are affected by the development or retardation of industrial and agricultural russia the intellectual influence of the philosophy of the revolution is equally universal watched closely by germany and austria and france and ultimately destined to touch the uttermost parts of the world so was it in france to a greater degree perhaps shall this be true of russia precisely as there cannot be mountains without valleys or flow without ebb so there cannot be revolution without counter-revolution or progress without reaction in the manifesto of october nineteen o five czar nicholas the second said we charge our government to carry out our inflexible will as follows one to establish an unshakable foundation of the civic liberties of the population such as inviability of the person liberty of conscience of speech of meetings and of unions three to lay as an unchangeable rule that no law can enter into force without the approval of the imperial duma and that the representatives of the people should be entitled to an effective control over the executive power all the world knows how speedily every one of these glorious promises was swept aside the inflexible will of the present emperor of russia is the most anarchistic influence in the world today it submits to no discipline it bows to no law refuses to remember even through brief days most solemn pledges made to the russian people before the world and nonchalantly acquiesces in the careless breaking of even god's laws the government of russia today rests not on law or order or right but on might militarism and simon pure terrorism in appendix d may be found the report of captain peterhow on the siedis pogrom in which is quoted the following utterance of colonel tichinovsky we must set against the terrorism of the revolution a still more frightful terrorism and this is what the officials of tsardom are doing to-day and the terrorism of the government is not only a more frightful terrorism than the terrorism of the revolution it is the most frightful and the most monstrous terrorism of modern times because the forms of government are converted into the tools of absolute lawlessness and the victims of this terror are often the helpless among the people of the empire women and girls thrown to the lust of cossacks old men and children the marks of police brutality in the chapter on governmental terrorism and in the appendix there is an adduced overwhelming evidence and proof of official complicity and governmental connivance with this terrorism beside the terrorism the brutality and ruthlessness of the russian government and the soldiers and officials acting in the name of the russian government the most heinous offences of the people pale into insignificance individuals are human and there comes a snapping point when the sturdiest intellect can no longer beat back frenzy but a government a government surely cannot be exonerated on these grounds madness desperation passion should never possess the government of a great empire if it does then is the incapability of that government amply proven and its fall deservedly imminent after the dissolution of the second duma the moscow Vidomosti, a reactionary organ printed the following the population of russia amounts to some one hundred and fifty million souls but in the revolution not more than one million are inclined to take any active part were these one million men and women shot down or massacred there would still remain one hundred and forty nine million inhabitants of russia and this would be quite sufficient to ensure the greatness and prosperity of the fatherland 
i myself heard a prominent russian officer coolly advocate the immediate execution of two million men and women judiciously chosen from every section of the empire in order to stamp out the movement toward constitutionalism as for the attitude of the czar himself i have a conception which is based on careful observation but which may be at variance with popular opinion in america i believe that the czar considers himself a god-ordained autocrat i believe that he aspires to hand over to his heir and successor as absolute an autocracy as he inherited from his fathers elsewhere i have quoted a remark said to have been made by the czar in nineteen o six to the effect that he believed russia could go for twenty years more without a constitution and he purposed to do all he could to guide russia back to where it was before the manifesto of october nineteen o five everything that has transpired in russia since these words were spoken points to their truth the manifesto was wrung from the czar by the sudden tide of revolution which for once caught the government unprepared the granting of the constitution was like oil upon troubled waters but as soon as the government had recovered from the shock it sustained through the revolutionary activity culminating in the general strike it began quietly to take back everything that had been promised the first duma elections were seriously menaced then on the eve of the meeting of the parliament its powers were substantially reduced during the sessions of that body insults and rebukes were heaped upon it and finally it was disbanded the elections for the second duma were still more seriously restricted and although duma number two was in many respects an advance upon the first duma it was presently dissolved upon a ridiculous pretext it will be no surprise if the career of duma number three is quite as short as that of the others and if at the dissolution of it the government will say in effect we have now experimented with parliamentary government and the people of the country have shown their unpreparedness for self-government with the announcement of an indefinite postponement of further duma experiments this is practically what happened in turkey and in russia itself one hundred and fifty years ago a similar incipient experiment was made if this should occur now the world may well believe that the russian government never had the faintest intention of introducing parliamentary government at this time as for m stolypin i believe him to be a shrewd able administrator i do not believe for a moment that he has liberal sympathies in this i consciously take issue with many able writers and even old and tried russian correspondents a member of the constitutional democratic party a deputy in the first duma a prominent university professor who has sat on a commission with m stolypin and who had unusual opportunities for studying the premier said to me i believe m stolypin to be the strongest man the government has but a fanatic of reaction i would not use the word fanatic but i do believe him to be a devoted champion of reaction and autocracy at the same time he appreciates the desirability of appearing before the world in the role of a would-be reformer no modern statesman has watched the press of the world more closely than he and none has been quicker to trim his sails according to the weather indications that he has there discerned m stolypin besides being a clever and able minister is also a brave man and withal he is blessed with a charming and gracious personality and it is through the irresistible influence of his polished and cosmopolitan manners that he so diplomatically throws dust in the eyes of the world through the correspondents and business representatives of different countries who from time to time are accorded interviews with him it remains true however in spite of his grace and affability that previous to his administration women and young girls and boys of sixteen and seventeen were not hanged and shot for suspected revolutionary activity it was m stolypin who inaugurated the field courts-martial which endeavoured to confuse petty civil offences with revolutionary crimes thus affording an excuse for hundreds of executions 
an associated press dispatch from st petersburg under date of july twenty three nineteen o seven read as follows from many quarters come reports of summary executions under the new regulations for the military district courts which went into force saturday these regulations undo the work of the recent duma which abolished the notorious reign of the drumhead court-martial under them only seventy-two hours are permitted to elapse between indictment and execution including the appeal to the military court of cassation whereas a fortnight was permitted under the old regime these courts too have jurisdiction in all provinces whereas the old drumhead courts could only act in provinces that had been placed in a state of extraordinary defence at kiev yesterday five sappers were executed and to-day another sapper was sentenced to death three peasants have been executed at moscow another at warsaw and at yekaterinoslav three workmen have been put to death at riga a young man named berland went into a clothing store chose an overcoat and then started for the door when asked to settle his bill he drew a revolver covered the clerk and got away he was captured and sentenced to death another young man named danby was sentenced to death at riga for the theft of five dollars and two girl accomplices aged twelve and twenty years were sentenced to exile and hard labor for life i quote this telegram because the associated press has never been suspected of pro-revolutionary proclivities so far as i know and because it indicates the true character of m stolypin and his non-temporizing administration in thus emphasizing the offences not to say crimes of the present government i doubtless lay myself open to the charge of anti-governmental bias yet i believe i am neither guilty of this charge nor blind to the faults weaknesses and mistakes of the revolutionary movement my endeavor has been to present a true picture of russia to-day and of the struggle going on there as i have witnessed it yet i must point out once more that the responsibility of a government is necessarily of a more serious nature than that of the individuals who are the victims of governmental and official lawlessness and whose life and environment in spite of all they might do is made insufferable through the corruption inefficiency and general immorality of the officials who are set to rule and to administer the land there is a terrible menace a grave danger it seems to me in this prolonged struggle where all standards of public and private morality are shaken where rulers and lawgivers are arch lawbreakers the characters of the individuals living under such a regime must suffer and alas for the rising generation when one thinks on these things the prophecy of tolstoy has greatest weight perhaps the seer in this as in so many other things is right and russia will continue to go from bad to worse until the whole people awake in the very bottom of the abyss and then and then only will they turn to god as their only hope of salvation if the public opinion of the world would cry out against foreign bankers periodically advancing money to the present government to maintain its grip at the very throat of the people governmental concessions would have to be granted as it is the people of russia feel themselves pitted not only against their own government which has all the machinery of the army and police to support it but also against the financial interests of europe and the rest of the world the mere moral sympathy of america is not much of an offset to a french loan or an anglo-russian alliance unless it results in preventing american bankers from advancing american money to perpetuate the existing regime these foreign loans are a terrible discouragement to the russian people whenever the people reach the point where they believe their government will be obliged to yield certain fundamental human rights through sheer inability to longer feed the forces of reaction and to pay for the upkeep of the army then the foreign bankers spring to the rescue in russia i do not look for any voluntary grant of liberties or freedom from tsardom i believe that 
however much one may desire constitutional reform the russian people will eventually obtain their liberties through fighting for them i foresee a long long struggle since october nineteen o five the russian people have advanced enormously and the duma experiments handicapped as they were have yet proved immense educational influences they have served to arouse the whole people to what may be and to awaken within them a realization of what sooner or later must be on this count alone the value of these short-lived parliaments must not be underrated the russian people now understand their own situation as they have never grasped it before they have not merely lost faith in the czar they have learned that the trouble with russia to-day is that it suffers a blight and that blight is autocracy which in its very essence is incompatible with modern civilization and that while the obliteration of autocracy may be a long task the only escape from their present bondage is the accomplishment of this task and the period of the struggle making for this end will be recorded in history as the russian revolution end of chapter twenty two end of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia by kellogg derland section thirty six of the red rain the true story of an adventurous year in russia this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Appendix A. Translation of a few pages of testimony from a whole volume of similar evidence collected by a society of Tiflis lawyers on the pacification in Transcaucasia, 1905-1906. to The excerpts here printed are not of exceptional cases, but are appallingly representative of the entire text. The Village Sos, April 4, 1905. 1. Parish Priest to Akop Bagdasarian we learned that a special detachment of Cossacks under the command of Colonel Vevern was coming, that the detachment was going from village to village, instructing the Tartars as well as the Armenians to live peacefully, threatening to punish severely all those who would disturb the peace. We were glad of this, and when we learned that the detachment was approaching our village, we at once set out to prepare bread, meat, forage, and also a lodging for the detachment, on the 11th of March, at about two o'clock, we noticed the detachment from afar. I called together the prominent people of the village, donned my vestments, took a cross and a Bible, bread and salt, and we started out to greet the detachment. In front of the Cossacks walked many Armenians from various villages, leading the Cossacks' horses. These Armenians, on noticing the women in our village, were astonished, and they said, "'What does this mean? Have they lost their reason?' Why have they left their women in the village? The Cossacks violate the women everywhere. When our women learned of this, they began to run from the village. Justice of the peace, Yermolev, rode first. He said to us in the language of the Tartars, Go back, you are not worthy to receive us. After that, the same Yermolev had a conversation with the commander of the detachment, and then turned to me and to our representative people, and said, your bread and salt cannot be accepted. There will be a different settlement with you. We returned to the village in a painful frame of mind. As soon as the Cossacks entered the village, there were several hundred of them, a signal was sounded. The Cossacks dismounted and rushed after the women. They caught them in the ravines, on the roads, in the forests. Terrible cries were heard on all sides. The Cossacks violated the women, tore off their headgear, their ornaments, and other valuables which they had taken along with them as they hastened from the houses. All this was witnessed by the officers, the district chief, and the justice of the peace, but they did not stop them. Among the women that were violated in the outskirts of the village was a girl of sixteen to seventeen years of age, Kola Arut Unions. As there were some women that did not succeed in running away in time, I asked all those that remained to come to my house, and I said, 
As long as I am alive, I will defend your honor, and if they kill me, then you shall also die. Some twenty women gathered in my house, but there were still some women that remained in their houses. Some of these were old, and they thought that they would not be attacked on that account. Others did not have time enough to take their children along. Still others had sick children. When it became dark, the Cossacks began to break into the houses, to plunder, beat, and violate the women that were in the houses. Cries of men and women for help came from everywhere. The authorities heard the sobs of the unfortunates. They saw and knew what indecencies were being perpetrated, but they did not check them. It was about twelve o'clock at midnight I was called out of the house. I asked what I was wanted for. I was told that the Cossacks had beaten Ovanes Arietian Krikurians, that Ovanes was dying, and that they wanted me to come and give him the communion. I went to Ovanes's house and found him unconscious. The mother of Ovanes, the old woman Nubara, related the following. Quote, when the Cossacks began to break into the houses, Ovanes went down to guard the yard and told me to lock myself in the house and watch it. Suddenly the dogs began to bark. The Cossacks had entered the yard. Ovanes, he was a reservist of low rank, began to implore the Cossacks, half in Russian, half in Tartarian, to spare his life. At that time a powerful blow resounded, and right after it Ovanes cried out, Oh, I am dying. For a short time a faint rattling was heard, and then all became quiet. A few minutes later the Cossacks turned to the doors of our house and started to break in. At last the doors gave way and the Cossacks came in. There was no light in the house and they did not see that I was an old woman. Despite all entreaties they threw me down and violated me one after another. End quote. After the assault, the old woman, almost seventy years old, did not come to herself for half an hour. Having heard Nubara's statement, and finding it impossible to give the communion to Ovanes, as he was in a state of unconsciousness, I returned to my house. In the morning I was notified that Ovanes died. Then I went to the superior officer of the district, Freilich. Yermolaev was also there. In answer to my information, he said, Well, what of it? If he died, bury him. After I had left, Freilich and Yermolaev went to the commander of the detachment and told him what I had said about Ovanes. He sent two soldiers to investigate. These reported to the commander that Ovanes was alive. Then the commander ordered me to appear before him and told me that I gave him a false report. Yermolaev, who was present, began to assail me, saying that it was I who had organized the attack upon the Tartars, and that I and my daughter led the attack upon Kajak and that I was in general a dangerous man. I remarked to Yermolaev that his accusations were unjustified, that my daughter had been studying in the Moscow gymnasium, that she had been in Caucasia for two years, and that she had been in Siberia since September, visiting at her brother's. The commander of the detachment ordered my arrest for the, quote, false report. The detachment stayed in our village until two o'clock of the next day, and before leaving heaped the most painful indecencies upon the population. The Cossacks dishonored another girl who was suffering from paralysis, Nubara Musayans, twelve years old. Her grandfather, Musa, a man of about seventy, took his grandchild into his arms and was about to carry her away from the Cossacks, but they threw the old man down and beat him mercilessly and trampled him with their boots. He is very sick now, and the doctors say that unless he undergoes a serious operation, he will die soon. The paralyzed little girl, Nubara, was dishonored by the Cossacks in front of the old man. The Village Sos, April 5, 1905 1. Kola Arutianians, 18 years old. Quote, I ran together with Saranaza Arutianians. Three Cossacks overtook us and violated us. I was a virgin. The assault was committed upon us after a hard struggle. After the first three Cossacks, three others came, and they also violated us. End quote. Two and three. Sernaza Arutianians and Tuti Kasparians corroborated the above given testimony, adding that the Cossacks robbed them of several valuable things which they managed to take along with them. Tuti showed the skirt that was torn while she was dishonored. Sernaza is forty years old, and Tuti... 50. The Cossacks tore from the sufferers their silver head ornaments. 4. Nubara Krikorians. 
70 to 75 years old, mother of Ovanes Krikorians. She corroborated all the testimony given by the priest and added the following, quote, I was violated by five Cossacks. It was dark in the room. The Cossacks entering the room lit a match, which was soon extinguished. Seeing that I was a woman, the Cossacks seized me and violated me, one after another. It was at midnight. The Cossacks plundered our house. The wife of Ovanes was hiding in the mountains with others, and only thanks to this circumstance she escaped disgrace. End, quote. End of Appendix A Section 37 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynette Calkins, Monument, Colorado. The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Appendix B. The Reply to the Crown Speech by the First Duma, 1906. Footnote. The aspirations of the Russian people were formulated by the First Duma, which convened in 1906. The Duma drew up its answer to the Crown Speech and passed it in less than five sittings. On the 5th of May, the document was read for the third time before the Duma and was passed unanimously by the whole assembly, as the official reports of the Duma sittings show. While seven members of the extreme right did not vote for it, they did not dare to refuse to vote, but merely walked from the hall, pretending they did not know what was being passed. The second Duma, now in session, is ruled by the same two parties that dominated the first Duma, the party of the left representing the working men and peasants, 192 men, there were only 116 in the first Duma, and the constitutional democrats, 116 men, there were 152 in the first Duma, representing the rising middle classes of the cities. The second Duma was not called to formulate another reply to the Crown speech, because there was no Crown speech, so that the document drawn up and unanimously accepted by the first Duma remained binding for the second Duma also. As one who took part in the preparation of the original document, I take pleasure in testifying to the accuracy of this English version. Alexis Aladdin, leader of the Group of Toil in the First Duma, and accredited representative of the Group of Toil in the Second Duma. End footnote. Your Majesty, in a speech addressed to the representatives of the people, it pleased Your Majesty to announce your resolution to keep unchanged the decree by which the people were assembled to carry out legislative functions in cooperation with their monarch. The State Duma sees in this solemn promise of the monarch to the people a lasting pledge for the strengthening and the further development of legislative procedure in strict conformity with constitutional principles. The State Duma, on its side, will direct all its efforts toward perfecting the principles of national representation, and will present for Your Majesty's confirmation a law for national representation, based, in accordance with the manifest will of the people, upon principles of universal suffrage. Your Majesty's summons to us to cooperate in a work which shall be useful to the country finds an echo in the hearts of all the members of the State Duma. The State Duma, made up of representatives of all classes and all races inhabiting Russia, is united in a warm desire to regenerate Russia and to create within her a new order, based upon the peaceful cooperation of all classes and races, upon the firm foundation of civic liberty. But the State Duma deems it its duty to declare that while present conditions exist, such reformation is impossible. The country recognizes that the ulcer in our present regime is in the arbitrary power of officials who stand between the Tsar and the people. And seized with a common impulse, the country has loudly declared that reformation is possible only upon the basis of freedom of action and the participation by the nation itself in the exercise of the legislative power and the control of the executive. In the manifesto of October 17, 1905, your Majesty was pleased to announce from the summit of the throne a firm determination to employ these very principles as the foundation for Russia's future, and the entire nation hailed these good tidings with a universal cry of joy. Yet, 
the very first days of freedom were darkened by the heavy affliction into which the country was thrown by those who would bar the path leading to the Tsar, those who by trampling down the very fundamental principles of the Imperial Manifesto of October 17, 1905, overwhelmed the land with the disgrace of organized massacres, military reprisals, and imprisonments without trial. The impression of these recent administrative acts has been felt so keenly by the people that no pacification of the country is possible until the people are assured that henceforth arbitrary acts of officials shall cease, nor be longer shielded by the name of your majesty, until all the ministers shall be held responsible to the representatives of the people, and that the administration in every step of state service shall be reformed accordingly. Sire, the idea of completely freeing the monarch from responsibility can be implanted in the minds of the nation only by making the ministers responsible to the people. Only a ministry fully trusted by the majority of the Duma can establish confidence in the government, and only in the presence of such confidence is the peaceful and regular work of the state Duma possible. But above all, it is most needful to free Russia from the operation of exceptional laws for so-called special and extraordinary protection, and martial law, under cover of which the arbitrary authority of irresponsible officials has grown up and still continues to grow. Side by side with the establishment of the principle of responsibility of the administration to the representatives of the people, it is indispensable for the successful work of the Duma that there should be implanted and definitely adopted the fundamental principle of popular representation based on the cooperation of the monarch with the people as the only source of legislative power. Therefore, all barriers between the imperial power and the people must be removed. No branch of legislative power should ever be closed to the inspection of the representative of the people in cooperation with the monarch. The State Duma considers it its duty to state to your majesty, in the name of the people, that the whole nation, with true inspiration and energy, with genuine faith in the near prosperity of the country, will only then fulfill its work of reformation, when the Council of State, which stands between it and the throne, shall cease to be made up, even in part, of members who have been appointed instead of being elected, when the law of collecting taxes shall be subject to the will of the representatives of the people, and when there shall be no possibility, by any special enactment, of limiting the legislative jurisdiction of the representatives of the people. The State Duma also considers it inconsistent with the vital interests of the people that any bill imposing taxes, when once passed by the Duma, should be subject to amendment on the part of any body which is not representative of the mass of taxpayers. In the domain of its future legislative activity, the State Duma, performing the duty definitely imposed upon it by the people, deems it necessary to provide the country, without delay, with a strict law providing for the inviolability of the person, freedom of conscience, liberty of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of association, convinced that without the strict observance of these principles, the foundation of which was laid in the manifesto of October 17, 1905, no social reform can be realized. The Duma also considers it necessary to secure for all citizens the right of petition to the people's representatives. The State Duma has further the inflexible conviction that neither liberty nor order can be made firm and secure except on the broad foundation of equality before the law of all citizens without exception. Therefore, the State Duma will establish a law for the perfect equality before the law of all citizens, abolishing all limitations dependent upon estate, nationality, religion, and sex. The Duma, however, while striving to free the country from the binding fetters of administrative guardianship and leaving the limitation of the liberty of the citizen to the independent judicial authorities, still deems the application of capital punishment even in accordance with a legal sentence, as inadmissible. A death sentence should never be pronounced. The Duma holds that it has the right to proclaim, as the unanimous desire of the people, that a day should come when a law forever abolishing capital punishment here shall be established. In anticipation of that law, the country today is looking to your majesty for a suspension of all death sentences. 
the investigation of the needs of the rural population and the undertaking of legislative measures to meet those wants will be considered among the first problems of the state Duma. The most numerous part of the population, the hard-working peasants, impatiently await the satisfaction of their acute want of land, and the first Russian state Duma would be recreant to its duty were it to fail to establish a law to meet this primary want by resorting to the use of lands belonging to the state, the crown, the royal family, and monastic and church lands, also private landed property on the principle of the law of eminent domain. The Duma also deems it necessary to create laws giving equality to the peasantry, removing the present degrading limitations which separate them from the rest of the people. The Duma considers the needs of working people as pressing, and that there should be legislative measures taken for the protection of hired labor. The first step in that direction ought to be to give freedom to the hired laborer in all branches of work, freedom to organize, freedom to act, and to secure his material and spiritual welfare. The Duma will also deem it its duty to employ all its forces in raising the standard of intelligence, and above all, it will occupy itself in framing laws for free and general education. Along with the aforementioned measures, the Duma will pay special attention to the just distribution of the burden of taxation, unjustly imposed at present upon the poor classes of inhabitants, and to the reasonable expenditure of the means of the state. Not less vital in legislative work will be a fundamental reform of local government and of self-government, extending the latter to all the inhabitants upon the principles of universal suffrage. Bearing in mind the heavy burden imposed upon the people by Your Majesty's Army and Navy, the Duma will secure principles of right and justice in those branches of the service. Finally, the Duma deems it necessary to point out as one of the problems pressing for solution the long-crying demands of the different nationalities. Russia is an empire inhabited by many different races and nationalities. Their spiritual union is possible only by meeting the needs of each one of them and by preserving and developing their national characteristics. The Duma will try to satisfy those reasonable wants. Your Majesty, on the threshold of our work stands one question which agitates the soul of the whole nation and which agitates us, the chosen and elected of the people, and which deprives us of the possibility of undisturbedly proceeding toward the first part of our legislative activity. The first word uttered by the State Duma met with cries of sympathy from the whole Duma. It is the word amnesty. The country thirsts for amnesty to be extended to all those whose offenses were the result of either religious or political convictions, and all persons implicated in the agrarian movement. These are demands of the national conscience which cannot be overlooked, the fulfillment of which cannot be longer delayed. Sire, the Duma expects of you full political amnesty as the first pledge of mutual understanding and mutual agreement between the Tsar and his people. End of Appendix B Section 38 of The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace The Red Rain, The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Derland Appendix C. A Russian Authority on the Police Participation of Pogroms. M. Lopuchin's Letter to M. Stolipin. Herewith we give the translation in full of the letter of M. Alexis Lopuchin, formerly Director of the Police Department of Russia. This is made from a German translation of the original Russian, and is vouched for as to its correctness by the author of the letter. Honoured Sir, I deemed it my duty to bring to your attention through my letter of the 26th of May the fact that I gave to the editor of the journal Retsch the copy of the report of the Chief of the Special Division of the Police Department to the Minister of the Interior concerning the organisation of the pogrom against the Jews in Alexandrovsk, government of Yekaterinoslav, 
and touching the participation therein of the authorities of the police department. I did this in the firm conviction that it was only through the Imperial Duma, when well informed by the public press, we could hope once for all to destroy the great danger menacing the state because of the systematic preparation by government officials of Jewish and other pogroms. I informed you of my action, lest some subordinate of your excellency might be held responsible for having furnished that journal with the report. I deemed it unnecessary in my communication to impart to you the facts detailed in the report of Markarov, and with which I was familiar. I refrained from doing so because it was furthest from my thoughts that it could be possible that your excellency would conceal the truth that was revealed by the investigation called forth at the request of the Duma in connection with the report of Markarov. But yet must I be convinced from the newspaper reports of the Duma session of June 21st that in your answer to the inquiry of the Duma, the material that was put into your hands for the proper preparation thereof, the real facts in the case, were substantially set aside. I therefore conceived it to be my bounden duty to impart to you in this communication facts that are well known to me. In January of this year, several persons informed me that there were indications of the preparation in different sections of Russia of a Jewish pogrom, and they appealed for my help to prevent such misfortune. Investigations that were made established the truth of their statements and satisfied me of the participation by public officials in the preparations for a pogrom. They brought me on the trail of a printing office in the police department. On January 20th, Count Witter, the President of the Council of Ministers, invited me to his office and asked me to give him my views on the Jewish question and as to the reason for the participation of the Jewish proletariat in the revolutionary movement. After I had clearly presented to him my main point of view on the question, I told him that aside from the judicial aspect of the question, there was another of great importance, namely anti-Semitism, that not only existed because of the long-continued period in which the Jews were without rights, but because as well of the direct provocations against them on the part of persons in public authority. As a special indication of such provocation, I pointed to the incident of the printing office in the police department, of whose output, however, I had no sufficient evidence in my hands, and Count Witter assigned to me, as an officer of the Minister of the Interior, the duty of making a close investigation into the matter. I proved the following conclusively. After the manifesto of the 17th October 1905, Thanks to the disturbances that broke out in many places after this act of the government, evidence of a reaction appeared in circumscribed sections of society. Rachkovsky, chief of the political division of the police department, an officer assigned to special duty by the Minister of the Interior, undertook to maintain and strengthen this reaction by the issuing of effective proclamations. They were printed by an officer of the gendarmerie in the building of the gendarmerie in St. Petersburg, upon a printing press that was taken from revolutionaries when a house search was made. I had in my hand one of these proclamations. It was addressed to the working people, bore the signature group of Russian factory workers of St. Petersburg, and sought to destroy the faith of working men in their radical leaders by maintaining that these leaders had misappropriated funds that had been collected for the political campaign. This proclamation was not the only one that was printed in the headquarters of the gendarmerie, but at the time of investigation I could not get others because they had all been distributed. As the printing press that served the purpose of the revolutionaries failed to satisfy the present needs, a complete one was purchased at the expense of the police department that was capable of printing 1,000 per hour. This was set up in the secret service section of the police department. Captain Komisarov was given its supervision, and two compositors were employed upon the work. On this machine there were printed in December 1905 and in January 1906 not one, but a vast number of proclamations, all composed variously, but all of the same general tenor. 
In all these proclamations, alongside of a condemnation of the revolutionary movement, the information was offered that non-believers, mainly the Jews, were responsible therefor, and their purpose was to provoke an uprising against these people. I had in my hands three proclamations that were printed in the printing office of the police department. As I positively proved, they were not the only ones. The fourth one was just set up at that moment, February 3rd. It contained the most ridiculous complaints against the Jews, and urged that they be boycotted in the Duma elections. But of the printed proclamations that I had in my hand, one appears especially as law-violating. The author, addressing himself to the soldiers, calls upon the army for a campaign against the Poles, Armenians, and Jews. Thousands of copies were printed of every proclamation. Of the proclamation addressed to the soldiers, 5,000 copies were sent to Vilna by the officers on special duty, to Mr. Scott, the Governor-General, for distribution in that city. Scott had distributed a portion of them himself in the evening in the streets of the city, and gave the rest of them to the Chief of Police of Vilna, who on January 28th telegraphed to the police department that in view of the great success that attended the distribution of the proclamation addressed to the soldiers, to send him a new lot. Several thousand copies more were printed and sent on to the Vilna Chief of Police. The same proclamation was sent in thousands of copies to Kursk, being taken by Sergeant Mikhailov, assigned there to duty, who, at the request of Monsieur Rachkovsky, was appointed secret agent of the police department. Mikhailov also telegraphed, February 1st or 2nd, for a new lot of these proclamations, in view of their great success among the soldiers. Aside from these, the appeals printed by the police department were distributed in St. Petersburg through Monsieur de Brovin and the League of the Russian People, over which he presided, in Moscow through the publisher of the Viedomosti, Gringmud, who was given a large number of these appeals in December 1905 by Rachkovsky personally. The provocative appeals of the police department were also distributed in other states by the police and gendarmerie. All that is narrated above I imparted in January of this year to Count Witter, President of the Committee of Ministers, and I gave him specimens of all the proclamations above referred to. For that reason I have none at hand for present use. Count Witter at once called before him Captain Komisarov, who acknowledged the truth of all this information. To me also he confirmed all these statements without exception. At the same time, he declared that he acted under orders of Herr Rachkovsky, that he then presented the text of the proclamation to Vujic, the director of the police department, and did not at any time put them in type until the director stated in writing that he had read the proclamation. Express orders were issued by Secretary of State Vitter that the printing office of the police department should be wiped out of existence. However, Captain Komisarov merely took apart the printing press as a precaution against the printing of further proclamations by order of Rachkovsky, in spite of Vita's orders. And to make that altogether impossible, the press was taken from the police department to the residence of Captain Komisarov. Aside from this, and altogether without regard thereto, Your Excellency was confidentially informed that the proclamations which called for the extermination of the Jews in the city of Alexandrovsk, the Katerinoslav government, were circulated even after all the uprisings ceased, even after December 27, 1905. I consider it my duty to attach herewith a specimen of a proclamation that was distributed in the city of Alexandrovsk February 7th and 8th, and that called for the extermination of the Jews on the 9th of February, the anniversary of the breaking out of the war with Japan. Your Excellency was confidentially informed that the officer for special duty, Rachkovsky, remained at the head of the political division of the police department until the end of April. That although this office was wiped out by the highest authority, he remained at the head of the entire secret and protective police. That the right was given him to supervise, so far as he deemed it necessary, the course of all political occurrences and trials that affected the police department and he was further authorised to utilise the social organisations in the interest of the government. Permit me, sir, to regard it as my moral duty, aside from imparting to you this information, 
to convey to you, as a former director of the police department, the reasons, incomprehensible at a first glance, why it is not only impossible for the central government to suppress the pogrom politics of the local authorities when the organisation of a pogrom originates with them, but not even to be well informed as to the organisation of the pogrom itself. One of these reasons is the freedom from punishment of the officers of the government who are responsible for the pogroms. No proof need be given of this. But there are other reasons of a general character. At the time I was director of the police department, a pogrom occurred, that of Kishinev. The foreign and our own illegal press, that then had the privilege to speak out on our internal conditions, as well as several circles of society, put upon the police department the responsibility for the organisation of this pogrom. There was no responsibility that could be attached to the police department, yet the charge was not groundless in so far as they started out with the supposition that the police department and the Ministry of the Interior were possessed of all possible power. In spite of the closest investigation as to the participation of officers of the government in the organisation of the Kishinev pogrom, it was impossible for me, as director of the police department, to absolutely prove the fact, and yet there could be no doubt whatever of their participation. And what is especially characteristic, the secret working of the pogrom organisation became clear to me only after I ceased to hold an official position in the Ministry of the Interior. And in such a position does every official of the central government find himself if he yields no sympathy to pogrom politics. That is to be accounted for by the fact that the Minister of the Interior and the central political organisation are altogether powerless. The police and the gendarmerie are not in his hands, but precisely the reverse. He is in the hands of the superiors of these officials. The fact is that through the organisation of the secret political police, because of the exceptional law providing for extraordinary military protection, and the long continuance of that condition in the country, the whole power has been transferred from above to below. Aside from the continued causes that have been uncovered, the weakness of the governmental authority, there are existing at present other causes. I met no one among the political or general police officials who was not absolutely and thoroughly convinced that in reality there were two governments in existence, each of which drove its own politics to the other, one embodied in the person of Secretary of State Vitter, the other in the person of Trepov, who, according to general conviction, brought to the Tsar reports of the condition of affairs in the empire different than those that Count Vitter brought to him, and in this wise developed a different political position. This point of view finds its foundation in the fact that General Trepov after his appointment as commander of the palace, succeeded in having special funds put at his command for the engagement of a separate force of secret agents. And he therefore became possessed of tools in hand that should only be in control of the Minister of the Interior. This point of view finds further foundation in the fact that General Trepov, even after he gave up the post he held in the Ministry of the Interior in October 1905, succeeded, without the knowledge of the Minister of the Interior, in getting out of the police department all the documents, except those of no moment, for the purpose of looking through them, not only current documents, but those of no present use, even though all these had nothing whatever to do with the commander of the palace. As to what purpose General Trepov had in mind with reference to the secret funds and the documents of the police department, in what direction he was inclined to utilise his position in regard to these, there exists, Your Excellency, in the mind of the undersigned, a firm conviction, rightly or wrongly, that General Trepov sought to influence the politics of the government. This conviction, indeed, is as firm as the conviction that General Trepov sympathised with the pogroms' politics, and whatever power the ministry may set to work in opposition to pogroms, they will be valueless so long as the local police are convinced of the lack of power of the ministry and the possession of power of other authorities. End of Appendix C. Recording by Patrick Wallace. Section 39 of The Red Rain 
The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Patrick Wallace. The Red Rain. The True Story of an Adventurous Year in Russia by Kellogg Durland. Appendix D. Report of Captain Pietuchov of the Gendarmerie Administration of the State of Shedlce to the Assistant Governor-General at Warsaw. The Provisional Governor-General of the Government of Shedlce, Major General Engelke, by virtue of Order No. 12 of August 10th this year, named Colonel Tikhanovsky of the 39th Regiment of Dragoons as Chief of the Garrison of Defence of the City of Shedlce. On August 11th at 12 o'clock in the morning, I was called to the gendarmerie office, where there were already gathered Colonel Virkolich, Captains Potoski and Grigoriev, the acting police chief of the city of Shedlce, Staff Captain Protopopov, and Colonel Tikhanovsky, chief of the garrison of defence. There was advised an adequate blockade of the city and the undertaking of a general search of the houses in Shedlce. The last measure was dictated in a telegram of the Governor-General. Colonel Tikhanovsky demanded immediately that there be named to him several prominent citizens of the city of Shedlce, who, although they had not personally taken part in the revolutionary movement, yet favoured it in any possible way. Colonel Tikhanovsky expressed the view that he would put these people in prison and hold them as hostages. He would tell them that in case of an attack on the life of any officer of the government, they would all be murdered. Colonel Tikhanovsky said that he would take upon himself all the responsibility for the matter. As Colonel Tikhanovsky was asked in what manner these hostages were to be killed, he turned to the chief of the police with the question whether he could not put at his service a policeman who would be prepared to simulate insanity and shoot the hostages in prison or put arsenic into their food. We must set against the terrorism of the revolution a still more frightful terrorism, rejoined Colonel Tikhanovsky and he stuck to his point of view, always reiterating that he would assume full responsibility. At six o'clock in the evening of the same day, all were again assembled in the office of the gendarmerie, and considered the plan of a blockade of the city for the purpose of a general house searching. But it appeared very clear that it was impossible to undertake a general house searching with the help of only two battalions of the Libau infantry regiments and a single cavalry regiment, that were stationed in Shedlce. Such a house searching would cripple the life of the city for more than twenty-four hours, and then would lead to no positive result. Colonel Tikhanovsky, however, stood for a general house searching, and demanded, among other things, that the chief of the police should hold in readiness during the house searching the fire engines, and that at the same time all the doctors in the hospitals should be assembled. As for himself, Colonel Tikhanovsky promised to hold in readiness the military ambulances. As Colonel Tikhanovsky was asked for what purpose all these preparations were required, he answered that there might be some dead and wounded ones, as they would proceed pitilessly and firearms would be used. It might happen that conflagrations would ensue in that way. The officers of the dragoons, as it became known the selfsame day, rubbed their hands in glee as they came together and said publicly, with a pleased laugh, We will make for them a decent pogrom, we will deal with them pitilessly. The soldiers also carried on the same kind of a conversation. On the 13th of August, at three o'clock in the afternoon, there was another conference held with Colonel Tikhanovsky in the office of the gendarmerie, which declared that the general house searching would be taken up that night. At his command I gave him a list of the persons who were known because of their criminal deeds and also their addresses. As we learned the decision of Colonel Tikhanovsky, as well as some of the other officers and soldiers of regiments of dragoons, we determined to protest against the plan of Colonel Tikhanovsky for the house searching, calling attention to the inadequacy of the means at hand. Colonel Tikhanovsky would not allow himself to be swerved. Colonel Virgolich, therefore, wrote at once to the governor, acquainted him with the general side of approaching house searching, that is, of the time that was necessary for such an undertaking, acquainted him with the determination of the military, 
and advised the postponement of the house searching until the arrival of more troops. To get more troops to help, the temporary governor-general went on the 13th of August to Warsaw. The request for troops was denied, however, and on principle the idea of a general house searching was given up. On August 18th, Colonel Virovich became sick and had to take to his bed. During my visit to the governor, I reiterated to him the determination of Colonel Tikhanovsky and the military, emphasizing the matter, and advised that they be held in check. I said to him bluntly that such a decision would lead only to plunder and a needless spilling of blood, just as happened on the 8th of August, after the murder of police chief Teltzer. The governor, it seemed to me, gave favourable attention to my views, made several notes, and promised to take the necessary steps in the matter. Up to August 26, I saw Tikhanovsky a couple of times. He was then engaged in working out instructions for the military concerning the defence of the city. Among other things, it was provided that in case of any alarm in the city, the telegraph office would be compelled to refuse to accept private telegrams. I asked the purpose of this regulation. Colonel Tikhanovsky answered that he made this regulation so that the residents of the city could not, through the telegraph, ask for the cessation of the pogroms. Characteristic of the personality of Colonel Tikhanovsky are other deeds. For example, he said to the chief of police, as he again discussed the plans for the general house searching, Perhaps Captain Pyotuchov doesn't believe that we will arrest people. Those that appear on the list he gave us will certainly not be found among those who are arrested. That served at once for a declaration of the purpose of having in readiness the ambulance wagons and the medical staff in preparation for the house search. During the first night of the shooting in Chilce, about three o'clock on the 27th of August, Colonel Tikhanovsky wanted to have the military orchestra of the regiment of dragoons come to him from the armory, which was, however, denied him. Then he gathered together a chorus of soldiers, and their singing resounded in the midst of the noise of the rifles, the spilling of blood, the plundering, and the conflagration. Colonel Tikhanovsky declared later that he wanted thereby to raise the spirit of the soldiers. As it seems, he made it appear that he was upon the field of battle, surrounded by a superior foe. Finally, several days after the rioting, as there was a report in circulation that Colonel Tikhanovsky was murdered, he came to the squadron whose commander he formerly was, told them of this report, and bade them, in case he should be really killed, they would honour his memory decently, and bathe themselves to the ears in blood. The officers of dragoons told me this later at breakfast, and cited this as an example of the bravery of Colonel Tikhanovsky. On August 26th, at half-past six in the evening, as I have already reported, several revolver shots resounded in the city, to which the troops replied at once by a bombardment of the city, during which absolutely no consideration was shown whether or not shots were fired from the houses attacked. So, for example, on the first night, window panes were destroyed by bullets in a girls' boarding school, whence surely no shots were fired. The window panes in the gendarmerie office were also destroyed. The troops dealt without mercy toward the unoffending people. I myself was present when several persons, including elderly Jews, were dragged into the police station, and saw how eagerly the soldiers abused them in the presence of Colonel Tikhanovsky. I also saw how a dragoon fired shots in the vicinity of the police station at the residence of Circuit Judge Herr Mudrev. I also witnessed that a dragoon came to Colonel Tikhanovsky and asked him for cartridges, whereupon the latter remarked, There are too few dead. As I saw all this, I begged Colonel Tikhanovsky to put an end to the senseless shooting and clubbing, and rather to busy himself with a systematic plan for discovering the revolutionaries who really did fire off the revolvers. At the same time, I drew his attention to the fact that the soldiers were without nourishment, would be tired out early, and that toward evening the revolutionaries might undertake something serious. For reply, I was told that the slaughter at Liaoyang lasted twelve days and that if it became necessary he was prepared to occupy the chair of the police for two weeks, and further, that there were in the city enough stores with supplies of provisions to reach around. 
This was all said in the presence of soldiers. Not being in the mood to witness such scenes, and in no position to make an end of them, I went home at nine o'clock in the morning, August 27th. Toward ten o'clock the same morning, Colonel Tichanovsky sent for me, but I did not go, because I deemed my presence superfluous, especially as during the whole time I knew either Captain Potosky or Grigoryov was there. The deputy police chief, captain of the staff, Captain Protopopov, also sought to mollify Colonel Tikhanovsky, but all to no purpose. To all arguments he replied, It is none of your concern. The sub-officers of my gendarmerie office, who lived on the chaussée, were prevented from entering the city, until the morning dawned of August 27th, by the military guards, who declared to them that it was forbidden to allow anyone to enter the city. After dawn, the under-officers of the gendarmerie took part in the house-searching, but later they were informed that the troops, in the absence of their officers, would not undertake any house searches, but would merely plunder, and without any cause at all, kill them. One of the dragoons, whom gendarmerie corporal Efinov wanted to hinder in his work, drew his sword against him. The policemen were chased away in one place by the soldiers. As early as the first night, the dragoons turned to gendarme corporals Andreyuk and Zayas, and asked them for petroleum for setting the houses on fire. When asked by the latter how they dare do such a thing, the soldiers replied, we are commanded to do it. Plundering took place already on the first night. In the dusk of evening on August 27th, the troops became completely unbridled. They invaded the beer halls and wine cellars, and everything was either drunk or plundered. On the second night, the troops almost all were drunk. On September 5th, there came from St. Petersburg Herr Gubonin, officer for special affairs of the Minister of the Interior, and bade me to be of service to him to get the truth of the Schädelzer occurrences from August 27th to 28th. I did not consider myself justified to conceal anything from an officer who came by direction of the Minister, to investigate the condition of things. I therefore told him fully about the personality of Colonel Tichanovsky, of the tone that reigned among the troops, and especially about the Schedelze occurrences. Then, in answer to his request, I called into the gendarmerie office those persons who had suffered most loss, and helped at the investigation, helped out much of them as did not speak or understand Russian. About forty private persons, and all the gendarmerie corporals, were heard by Herr Gubonin. House owner Ksintiporsky proved by the testimony of a witness, his servant, that dragoons set fire to his barn. A similar statement, substantiated by witnesses, was to the effect that two or three other houses were similarly destroyed, and that to aid in their purpose the soldiers took the kerosene oil out of the street lamps. Dr. Stein and an employee of the Jewish hospital told how wounded Jews brought into the courtyard of the hospital were beaten to death there by the soldiers. The Jewess Wolf told how on August 27th at three o'clock in the afternoon, dragoons with an officer at their head came to her home. Her husband and sons were in their praying vestments and saying their prayers. The officer cursed the husband and battered his head against the doorposts. Then a dragoon dragged him into the courtyard and killed him with a club, in the presence of his wife and in spite of her entreaties. The head of one firm, Gerard Rubinstein, stated that the soldiers had robbed him of a considerable sum of money, drafts for three thousand roubles and other property. He called in as witness the staff captain of the 129th Infantry Regiment, Stoyanov, a Jewish shoe dealer named a dragoon Akimya, whom she knew as one who with other soldiers had entered her store and plundered it. There were also statements made to the effect that women were outraged, but as yet these deeds were not sufficiently proven. Many stated that the soldiers forced themselves into their homes, looked for nothing, and simply demanded money. In those cases where their demands were not met, the people were either killed or taken to jail. According to the testimony, the Jews gave all that they had, and then, as there was nothing left for the next group of soldiers that came along, the men were arrested and taken away. There was also testimony 
as to provocative shots on the part of policemen. So, for instance, Berenstein, the owner of a store for arms and bicycles, saw a policeman, whom he can identify, fire a shot in the air, and then point out to the soldiers whence the alleged shot came. Thereupon the soldiers bombarded the house. The fact that the soldiers plundered is by all means fully established. The plundered goods were taken back by a portion of the troops to the police station. During the disturbances it was a common sight to see upon the streets the soldiers carrying various articles. The soldiers took only what they could carry away. The other things, as furniture, they smashed on the spot. The population of Shetelse unto the last man is satisfied that the occurrences in Shetelse are in consequence of provocation on the side of the dragoons and partly also on the side of the police. They are convinced that the initiative of this provocation is to be written down to Colonel Tikhanovsky. It was remarked that the dragoons who otherwise carried their arms upon their backs as early as August 26th carried them already in their right hands. Toward evening, the dragoons explained to the merchants that it would be permitted to keep business open till half-past ten o'clock, while previously eight o'clock was the compulsory hour for closing. Inexplicable to the people also was the fact that of the soldiery but one was injured, which was the full extent of the injury done to the soldiers. One horse was wounded at the ear by a sword cut, and another by a rifle shot through the nostrils. The residents remarked very rightly that if the revolutionaries wanted to do any damage whatever to the policemen and guardsmen, there would have been at least some loss among the troops during the early part of the trouble. For it would have been no easy matter for the revolutionaries to have placed two or three men armed with Browning's opposite every place where the soldiers were stationed, and protected by the fences, shoot them and then escape under cover of the darkness. Even if we admit that at first the shots of the revolutionaries missed their mark, there remained for them, after unsuccessful efforts, nothing but to flee, and they surely would not thus waste the cartridges that had cost them so much pains to procure. It becomes difficult to charge the troops themselves with provocation. So far as they are concerned, it would be easier, perhaps, to look for provocation on the side of the revolutionaries. These knew full well the temper of the troops, and they wished perhaps to call forth what happened, in order to discredit in this wise the government and the troops in the eyes of the whole public, and wring its sympathy for the people of Shedlce, who were greatly irritated over the recent murder of two persons who were of service in the city, President Mirovich and Police Captain Goldsev. If we take it that this was really the case, then the revolutionaries certainly attained their purpose. The most peaceful and loyal residents say now, the governor promised that so long as he was in Shedlce, there would be no pogroms, and what do we behold? We need no investigation on the part of the authorities. We will undertake our own investigation right on the ground and get at the truth. The Russian people no longer look upon the soldiers as their defenders, and their appearance upon the street of horse dragoons fills all with the feeling of unrest. The recall of Colonel Tikhanovsky had a quieting effect upon the whole population. The whole blame for the occurrences of Shedlce does not rest alone upon Colonel Tikhanovsky, who was not even legally authorised to serve as commander-in-chief of the city. The blame rests also on the temporary governor-general, Major General Engelke, who turned over to Colonel Tikhanovsky absolutely entire power, and also upon the governor, who as the permanent chief of the government of Shedlce, permitted the authority to pass out of his hands at so critical a moment, and did not again take this authority into his own hands when the conditions so urgently demanded that he do so. The illness of the governor, so far as I knew, was not at all so serious as to justify a leave of absence. Furthermore, during his illness, he yielded to Dolgovo Saburov, a member of the agricultural office, only the authority to sign documents and the right to preside at various meetings. All other functions he retained for himself. In this report I have sought to set down not only my views, but also the impressions carried away by Herr Gubonin, officer for special duty. Captain Pietuchov, Schiedlce, September 27th, 1906. 
End of Appendix D. Recording by Patrick Wallace.